Introduction to Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is a general cry of paradox when scholars, struck by some historical error, attempt to correct it. But for whoever studies modern history to its depths, it is plain that historians are privileged liars, who lend their pen to popular beliefs, precisely as the newspapers of the day, or most of them, express the opinions of their readers. Historical independence has shown itself much less among lay writers than among those of the Church. It is from the Benedictines, one of the glories of France, that the purest light has come to us in the matter of history, so long, of course, as the interests of the order were not involved. About the middle of the 18th century, great and learned controversialists struck by the necessity of correcting popular errors endorsed by historians made and published to the world very remarkable works. Thus, Monsieur de Lonoy, nicknamed the Expeller of Saints, made cruel war upon the saints surreptitiously smuggled into the church. Thus, the emulators of the Benedictines, the members, too little recognized, of the Académie des Inscriptions, en Belles Lettres began on many obscure historical points a series of monographs, which are admirable for patience, erudition, and logical consistency. Thus Voltaire, for a mistaken purpose and with ill-judged passion, frequently cast the light of his mind on historical prejudices. Diderot undertook in this direction a book, much too long, on the era of imperial Rome. If it had not been for the French Revolution, criticism applied to history might then have prepared the elements of a good and true history of france the proofs of which had long been gathered by the benedictines louis the sixteenth a just mind himself translated the english work in which walpole endeavoured to explain richard the third a work much talked of in the last century why do personages so celebrated as kings and queens so important as the generals of armies become objects of horror or derision Half the world hesitates between the famous song on Marlborough and the history of England, and it also hesitates between history and popular tradition as to Charles the Ninth. At all epochs, when great struggles take place between the masses and authority, the populace creates for itself an Ogre-esque personage, if it is allowable to coin a word to convey a just idea. Thus, to take an example in our own time, if it had not been for the memorial of St. Helena and the controversies between the royalists and the Bonapartists, there was every probability that the character of Napoleon would have been misunderstood. A few more Abbé de Pardie, a few more newspaper articles, and from being an emperor, Napoleon would have turned into an ogre. How does error propagate itself? The mystery is accomplished under our very eyes, without our perceiving it. No one suspects how much solidity the art of printing has given both to the envy which pursues greatness and to the popular ridicule which fastens a contrary sense on a grand historical act. Thus the name of the Prince de Polignac is given throughout the length and breadth of France to all bad horses that require whipping, and who knows how that will affect the opinion of the future as to the coup d'etat of the Prince de Polignac himself, in consequence of a whim of Shakespeare, or perhaps it may have been a revenge like that of Beaumarchais on Burgas, Burgas, Falstaff is in England a type of the ridiculous, his very name provokes laughter, he is the king of clowns. Now, instead of being enormously pot-bellied, absurdly amorous, vain, drunken, old and corrupted, Falstaff was one of the most distinguished men of his time, a knight of the garter, holding a high command in the army. At the accession of Henry V, Sir John Falstaff was only thirty-four years old. This general, who distinguished himself at the Battle of Agincourt, and there took prisoner the Duc d'Alençon, captured in 1420 the town of Montereau, which was vigorously defended. Moreover, under Henry VI, he defeated 10,000 French troops with 1,500 weary and famished men. So much for war. Now let us pass to literature and see... Our own Rabelais, a sober man who drank nothing but water, but is held to be, nevertheless, an extravagant lover of good cheer and a resolute drinker. A thousand ridiculous stories are told about the author of one of the finest books in French literature, Pantocrile. 
Atina, a friend of Titian and the Voltaire of his century, has in our day a reputation the exact opposite of his works and of his character, a reputation which he owes to a grossness of wit in keeping with the writings of his age, when broad farce was held in honour and queens and cardinals wrote tales which would be called in these days licentious. One might go on multiplying such instances indefinitely. In France, and that too, during the most serious epoch of modern history, no woman, unless it be Brunel or Fredegond, has suffered from popular error so much as Catherine de' Medici, whereas Marie de' Medici, all of whose actions were prejudicial to France, has escaped the shame which ought to cover her name. Marie de' Medici wasted the wealth amassed by Henry the Fourth. She never purged herself of the charge of having known of the king's assassination. Her intimate was de Pénon, who did not ward off Ravalec's blow, and who was proved to have known the murderer personally for a long time. Marie's conduct was such that she forced her son to banish her from France, where she was encouraging her other son, Gaston, to rebel, and the victory Rochelieu at last won over her on the day of the dupes was due solely to the discovery the cardinal made, and imparted to Louis the Thirteenth of secret documents relating to the death of Henri the Fourth. Catherine de Medici, on the contrary, saved the crown of France. She maintained the royal authority in the midst of circumstances under which more than one great prince would have succumbed. Having to make head against factions and ambitions like those of the Guises and the House of Bourbon, against men such as the two cardinals of Lorraine, the two Balafre and the two Condé, against the queen Jean d'Albret, Henri the Fourth, the Connetable de Montmorency, Calvin, the three colonies, Theodore de Bez, she needed to possess and to display the rare qualities and precious gifts of a statesman under the mocking fire of the Calvinist press. Those facts are incontestable. Therefore, to whosoever burrows into the history of the sixteenth century in France, the figure of Catherine de' Medici will seem like that of a great king. When calumny is once dissipated by facts, recovered with difficulty from among the contradictions of pamphlets and false anecdotes, all explains itself to the fame of this extraordinary woman, who had none of the weaknesses of her sex, who lived chaste amid the license of the most dissolute court in Europe, and who, in spite of her lack of money, erected noble, public buildings, as if to repair the loss caused by the iconoclasms of the Calvinists, who did as much harm to art as to the body politic. Hemmed in between the Guises who claimed to be the heirs of Charlemagne and the factious young branch who sought to screen the treachery of the Connetable de Bourbon behind the throne, Catherine forced to combat the heresy which was seeking to annihilate the monarchy without friends, aware of treachery among the leaders of the Catholic party, foreseeing a republic in the Calvinist party, Catherine employed the most dangerous but the surest weapon of public policy, craft. She resolved to trick and so defeat successfully the Guises who were seeking the ruin of the House of Valois, the Bourbon, who sought the crown and the reformers, the radicals of those days, who dreamed of an impossible republic, like those of our time, who have, however, nothing to reform. Consequently, so long as she lived, the Valois kept the throne of France. The great historian of that time, de Tu, knew well the value of this woman when, on hearing of her death, he exclaimed, It is not a woman, it is monarchy itself that has died. Catherine had, in the highest degree, the sense of royalty, and she defended it with admirable courage and persistency. The reproaches which Calvinist writers had cast upon her are to her glory. She incurred them by reason only of her triumphs. Could she, placed as she was, triumph otherwise than by craft? The whole question lies there. As for violence, that means is one of the most disputed questions of public policy. In our time it has been answered on the Place Louis the Fifteenth, where they have now set up an Egyptian stone as if to obliterate regicide and offer a symbol of the system of materialistic policy which governs us. It was answered at the Calme and at the Abbey, answered on the steps of Saint Roche, answered once more by the people against the king before the Louvre in 1830. 
as it has since been answered by Lafayette's best of all possible republics against the Republican insurrection at Saint-Marie and the Rue de Hans-Nonin. All power, legitimate or illegitimate, must defend itself when attacked. But the strange thing is that where the people are held heroic in their victory over the nobility, power is called murderous in its duel with the people. If it succumbs after its appeal to force, power is then called imbecile. The present government is attempting to save itself by two laws from the same evil Charles X tried to escape by two ordinances. Is it not a bitter derision? Is craft permissible in the hands of power against craft? May it kill those who seek to kill it? The massacres of the revolution have replied to the massacres of saint Bartholomew. The people become king have done against the king and the nobility what the king and the nobility did against the insurgents of the 16th century. Therefore, the popular historians, who know very well that in a like case the people will do the same thing over again, have no excuse for blaming Catherine de' Medici and Charles the Ninth. All power, said Casimir Perrier, on learning what power ought to be, is a permanent conspiracy. We admire the anti-social maxims put forth by daring writers. Why then this disapproval, which in France attaches to all social truths when boldly proclaimed? This question will explain in itself alone historical errors. Apply the answer to the destructive doctrines which flatter popular passions and the conservative doctrines which repress the mad efforts of the people, and you will find the reason of the unpopularity and also the popularity of certain personages. Lobardemont and Laffemas were, like some men of today, devoted to the defence of power in which they believed. Soldiers or judges, they all obeyed royalty. In these days, Dorte would be dismissed for having misunderstood the orders of the ministry. But Charles X left him governor of a province. The power of the many is accountable to no one. The power of one is compelled to render account to its subjects to the great as well as to the small. Catherine, like Philip II and the Duke of Alba, like the Guises and Cardinal Granve, saw plainly the future that the Reformation was bringing upon Europe. She and they saw monarchies, religion, authority shaken. Catherine wrote from the cabinet of the kings of France a sentence of death to that spirit of inquiry which then began to threaten modern society a sentence which Louis the Fourteenth ended by executing. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes was an unfortunate measure, only so far as it caused the irritation of all Europe against Louis the Fourteenth. At another period, England, Holland, and the Holy Roman Empire would not have welcomed banished Frenchmen and encouraged revolt in France. Why refuse, in these days, to the majestic adversary the most barren of heresies, the grandeur she derived from the struggle itself, Calvinists have written much against the craftiness of Charles the Ninth, but travel through France, see the ruins of noble churches, estimate the fearful wounds given by the religionists to the social body, learn what vengeance they inflicted, and you will ask yourself, as you deplore the evils of individualism, the disease of our present France, the germ of which is in the questions of liberty of conscience then agitated, you will ask yourself, I say, on which side were the executioners? There are, unfortunately, as Catherine herself says in the third division of this study of her career, in all ages hypocritical writers always ready to weep over the fate of two hundred scoundrels killed necessarily. Caesar, who tried to move the Senate to pity the attempt of Catiline, might perhaps have got the better of Cicero, could he have had an opposition and its newspapers at his command. Another consideration explains the historical and popular disfavour in which Catherine is held. The opposition in France has always been Protestant, because it has had no policy but that of negation. It inherits the theories of Lutherans, Calvinists, and Protestants on the terrible words liberty, tolerance, progress, and philosophy. Two centuries have been employed by the opponents of power in establishing the doubtful doctrine of the libre arbitre, liberty of will. Two other centuries were employed in developing the first corollary of liberty of will, namely, liberty of conscience. 
our century is endeavouring to establish the second, namely, political liberty. Placed between the ground already lost and the ground still to be defended, Catherine and the Church proclaimed the salutary principle of modern societies, una fides, unus dominus, using their power of life and death upon the innovators. Though Catherine was vanquished, succeeding centuries have proved her justification. The product of liberty, will, religious liberty, and political liberty, not, observe this, to be confounded with civil liberty, is the France of today. What is the France of 1840? A country occupied exclusively with material interests, without patriotism, without conscience, where power has no vigour, where election, the fruit of liberty of will and political liberty lifts to the surface none but commonplace men, where brute force is now become a necessity against popular violence, where discussion, spreading into everything, stifles the action of legislative bodies, where money rules all questions, where individualism, the dreadful product of the division of property ad infinitum, will suppress the family and devour all, even the nation, which egoism will some day deliver over to invasion. And will say, why not the Tsar? Just as they said, why not the Duc d'Orléans? We don't cling to many things even now, but fifty years hence we shall cling to nothing. Thus, according to Catherine de' Medici, and according to all those who believe in a well-ordered society, in social man, the subject cannot have liberty of will, or not to teach the dogma of liberty of conscience, or demand political liberty. But as no society can exist without guarantees granted to the subject against the sovereign, there results for the subject liberties subject to restriction. Liberty? No. Liberties? Yes. Precise and well-defined liberties. That is in harmony with the nature of things. It is assuredly beyond the reach of human power to prevent the liberty of thought, and no sovereign can interfere with money. Great statesmen were vanquished in the long struggle lasted five centuries, recognized the right of subjects to great liberties. But they did not admit their right to publish antisocial thoughts, nor did they admit the indefinite liberty of the subject. To them the word subject and liberty were terms that contradicted each other, just as the theory of citizens being all equal constitutes an absurdity which nature contradicts at every moment. To recognize the necessity of a religion, the necessity of authority, and then relieve people of the right to deny religion, attack its worship, oppose the exercise of power by public expression, communicable and communicated by thought, was an impossibility which the Catholics of the 16th century would not hear of. Alas, the victory of Calvinism will cost France more in the future than it has yet cost her, for religious sects and humanitarian equality-leveling politics are today the tale of Calvinism and, Judging by the mistakes of the present power, its contempt for intellect, its love for material interests, in which it seeks the basis of its support, though material interests are the most treacherous of all supports, we may predict that unless some providence intervenes, the genius of destruction will again carry the day over the genius of preservation. The assailants who have nothing to lose and all to gain understand each other thoroughly whereas their rich adversaries will not make any sacrifice, either of money or self-love, to draw to themselves supporters. The art of printing came to the aid of the opposition begun by the Vaudois and the Albigenses. As soon as human thought, instead of condensing itself, as it was formerly forced to do to remain in communicable form, took on a multitude of garments and became, as it were, the people itself, Instead of remaining a sort of axiomatic divinity, there are two multitudes to combat. The multitude of ideas and the multitude of men. The royal power succumbed in that warfare, and we are now assisting in France at its last combination with elements which render its existence difficult, not to say impossible. Power is action, and the elective principle is discussion. There is no policy, no statesmanship possible, where discussion is permanent. Therefore, we ought to recognize the grandeur of the women who had the eyes to see this future and fought it bravely. That the House of Bourbon was able to succeed to the House of Valois, that it found a crown preserved to it, was due solely to Catherine de' Medici. Suppose the second Balafre had lived. 
no matter how strong the Bernay was, it is doubtful whether he could have seized the crown, seeing how dearly the Duc de Mayenne and the remains of the Guise party had sold it to him. The means employed by Catherine, who certainly had to reproach herself with the deaths of Francois II and Charles the Ninth, whose lives might have been saved in time, were never, it is observable, made the subject of accusations by either the Calvinists or modern historians. Though there was no poisoning, as some grave writers have said, there was other conduct almost as criminal. There is no doubt she hindered Paré from saving one and allowed the other to accomplish his own doom by moral assassination. But the sudden death of Francois II and that of Charles IX were no injury to the Calvinists, and therefore the causes of these two events remained in their secret sphere and were never suspected either by the writers of the people of that day, though not divined, except by de Tu, l'hôpital, and minds of that calibre, or by the leaders of the two parties who were coveting or defending the throne and believed such means necessary to their end. Popular songs attacked, strangely enough, Catherine's morals. Everyone knows the anecdote of the soldier who was roasting a goose in the courtyard of the Chateau de Tours during the conference between Catherine and Henri IV, singing as he did so, a song in which the queen was grossly insulted. Henri the Fourth drew his sword to go out and kill the man, but Catherine stopped him and contented herself with calling from the window to insult him. Eh, hey, but it was Catherine who gave you the goose. Though the executions at Amboise were attributed to Catherine, and though the Calvinists made her responsible for all the inevitable evils of that struggle, it was with her as it was later with Robespierre, who was still waiting to be justly judged. Catherine was, moreover, rightly punished for a preference for the Duc d'Anjou, to whose interests the two elder brothers were sacrificed. Henri III, like all spoiled children, ended in becoming absolutely indifferent to his mother, and he plunged voluntarily into the life of debauchery which made of him what his mother had made of Charles the Ninth, a husband without sons, a king without heirs. Unhappily, the Duc d'Alençon, Catherine's last male child, had already died a natural death. The last words of the great queen were like a summing up of her lifelong policy, which was moreover so plain in its common sense that all cabinets are seen under similar circumstances to put it in practice. Enough cut off, my son, she said, when Henri the Third came to her deathbed to tell her that the great enemy of the crown was dead. Now peace together. By which she meant that the throne should at once reconcile itself with the house of Lorraine and make use of it as the only means of preventing evil results in the hatred of the Guises, and holding out to them the hope of surrounding the king. But the persistent craft and dissimulation of the woman and the Italian, which she had never failed to employ, was incompatible with the debauched life of her son. Catherine de' Medici once dead, the policy of the Valois died also. Before undertaking to write the history of the manners and morals of this period in action, the author of this study has patiently and minutely examined the principal reigns in the history of France, the quarrel of the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, that of the Guises and the Valois, each of which covers a century. His first intention was to write a picturesque history of France. Three women, Isabella of Bavaria, Catherine and Marie de' Medici, hold an enormous place in it, their sway reaching from the 14th to the 17th century, ending in Louis the 14th. Of these three queens, Catherine is the finer and more interesting. Hers was virile power, dishonoured neither by the terrible amours of Isabella, nor by those, even more terrible, though less known, of Marie de' Medici. Isabella summoned the English into France against her son, and loved her brother-in-law, the Duke d'Orléans. The record of Marie de' Medici is heavier still. Neither had political genius. It was in the course of these studies that the writer acquired a conviction of Catherine's greatness as he became initiated into the constantly renewed difficulties of her position, he saw with what injustice historians, all influenced by Protestants, had treated this queen. Out of this conviction grew the three sketches which here follow, in which some erroneous opinions formed upon Catherine, also upon the persons who surround her and on the events of her time are refuted. If this book is placed among the philosophical studies, it is because it shows the spirit of a time, and because we may clearly see in it the influence of thought. But before entering the political arena, where Catherine will be seen facing the two great difficulties of her career, 
it is necessary to give a succinct account of her preceding life from the point of view of impartial criticism in order to take in as much as possible of this vast and regal existence up to the moment when the first part of the present study begins never was there any period in any land in any sovereign family a greater contempt for legitimacy than the famous house of the medici on the subject of power they held the same doctrine now professed by russia namely to whichever head the crown goes he is the true the legitimate sovereign mirabeau had reason to say there has been but one mesalliance in my family that of the medici for in spite of the paid efforts of genealogists it is certain that the medici before everardo de medici gonfaloniero of florence in thirteen fourteen were simple florentine merchants who became very rich the first personage of, in this family who occupies an important place in the history of the famous tuscan republic is silvestro de medici gonfaloniero in thirteen seventy eight this silvestro had two sons cosmo and lorenzo de medici from cosmo are descended lorenzo the magnificent duke de nemours duke de Bino, father of catherine pope leo the tenth pope clement the seventh and alessandro not duke of florence as historians call him but duke della citta di pena a title given by pope clement the seventh as a halfway station for that of grand duke of tuscany from lorenzo are descended the florentine brutus lorenzino who killed alessandro cosmo the first grand duke and all the sovereigns of tuscany till seventeen thirty seven of which period the house became extinct but neither of the two branches the branch cosmo and the branch lorenzo reigned through their direct and legitimate lines until the close of the sixteenth century when the grand dukes of tuscany began to succeed each other peacefully alessandro de medici he to whom the title of duke della citta de pena was given was the son of the duke de Bino. catherine's father by a moorish slave for this reason lorenzino claimed a double right to kill alessandro as a usurper in his house as well as an oppressor of the city some historians believe that alessandro was the son of clement the seventh the fact that led to the recognition of this bastard as chief of the republic and head of the house of the medici was his marriage with margaret of austria natural daughter of charles v francesco de medici husband of bianca capello accepted as his son a child of poor parents brought by the celebrated venetian and strange to say ferdinando on succeeding francesco maintained the substituted child in all his rights that child called antonio de medici was considered during four reigns as belonging to the family he won the affection of everybody rendered important services to the family and died universally regretted nearly all the first medici had natural children whose careers were invariably brilliant for instance the cardinal giulio de medici afterwards pope under the name of clement the seventh was the illegitimate son of giuliano the first cardinal ippolito de medici was also a bastard and came very near being pope and the head of the family lorenzo too the father of catherine married in fifteen eighteen for his second wife madeleine de la tour de bologna in avergne and died april the twenty fifth fifteen nineteen a few days after his wife who died in giving birth to catherine catherine was therefore orphaned of father and mother as soon as she drew breath hence the strange adventures of her childhood mixed up as they were with the bloody efforts of the florentines when seeking to recover their liberty from the medici the latter desirous of continuing to reign in florence behaved with such circumspection that lorenzo catherine's father had taken the name of duke de Bino. at lorenzo's death the head of the house of the medici was pope leo x who sent the illegitimate son of giuliano giulio de medici then cardinal to govern florence leo x was great uncle to catherine and this cardinal giulio afterward clement VII, was her uncle by the left hand it was during the siege of florence undertaken by the medici to force their return there that the republican party not content with having shut catherine then nine years old into a convent after robbing her of all her property actually proposed on the suggestion of one named battista che to expose her between two battlements on the walls the artillery of the medici bernardo castiglione went further in a council held to determine how matters should be ended he was of opinion that so far from returning her to the pope as the latter requested she ought to be given to the soldiers for dishonour this will show how all popular revolutions resemble each other 
Catherine's subsequent policy, which upheld so firmly the royal power, may well have been instigated in part by such scenes, of which an Italian girl of nine years of age was assuredly not ignorant. The rise of Alessandro de' Medici, to which the bastard Pope Clement the Seventh powerfully contributed, was no doubt chiefly caused by the affection of Charles V for his famous legitimate daughter, Margaret. Thus Pope and Emperor were prompted by the same sentiment. At this epoch Venice had the commerce of the world. Rome had its moral government. Italy still reigned supreme, through the poets, the generals, the statesmen born to her. At no period of the world's history in any land was there ever seen so remarkable, so abundant a collection of men of genius. There were so many, in fact, that even the lesser princes were superior men. Italy was crammed with talent, enterprise, knowledge, science, poesy, wealth, and gallantry, all the while torn by intestinal warfare and overrun with conquerors struggling for possession of her finest provinces. When men are so strong, they do not fear to admit their weaknesses. Hence, no doubt, this golden age for bastards. We must, moreover, do the legitimate children of the house of the Medici the justice to say that they were ardently devoted to the glory, power, and increase of wealth of that famous family. Thus, as soon as the Duca della Cite de Pena, son of the Moorish woman, was installed as tyrant of Florence, he espoused the interest of Pope Clement VII and gave a home to the daughter of Lorenzo II, then eleven years of age. When we study the march of events and that of men in this curious 16th century, we ought never to forget that public policy had for its element a perpetual craftiness and a dissimulation which destroyed in all characters the straightforward, upright bearing our imaginations demand of eminent personages. In this, above all, is Catherine's absolution. It disposes of the vulgar and foolish accusations of treachery launched against her by the writers of the Reformation. This was the great age of that statesmanship, the code of which was written by Machiavelli as well as by Spinoza, by Hobbes as well as Montesquieu. For the dialogue between Scylla and Eucrates contains Montesquieu's true thought, which his connection with the encyclopedist did not permit him to develop otherwise than as he did. These principles are today the secret law of all cabinets in which plans for the conquest and maintenance of great power are laid. In France we blamed Napoleon when he made use of that Italian genius for craft which was bred in his bone, but in his case it did not always succeed. But Charles V, Catherine, Philip II and Pope Julius would not have acted otherwise than as he did in the affair of Spain. History in the days when Catherine was born, if judged from the point of view of honesty, would seem an impossible tale. Charles V obliged to sustain Catholicism against the attacks of Luther, who threatened the throne in threatening the tiara, allowed the siege of Rome, and held Pope Clement VII in prison. The same Clement, who had no bitterer enemy than Charles V, courted him in order to make Alessandro de' Medici ruler of Florence, and obtained his favourite daughter for that bastard. No sooner was Alessandro established than he, conjointly with Clement VII, endeavoured to injure Charles V by allying himself with Francois I, King of France, by means of Catherine de' Medici. Both of them promised to assist Francois in reconquering Italy. Lorenzino de' Medici made himself the companion of Alessandro's debaucheries for the express purpose of finding an opportunity to kill him. Filippo Strozzi, one of the great minds of that day, held this murder in such respect that he swore that his sons should each marry a daughter of the murderer, and each son religiously fulfilled his father's oath, when they might all have made, under Catherine's protection, brilliant marriages, for one was the rival of Doria, the other a marshal of France. Cosmo de' Medici, successor of Alessandro, with whom he had no relationship, avenged the death of that tyrant in the cruelest manner, with a persistency lasting twelve years, during which time his hatred continued keen against the persons who had, as a matter of fact, given him the power. He was eighteen years old and called to the sovereignty. His first act was to declare the rights of Alessandro's legitimate sons, null and void all the while avenging their father's death. Charles V confirmed this disinheriting of his grandsons and recognised Cosmo instead of the son of Alessandro and his daughter Margaret. Cosmo, placed on the throne by Cardinal Chibo, instantly exiled the latter, and the cardinal revenged himself by accusing Cosmo, who was the first grand duke, of murdering Alessandro's son. Cosmo, as jealous of his power as Charles V was of his, 
abdicated in favour of his son Francesco after causing the death of his other son, Garcia, to avenge the death of Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici, whom Garcia had assassinated. Cosmo I and his son Francesco, who ought to have been devoted, body and soul, to the house of France, the only power on which they might really have relied, made themselves the lackeys of Charles V and Philip II, and were consequently the secret, base and perfidious enemies of Catherine de' Medici, one of the glories of their house. Such were the leading contradictory and illogical traits, the treachery, knavery, and black intrigues of single house, that of the Medici. From this sketch we may judge of the other princes of Italy and Europe. All the envoys of Cosmos I to the court of France had in their secret instructions an order to poison Strozzi, Catherine's relation, when he arrived. Charles V had already assassinated three of the ambassadors of Francois I. It was early in the month of October 1533 that the Duca della Citta di Pena started from Florence for Livorno, accompanied by the sole heiress of Lorenzo II, namely Catherine de' Medici. The Duke and the Princess of Florence, that was the title by which the young girl, then fourteen years of age, was known, left the city surrounded by a large retinue of servants, officers and secretaries, preceded by armed men and followed by an escort of cavalry. The young princess knew nothing as yet of what her fate was to be, except that the Pope was to have an interview at Livorno with the Duke Alessandro, but her uncle, Filippo Strozzi, very soon informed her of the future before her. Filippo Strozzi had married Clarice de' Medici, half-sister on the father's side of Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke of Urbino, father of Catherine. This marriage, which was brought about as much to convert one of the firmest supporters of the popular party to the cause of the Medici, as to facilitate the recall of that family, then banished from Florence, never shook the stern champion from his course, though he was persecuted by his own party for making it. In spite of all apparent changes in his conduct, for this alliance naturally affected it somewhat, he remained faithful to the popular party and declared himself openly against the Medici as soon as he foresaw their intention to enslave Florence. This great man even refused the offer of a principality made to him by Leo X, at the time of which we are writing, Filippo Strozzi was a victim to the policy of the Medici, so vacillating in its means, so fixed and inflexible in its object. After sharing the misfortunes and the captivity of Clement the Seventh, when the latter, surprised by the Colonna, took refuge in the castle of Saint Angelo, Strozzi was delivered up by Clement as a hostage and taken to Naples. As the Pope, when he got his liberty, turned savagely on his enemies, Strozzi came very near losing his life was forced to pay an enormous sum to be released from a prison where he was closely confined. When he found himself at liberty, he had, with an instinct of kindness natural to an honest man, the simplicity to present himself before Clement the Seventh, who had perhaps congratulated himself on being well rid of him. The Pope had such good cause to blush for his own conduct that he received Strozzi extremely ill. Strozzi thus began early in life his apprenticeship in the misfortunes of an honest man in politics a man whose conscience cannot lend itself to the capriciousness of events, whose actions are acceptable only to the virtuous, and who is therefore persecuted by the world, by the people for opposing their blind passions, by power for opposing its usurpations. The life of such great citizens is a martyrdom in which they are sustained only by the voice of their conscience and an heroic sense of social duty, which dictates their course in all things. There were many such men in the Republic of Florence, all as great as Strozzi, and as able as their adversaries, the Medici, though vanquished by the superior craft and wiliness of the latter. What could be more worthy of admiration than the conduct of the chief of the Patsy at the time of the conspiracy of his house, when, his commerce being at that time enormous, he settled all his accounts with Asia, the Levant, and Europe, before beginning that great attempt, so that, if it failed, his correspondence should lose nothing. The history of the establishment of the House of the Medici in the 14th and 15th centuries is a magnificent tale which still remains to be written, though men of genius have already put their hands to it. It is not the history of a republic, nor of a society, nor of any special civilization. It is the history of statesmen, the eternal history of politics, that of usurpers, that of conquerors. As soon as Filippo Strozzi returned to Florence, he re-established the preceding form of government and ousted Ippolito de' Medici, another bastard, 
and the very Alessandro with whom, at the later period of which we are now writing, he was travelling to Livorno. Having completed this change of government, he became alarmed at the evident inconstancy of the people of Florence, and fearing the vengeance of Clement VII, went to Lyon to superintend a vast house of business he owned there, which corresponded with other banking houses of his own in Venice, Rome, France, and Spain. Here we find a strange thing. These men who bore the weight of public affairs, and of such a struggle as that with the Medici, not to speak of contentions with their own party, found time and strength to bear the burden of a vast business and all its speculations, also of banks and their complications, which the multiplicity of coinage and their falsification rendered even more difficult than it is in our day. The name banker comes from the banque anglis bench, on which the banker sits, and on which he rang the gold and silver pieces to try their quality. End of section one. Section two of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction, part two. After a time, Philippa found in the death of his wife, whom he adored, a pretext for renewing his relations with the Republican Party, whose secret police becomes the more terrible in all republics, because everyone makes himself a spy in the name of liberty which justifies everything. Filippo returned to Florence at the very moment when that city was compelled to adopt the yoke of Alessandro. But he had previously gone to Rome and seen Pope Clement VII, whose affairs were now so prosperous that his disposition towards Strozzi was much changed. In the hour of triumph, the Medici were so much in need of a man like Filippo, were it only to smooth the return of Alessandro, that Clement urged him to take a seat at the Council of the Bastard who was about to oppress the city and Strozzi consented to accept the diploma of a senator. But for the last two years and more, he had seen, like Seneca and Boris, the beginnings of tyranny in his Nero. He felt himself, at the moment of which we write, an object of so much distrust on the part of the people, so suspected by the Medici, whom he was constantly resisting, that he was confident of some impending catastrophe. Consequently, as soon as he heard from Alessandro of the negotiation for Catherine's marriage with the son of Francois I, the final arrangements for which were to be made at Livorno, where the negotiators had appointed to meet, he formed the plan of going to France and attaching himself to the fortunes of his niece, who needed a guardian. Alessandro delighted to rid himself of a man so unaccommodating in the affairs of Florence, furthered a plan which relieved him of one murder at least, and advised Strozzi to put himself at the head of Catherine's household. In order to dazzle the eyes of France, the Medici had selected a brilliant suite for her whom they styled very unwarrantably the Princess of Florence, and who was, and who also went by the name of the Little Duchess de Bino. The cortege at the head of which rode Alessandro, Catherine, and Strozzi was composed of more than a thousand persons, not including the escort and servants. When the last of it issued from the gates of Florence, the head had passed that first village beyond the city, where they now braid the Tuscan straw hats. It was beginning to be rumoured among the people that Catherine was to marry a son of Francois I. The rumour did not obtain much belief until the Tuscans beheld with their own eyes this triumphal procession from Florence to Livorno. Catherine herself, judging by all the preparations she beheld, began to suspect that her marriage was in question, and her uncle then revealed to her the fact that the first ambitious project of his house had aborted, and that the hand of the dauphin had been refused to her. Alessandro still hoped that the Duke of Albany would succeed in changing his decision of the King of France, who, willing as he was to buy the support of the Medici in Italy, would only grant them his second son, the Duke d'Orléans. This petty blunder lost Italy to France, and did not prevent Catherine from becoming Queen. The Duke of Albany, son of Alexander Stuart, brother of James III, King of Scotland, had married Anne de la Tour de Boulogne, sister of Madeleine de la Tour de Boulogne, Catherine's mother, who was therefore a maternal uncle. It was through her mother that Catherine was so rich and allied to so many great families, for, strangely enough, her rival, Diane de Poitiers, was also her cousin. Jean de Poitiers, father of Diane, was son of Jean de Boulogne, aunt of the Duchess de Bino. Catherine was also a cousin of Mary Stuart, a daughter-in-law. Catherine now learned that her dowry in money was a hundred thousand ducats. The ducat was a gold piece the size of an old French louis, though less thick. The old louis was worth twenty-four francs. The present one is worth twenty. 
The Comte of Auvergne and Le Raguet was also made a part of the dowry, and Pope Clement added one hundred thousand ducats in jewels, precious stones, and other wedding gifts to which Alessandro likewise contributed his share. On arriving at Livorno, Catherine, still so young, must have been flattered by the extreme magnificence displayed by Pope Clement, her uncle in Notre Dame, then head of the House of the Medici, in order to outdo the court of France. He had already arrived at Livorno in one of his galleys, which was lined with crimson satin, fringed with gold, and covered with a tent-like awning in cloth of gold. This galley, the decoration of which cost 20,000 ducats, contained several apartments designed for the bride of Henri of France, all of which were furnished with the richest treasures of art the Medici could collect. The rowers, magnificently apparelled, and the crew were under the command of a prior of what the Order of the Knights of Rhodes. The household of the Pope were in three other galleys. The galleys of the Duke of Albany, anchored near those of Clement VII, added to the size and dignity of the Fertilla. Duke Alessandro presented the officers of Catherine's household to the Pope, with whom he had a secret conference, in which it would appear he presented to his holiness Count Sebastiano Montecuccini, who had just left somewhat abruptly the service of Charles V and that of his two generals, Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando de Gonzago, was there between the two bastards, Giulio and Alessandro, the premeditated intention of making the Duke d'Orléans dauphin. What reward was promised to Sebastiano Montecuccioli, who, before entering the service of Charles V, had studied medicine? History is silent on that point. We shall see presently what clouds hang around that fact. The obscurity is so great that quite recently grave and conscientious historians have admitted Montecuccioli's innocence. Catherine then heard officially from the Pope's own lips of the alliance reserved for her. The Duke of Albany had been able to do no more than hold the King of France, and that with difficulty to his promise of giving Catherine the hand of his second son, the Duke d'Orléans. The Pope's impatience was so great, and he was so afraid that his plans would be thwarted either by some intrigue of the Emperor, or by the refusal of France, or by the grandees of the kingdom looking with evil eye upon the marriage, that he gave orders to embark at once and sail for Marseille, where he arrived toward the end of October 1533. Notwithstanding its wealth, the house of the Medici was eclipsed on this occasion by the court of France. To show the lengths to which the Medici pushed their magnificence, it is enough to say that the dozen, put into the bride's purse by the Pope, were twelve gold medals of priceless historical value, which were then unique. But Francois I, who loved the display of festivals, distinguished himself on this occasion. The wedding festivals of Henri de Valois and Catherine de Medici lasted thirty-four days. It is useless to repeat the details which have been given in all the histories of Provence and Marseille as to this celebrated interview between the Pope and King of France, which was opened by a jest of the Duke of Albany as the duty of keeping fasts, a jest mentioned by Brian Tom and much enjoyed by the court, which shows the tone of the manners of that day. Many conjectures have been made as to Catherine's barrenness, which lasted ten years. Strange calumnies still rest upon this queen, all of whose actions were fated to be misjudged. It is sufficient to say that the cause was solely in Henri II. After the difficulty was removed, Catherine had ten children. The delay was, in one respect, fortunate for France. If Henri II had had children by Diane de Poitiers, the politics of the kingdom would have been dangerously complicated. When the difficulty was removed, Duchess de Valentinois had reached the period of a woman's second youth. This matter alone will show that the true life of Catherine de' Medici is still to be written, and also, as Napoleon said with profound wisdom, that the history of France should be either in one volume only or one thousand. Here is a contemporaneous and succinct account of the meeting of Clement VII and the King of France. His Holiness the Pope, having been conducted to the palace, which was, as I have said, prepared beyond the port, everyone retired to their own quarters till the morrow, when His Holiness was to make his entry which was made with great sumptuousness and magnificence, he being seated in a chair, carried on the shoulders of two men, and wearing his pontifical robes, but not the tiara. Pacing before him was a white hackney, bearing the sacrament of the altar, said hackney being led by reins of white silk, held by two footmen, finely equipped. Next came all the cardinals in their robes, on pontifical mules, and Madame la Duchesse de Binot, in great magnificence, accompanied by a vast number of ladies and gentlemen, both French and Italian. 
The Holy Father, having arrived in the midst of this company at the place appointed for his lodging, every one retired, and all this, being well ordered, took place without disorder or tumult. While the Pope was thus making his entry, the king crossed the water in a frigate and went to the lodging the Pope had just quitted, in order to go the next day and make obeisance to the Holy Father as a most Christian king. The next day, the king being prepared to set forth for the palace, there was the Pope, accompanied by the princes of the blood, such as Monseigneur le Duc de Vendemois, father of the Vidame de Chartres, the Comte de Saint-Paul, Monsieur de Montpensier, and La Roche-Soyon, the Duc de Nemours, brother of the Duc de Savoie, who died in this sad place, the Duke of Albany, and many others, whether counts, barons, or seigneurs, nearest to the king, the Seigneur de Montmorency, his Grand Master. The king, being arrived at the palace, was received by the Pope and all the College of Cardinals assembled in consistory most civilly. This done, he retired to the place ordained for him, the king taking with him several cardinals to feast them, among them Cardinal de Medici, nephew of the Pope, a very splendid man with a fine retinue. On the morrow, those persons chosen by his holiness and by the king began to assemble to discuss the matters for which the meeting was made. First, the matter of the faith was treated of, and the bill was put forth for pressing heresy, preventing that things come to greater combustion than they are now. After this was concluded the marriage of the Duc d'Orléans, second son of the king, with Catherine de Medici, Duchess de Bino, niece of his holiness, under conditions such or like to those as proposed formerly by the Duke of Albany. The said espousals were celebrated with great magnificence, and our Holy Father himself wedded the pair. The marriage thus consummated, the Holy Father held a consistory at which he created four cardinals and devoted them to the king, to wit, Cardinal of Venure, formerly Bishop of Lyceu, and Grand Almoner, the Cardinal de Boulogne of the family of La Chambre, a brother on the mother's side of the Duke of Albany, the Cardinal de Châtillon of the House of Coligny, nephew of the Sire de Montmorency, and the Cardinal de Givre. When Strozzi delivered the dowry in presence of the court, he noticed some surprise on the part of the French seigneurs. They even said aloud that it was little enough for such a mesalliance. What would they have said in these days? Cardinal Ippolito replied, saying, You must be ill-informed as to the secrets of your king. His holiness has bound himself to give to France three pearls of inestimable value, namely, Genoa, Milan, and Naples. The Pope left Sebastiano Montecuculli to present himself to the court of France, to which the Count offered his services, complaining of his treatment by Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando di Gonzago, for which reason his services were accepted. Montecuculli was not made a part of Catherine's household, which was wholly composed of French men and women, for by a law of the monarchy, the execution of which the Pope saw with great satisfaction. Catherine was naturalized by letters patent as a Frenchwoman before the marriage. Montecuculli was appointed in the first instance to the household of the Queen, the sister of Charles V. After a while, he passed into the service of the Dauphin as cupbearer. The new Duchess d'Orléans soon found herself a nullity at the court of Francois I. Her young husband was in love with Diane de Poitiers, who certainly in the matter of birth could rival Catherine, and was far more a great lady than the little Florentine. The daughter of the Medici was also outdone by Queen Eleanor, sister of Charles V, by Madame d'Entomp, whose marriage was with the head of the House of Bosse, made her one of the most powerful and best titled women in France. Catherine's aunt, the Duchess of Albany, the Queen of Navarre, Duchess de Guise, the Duchess de Vendôme, Madame la Connetable de Montmorency, and other women of like importance, eclipsed by birth and by their rights, as well as by their power, the most sumptuous court of France, not excepting that of Louis XIV, the daughter of the Florentine grocers, was richer and more illustrious through the house of the Tour de Boulogne and by her own family of Medici. The position of his niece was so bad and difficult that the Republican Filippo Strozzi, wholly incapable of guiding her in the midst of such conflicting interests, left her after the first year, being recalled to Italy by the death of Clement VII. Catherine's conduct, when we remember that she was scarcely fifteen years old, was a model of prudence. She attached herself closely to the king, her father-in-law. She left him as little as she could, following him on horseback both in hunting and in war. Her idolatry for Francois I saved the house of the Medici from all suspicion when the dauphin was poisoned. 
Catherine was then, and so was her husband, at the headquarters of the king in Provence, for Charles V had speedily invaded France, and the late scene of the marriage festivities had become the theatre of a cruel war. At the moment when Charles V was put to flight, leaving the bones of his army in Provence, the dauphin was returning to Lyon by the Rhone. He stopped to sleep at Tournon, and by way of pastime practised some violent physical exercises, which were nearly all the education his brother and he, in consequence of their detention as hostages, had ever received. The prince had the imprudence, it being the month of August, and the weather very hot, to ask for a glass of water, which Montecuculi, as his cupbearer, gave to him with ice in it. Dauphin died almost immediately. Francois I adored his son. The Dauphin was, according to all accounts, a charming young man. His father, in despair, gave the utmost publicity to the proceedings against Montecuculi, which he placed in the hands of the most able magistrates of that day. The Count, after heroically enduring the first tortures without confessing anything, finally made admissions by which he implicated Charles V and his two generals, Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando de Gonzaga. No affair was ever more solemnly debated. Here is what the king did in the words of an ocular witness. The king called an assembly at Lyon of all the princes of his blood, all the knights of his order, and all the great personages of the kingdom, also the legal and papal nuncio, cardinals who were at his court, together with the ambassadors of England, Scotland, Portugal, Venice, Ferrara, and others, also all the princes and noble strangers, both Italian and German, who were then residing at his court in great numbers. These all being assembled, he caused to be read to them in presence of each other, from beginning to end, the trial of the unhappy man who poisoned Monseigneur, the late Dauphin, with all the interrogatories, confessions, confrontings, and other ceremonies usual in criminal trials. He, the king, not being willing that the sentence should be executed until all present had given their opinion on this heinous and miserable case. The fidelity, devotion, and cautious skill of the Comte de Montecuculi may seem extraordinary in our time when all the world, even ministers of state tell everything about the least little event with which they have to do. In those days, princes could find devoted servants, or knew how to choose them. Monarchical mores existed because in those days there was faith. Never ask devotion of self-interest, because such interest may change, but expect all from sentiments, religious faith, monarchical faith, patriotic faith. The three beliefs produced such men as the Butthor of Geneva, the Sydneys and Stratfords of England, the murderers of Thomas A. Beckett, the Jacques Cour, the Jeanne d'Arc, the Richelieu, Danton, Bonchamp, Dalmont, and also the Clemence, Chabots, and others. The Dauphin was poisoned in the same manner, and possibly by the same drug which afterwards saved Madame under Louis the Fourteenth. Pope Clement VII had been dead two years. Duke Alessandro, plunged in debauchery, seemed to have no interest in the elevation of the Duc d'Orléans. Catherine, then seventeen, and full of admiration for her father-in-law, was with him at the time. Charles V alone appeared to have an interest in his death. But Francois I was negotiating for his son an alliance which would assuredly have aggrandized France. The Count's confession was therefore very skilfully based on the passions and politics of the moment. Charles V was then flying from France leaving his armies buried in Provence with his happiness, his reputation, and his hopes of dominion. It is to be remarked that if torture had forced admissions from an innocent man, Francois I gave Montecuculi full liberty to speak in presence of an imposing assembly, before persons in whose eyes innocence had some chance to triumph. The king, who wanted the truth, sought it in good faith. In spite of her now brilliant future, Catherine's situation at court was not changed by the death of the Dauphin. A baroness gave reason to fear a divorce in case her husband should ascend the throne. The dauphin was under the spell of Diane de Poitiers, who assumed to rival Madame d'Etampes, the king's mistress. Catherine redoubled in care and cajolery of her father-in-law, being well aware that her sole support was in him. The first ten years of Catherine's married life were years of ever-renewed grief, caused by the failure, one by one, of her hopes of pregnancy, and the vexations of her rival with Diane. Imagine what must have been the life of a young princess, watched by a jealous mistress who was supported by a powerful party, the Catholic party, and by the two powerful alliances Dan had made in marrying one daughter to Robert de Lamarck, Duc de Bouillon, Prince of Sedan, and the other to Claude de Lorraine, Duc de Malais. Catherine, 
helpless between the party of Madame de Tomp and the party of the Sénégal. Such was Dan's title during the reign of Francois I, which divided the court and politics into factions for these mortal enemies, endeavoured to make herself the friend of both Dan de Poitiers and Madame de Tomp. She, who was destined to become so great a queen, played the part of a servant. Thus she served her apprenticeship in the double-faced policy which was ever the secret motor of her life. Later, the queen was to stand between Catholics and Calvinists, just as the woman had stood for ten years between Madame de Tomp and Madame de Poitiers. She studied the contradictions of French politics. She saw Francois I sustaining Calvin and the Lutherans in order to embarrass Charles V, and then, after secretly and patiently protecting the Reformation in Germany and tolerating the residence of Calvin at the court of Navarre, he suddenly turned against it with excessive rigour. Catherine beheld on the one hand the court and the women of the court playing with the fire of heresy, and on the other, Diane at the head of the Catholic party with the Guises, solely because the Duchess de Tomp supported Calvin and the Protestants. Such was the political education of this queen, who saw in the cabinet of the King of France the same errors committed as in the house of the Medici. The Dauphin opposed his father in everything. He was a bad son. He forgot the cruel but most vital maxim of royalty, namely that thrones need solidarity, and that a son who creates opposition during the lifetime of his father must follow that father's policy when he mounts the throne. Spinoza, who was a as great a statesman as he was a philosopher, said in the case of one king succeeding another by insurrection or crime, the new king desires to secure the safety of his throne and of his own life. He must show such order in avenging the death of his predecessor. But no one shall feel a desire to commit the same crime. But to avenge it worthily, it is not enough to shed the blood of his subjects. He must approve the axioms of the king he replaces and take the same course in governing. It was the application of this maxim which gave Florence to the Medici. Cosmo I caused to be assassinated at Venice after eleven years' sway, the Florentine Brutus, and as we have already said, persecuted the Strozzi. It was forgetfulness of this maxim which ruined Louis the Sixteenth. That king was false to every principle of royal government when he re-established the parliaments suppressed by his grandfather. Louis the Fifteenth saw the matter clearly. The parliaments, and notably that of Paris, counted fully half in the troubles which necessitated the convocation of the States General. The fault of Louis XV was that in breaking down that barrier which separated the throne from the people, he did not erect a stronger. In other words, that he did not substitute for Parliament a strong constitution of the provinces. There lay the remedy for the evils of the monarchy. Thence should have come the voting in taxes, the regulation of them, and a slow approval of reforms that were necessary to the system of monarchy. The first act of Henri II was to give his confidence to the Connetable de Montmorency, whom his father had enjoined him to leave in disgrace. The Connetable de Montmorency was with Diane de Poitiers, to whom he was closely bound, the master of the state. Catherine was therefore less happy and less powerful after she became Queen of France than while she was Dauphiness. From 1543 she had a child every year for ten years and was occupied with maternal cares during the period covered by the last three years of the reign of Francois I, and nearly the whole of the reign of Henri II. We may see in this recurring fecundity the influence of a rival, who was able thus to rid herself of the legitimate wife, a barbarity of feminine policy which must have been one of Catherine's grievances against Diane. Thus set aside from public life, this superior woman passed her time in observing the self-interests of the court people and of the various parties which were formed about her. All the Italians who had followed her were objects of violent suspicion. After the execution of Montecuculli, the Connetable de Montmorency, Diane, and many of the keenest politicians of the court were filled with suspicion of the Medici, though Francois I always repelled it. Consequently, the Gondi, Strozzi, Ruggieri, Sardini, etc., in short, all those who were called distinctively the Italians were compelled to employ greater resources of mind, shrewd policy, and courage to maintain themselves at court against the weight of disfavour which pressed upon them. During her husband's reign, Catherine's amiability to Diane de Poitiers went to such great lengths that intelligent persons must regard it as proof of that profound dissimulation which men, events, and the conduct of Henri II compelled Catherine de' Medici to employ. But they go too far when they declare that she never claimed her rights as wife and queen. In the first place, the sense of dignity which Catherine possessed in the highest degree forbade her claiming what historians call her rights as a wife. The ten children of the marriage explain Henri's conduct. 
and his wife's maternal occupations left him free to pass his time with Diane de Poitiers. But the king was never lacking in anything that was due to himself, and he gave Catherine an entry into Paris, to be crowned as queen, which was worthy of all such pageants that had ever taken place. The archives of the Parliament and those of the Cour des Comptes show that those two great bodies went to meet her outside of Paris as far as Saint Lazare. Here is an extract from Du Tillet's account of it. A platform had been erected at Saint Lazare, and which was a throne, Du Tillet calls it a chair du Parlement. Catherine took her seat upon it, wearing a surcoat or species of ermine short cloak covered with precious stones, a bodice beneath it with the royal mantle, and on her head a crown enriched with pearls and diamonds, and held in place by the Marshal de la Marque, a lady of honour. Around her stood the princes of the blood, and other princes and seigneurs, richly apparelled, also the Chancellor of France, in a robe of gold damask on a background of crimson red. Before the Queen, on the same platform, were seated in two rows twelve duchesses or countesses, wearing ermine circuits, bodices, robes, and circlets, that is to say, the coronets of duchesses and countesses. These were the Duchesses de Tuville, Montpensier, elder and younger, the Princesses de la roche soyon the Duchesses de Guise, de Nivenois, de Malais, de Valentinois, Diane de Poitiers, Mademoiselle la Batade légitime de France, the title of the king's daughter, Diane, who was Duchess de Castrofanes, and afterwards Duchess de Montpensier d'Amville, Madame la Connetable, and Mademoiselle de Nemours, without mentioning other demoiselles who were not seated. The four presidents of the courts of justice wearing their caps, several other members of the court, and the clerk du Tillet mounted the platform, made reverend bows, and the chief judge, Lisée, kneeling down, harangued the queen. The chancellor then knelt down and answered. The queen made her entry at half-past three o'clock in an open litter, having Madame Marguerite de France sitting opposite to her, and on either side of the litter the cardinals of Amboise, Châtillon, Boulogne, and de Lenincourt in their episcopal robes. She left her litter at the church of Notre-Dame, where she was received by the clergy. After offering her prayer, she was conducted by the Rue de la Calandre to the palace, where the royal supper was served in the great hall. She there appeared, seated at the middle of the marble table, beneath a velvet dais strewn with golden fleur-de-lis. We may here put an end to one of those popular beliefs which are repeated in many writers from Sauvile down. Said that Henri II pushed his neglect of the proprieties so far as to put the initials of his mistress on the buildings which Catherine advised him to continue or to begin with so much magnificence. But the double monogram which can be seen at the Louvre offers a daily denial to those who are so little clear-sighted as to believe in silly nonsense which gratuitously insults our kings and queens. The H, or Henri, and the two C's of Catherine and Bacchett appear to represent the two D's of Diane. The coincidence may have pleased Henri the second, but it is none the less true that the royal monogram contained officially the initial of the king and that of the queen. This is so true that the monogram can still be seen on the column of the Al au Bleu, which was built by Catherine alone. It can also be seen in the crypt of Saint Denis, in the tomb which Catherine erected for herself in her lifetime beside that of Henri the second, where her figure is modelled from nature by the sculptor to whom she sat for. On a solemn occasion, when he was starting, March the 25th, 1552, for his expedition to Germany, Henri II declared Catherine regent during his absence, and also in case of his death. Catherine's most cruel enemy, the author of Marvellous Discourses on Catherine II's Behaviour, admits that she carried on the government with universal approval, and that the king was satisfied with her administration. Henri received both money and men at the time he wanted them, and finally, after the fatal day of Saint Quentin, Catherine obtained considerable sums of money from the people of Paris, which she sent to Compiègne, where the king then was. In politics, Catherine made immense efforts to obtain a little influence. She was clever enough to bring the Connetable de Montmorency, all powerful under Henri the Second, to her interests. We all know the terrible answer that the king made on being harassed by Montmorency in her favour. This answer was the result of an attempt by Catherine to give the king good advice in the few moments she was ever alone with, when she explained the Florentine policy of pitting the grandees of the kingdom one against each other and establishing the royal authority on their ruin. Henri II, who saw things only through the eyes of Diane and the Connetable, was a truly feudal king and the friend of all the great families of his kingdom. After the futile attempt of the Connetable in her favour, which must have been made in the year 1556, Catherine began to cajole 
the Guises for the purpose of detaching them from Diane and opposing them to the Connetable. Unfortunately, Diane and Montmorency were as vehement against the Protestants as the Guises. There was therefore not the same animosity in their struggle as there might have been had the religious question entered it. Moreover, Diane boldly entered the lists against the Queen's project by coquetting with the Guises and giving her daughter to the Duc de Marley. She even went so far that certain authors declared she gave more than mere goodwill to the gallant Cardinal de Lorraine, and the lampooners of the time made the following quatrain on Henri the Second. Sire, if you're weak, and let your will relax, till Diane and Lorraine do govern you. Pound, knead, and mould, remelt and model you. Sire, you are nothing, nothing else than wax. It is impossible to regard as sincere the signs of grief and the ostentation of mourning which Catherine showed on the death of Henri the Second. The fact that the king was attached by an unalterable passion to Diane de Poitiers naturally made Catherine play the part of a neglected wife who adores her husband. But, like all women who act by their head, she persisted in this dissimulation and never ceased to speak tenderly of Henri the Second. In like manner, Diane, as we know, wore mourning all her life for her husband, the Senecal de Pais. Her colours were black and white, and the king was wearing them at the tournament when he was killed. Catherine, no doubt, in imitation of her rival, wore mourning for Henri the Second for the rest of her life. She showed a consummate perfidy toward Diane de Poitiers, to which historians have not given due attention. At the king's death, the Duchess de Valentinois was completely disgraced and shamefully abandoned by the Connetable, a man who was always below his reputation. Diane offered her estate and chateau of Chenonceau to the queen. Catherine then said, in presence of witnesses, I can never forget that she made the happiness of my dear Henri. I am ashamed to accept her gift. I wish to give her a domain in place of it, and I shall offer her that of chaumont sur loire Accordingly, the deed of exchange was signed at Blois in 1559. Diane, whose sons-in-law were the Duc de Malais and the Duc de Bouillon, then a sovereign prince, kept her wealth and died in 1566, aged 66. She was therefore 19 years older than Henri II. These dates taken from her epitaph, which was copied from her tomb by the historian who concerned himself so much about her at the close of the last century, clear up quite a number of historical difficulties. Some historians have declared she was 40, others that she was 16 at the time of her father's condemnation in 1523. In point of fact, she was then 24. After reading everything for and against her conduct towards Francois I, we are unable to affirm or to deny anything. This is one of the passages of history that will ever remain obscure. We may see by what happens in our own day how history is falsified at the very moment when events happen. Catherine, who had founded great hopes on the age of her arrival, tried more than once to overthrow her. It was a dumb, underhand, terrible struggle. The day came and Catherine believed herself for a moment on the verge of success. In 1554, Diane, who was ill, begged the king to go to Saint-Germain and leave her for a short time until she recovered. This stately coquette did not choose to be seen in the midst of medical appliances and without the splendours of apparel. Catherine arranged, as a welcome to her husband, a magnificent ballet in which six beautiful young girls were to recite a poem in his honour. She chose for this function Miss Fleming, a relation of her uncle, the Duke of Albany, the handsomest young woman, some say, that was ever seen, white and very fair, also one of her own relations, Clarice Strozzi, a magnificent Italian with superb black hair and hands that were of rare beauty. Miss Lewiston, maid of honour to Mary Stuart, Mary Stuart herself, Madame Elizabeth of France, who was afterwards that unfortunate Queen of Spain, and Madame Claude. Elizabeth and Claude were eight and nine years old, Mary Stuart twelve, evidently the Queen intended to bring forward Miss Fleming and Clary Strozzi and present them without rivals to the King. The king fell in love with Miss Fleming, by whom he had a natural son, Henri de Valois, Comte Don Guleme, Grand Prior of France. But the power and influence of Diane were not shaken. Like Madame du Pompadour with Louis XV, Duchess de Valentinois forgave all. But what sort of love did this attempt show in Catherine? Was it love to her husband or love of power? Women may decide. A great deal is said in these days of the license of the press but it is difficult to imagine the lengths to which it went when printing was first invented. We know that Arantino, the Voltaire of his time, made kings and emperors tremble, more especially Charles V, but the world does not know so well the audacity and license of pamphlets. 
The Chateau de Chenonceau, which we have just mentioned, was given to Diane, or rather, not given. She was implored to accept it to make her forget one of the most horrible publications ever levelled against a woman, and which shows the violence of the warfare between herself and Madame de Tonne. In 1537, when she was 38 years of age, a rhymester of Champagne named Jean Vut published a collection of Latin verses in which were three epigrams upon her. It is to be supposed that the poet was sure of protection in high places, for the pamphlet has a preface in praise of itself, signed by Salmon Macrin, first valet de chambre to the king. Only one passage is quotable from these epigrams, which are entitled In Pictavium Anum Auligum. A painted trap catches no game, says the poet, after telling Diane that she painted her face and bought her teeth and hair. You may buy all that superficially makes a woman, but you can't buy that your lover wants, for he wants life and you are dead. This collection, printed by Simon du Collinet, is dedicated to a bishop, to Francois Boyer, the brother of the man who, to save his credit at court and redeem his offence, offered to Diane on the accession of Henri II the Chateau de Chenonceau built by his father, Thomas Boyer, a councillor of state under four kings, Louis XI, Charles VIII, Louis XII, and Francois I. What were the pamphlets published against Madame du Pompadour and against Marie Antoinette compared to these verses, which might have been written by Marshall? Boot must have made a bad end. The estate and chateau cost I nothing more than a forgiveness enjoined by the gospel. After all, the penalties inflicted on the press, though not decreed by juries, were somewhat more severe than those of today. The queens of France, on becoming widows, were required to remain in the king's chamber forty days without other light than that of wax tapers. He did not leave the room until after the burial of the king. This inviolable custom was of great annoyance to Catherine, who feared cabals, and by chance she found a means to evade it. Thus, Cardinal de Lorraine, leaving very early in the morning, the house of the Belle Romane, a celebrated courtesan of the period who lived in the rue Côte de Sainte Catherine, was set upon and maltreated by a party of libertines, on which his holiness, being much astonished, says Henri Estienne, gave out that the heretics were preparing ambushes against him. The court at once removed from Paris to Saint-Germain, and the queen mother, declaring that she would not abandon the king, her son went with him. The accession of Francois II, the period at which Catherine confidently believed she could get possession of the regal power, was a moment of cruel disappointment after the twenty-six years of misery she had lived through at the court of France. The Guises laid hands on power with incredible audacity. The Duc de Guise was placed in command of the army, the connetable was dismissed, the cardinal took charge of the treasury and the clergy. Catherine now began her political career by a drama which, though it did not have the dreadful fame of those of later years, was nevertheless most horrible, and it must undoubtedly have accustomed her to the terrible after-emotions of her life. While appearing to be in harmony with the Guises, she endeavoured to pave the way for her ultimate triumph by seeking support in the house of Bourbon, and the means she took were as follows. Whether it was that, before the death of Henri II, and after fruitlessly attempting violent measures, she wished to awaken jealousy in order to bring the king back to her, or whether, as she approached middle-aged, it seemed to her cruel that she had never known love, certain it is that she showed a strong interest in the seigneur of the royal blood, François de Vendôme, son of Louis de Vendôme, the house from which that of the Bourbons sprang, and the Dame de Chartres, the name under which he is known in history. The secret hatred which Catherine bore to Diane was revealed in many ways, to which historians, preoccupied by political interests, have paid no attention. Catherine's attachment to the Vidame proceeded from the fact that the young man had offered an insult to the favourite. Diane's greatest ambition was for the honour of an alliance with the royal family of France. The hand of her second daughter, afterwards, Duchess de Malay was offered on her behalf to the Vidame de Chartres, who was kept poor by the far-sighted policy of Francois I. In fact, when the Vidame de Chartres and the Prince de Conde first came to court, Francois I gave him what? The office of Chamberlain, with a paltry salary of 1,200 crowns a year, the same that he gave to the simplest gentleman. So Diane de Poitiers offered an immense dowry, a fine office under the crown and the favour of the king, the Vidame refused. After which this Bourbon, already factious, married Jean, daughter of the Baron d'Estissac, by whom he had no children. This act of pride naturally commended him to Catherine, who greeted him after that with marked favour and made a devoted friend of him. Historians have compared the last Duc de Montmorency beheaded at Toulouse to the Vidame de Chartres in the art of pleasing, in attainments, accomplishments, and talent. Henri II showed no jealousy. 
We seem not even to suppose that a queen of France could fail in her duty, or a Medici forget the honour done to her by a Valois. But during this time, when the queen was, it is said, coquetting with the Vidame de Chartres, the king, after the birth of her last child, had virtually abandoned her. This attempt at making him jealous was to no purpose, for Henri died wearing the colours of Diane de Poitiers. At the time of the king's death, Catherine was therefore on terms of gallantry with the Vidame, a situation which was quite in conformity with the manners and morals of a time when love was both so chivalrous and so licentious the noblest actions were as natural as the most blamable. Although historians, as usual, have committed the mistake, in this case, of taking the exception for the rule. The four sons of Henri II, of course, rendered null the position of the Bourbons, who were all extremely poor, and were now crushed down by the contempt which the Contable de Montmorency's treachery brought upon them, in spite of the fact that the latter had thought best to fly the kingdom. The Vidame de Chartres, who was the first Prince de Conde, what Richelieu was to Mazarin, his father in policy, his model, and above all his master in gallantry, concealed the excessive ambition of his house beneath an external appearance of light-hearted gaiety. Unable during the reign of Henri II to make head against the Guises, the Montmorencies, the Scottish princes, the cardinals, and the Bouillons, he distinguished himself by his graceful bearing, his manners, his wit, which won him the favour of many charming women, and the heart of some for whom he cared nothing. He was one of those privileged beings whose seductions are irresistible, and who owe to love the power of maintaining themselves according to their rank. The Bourbons would not have resented, as did Jarnac, the slander of La Chate Narai, who were willing enough to accept the lands and castles of their mistresses. Witness the Ponce de Conde, who accepted the estate of saint valery on Madame le Marchal de Saint Andre. During the first twenty days of mourning after the death of Henri the Second, the situation of the Vidame suddenly changed. As the object of the Queen Mother's regard and permitted to pay his court to her as court is paid to a queen, very secretly he seemed destined to play an important role, and Catherine did, in fact, resolve to use him. The Vidame received letters from her for the Prince de Conde, in which she pointed out to the latter the necessity of an alliance against the Guises. Informed of this intrigue, the Guises entered the Queen's chamber for the purpose of compelling her to issue an order consigning the Vidame to the Bastille, and Catherine, to save herself, was under the hard necessity of obeying them. After a captivity of some months, the Vidame died on the very day he left prison, which was shortly before the conspiracy of Amboise. Such was the conclusion of the first and only amour of Catherine de Medici. Protestant historians have said that the queen caused the Vidame to be poisoned, to lay the secret of her gallantries in a tomb. We have now shown what was the apprenticeship of this woman for the exercise of her royal power. End of section two. End of introduction. Section three of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine. Prescott warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One The Calvinist Martyr. Chapter One A House Which No Longer Exists. At the corner of a street which no longer exists, in a Paris which no longer exists. Few persons in the present day know how plain and unpretentious were the dwellings of the burghers of Paris in the sixteenth century and how simple their lives. Perhaps this simplicity of habits and thought was the cause of the grandeur of that old bourgeoisie which was certainly grand, free, and noble, or so perhaps than the bourgeoisie of the present day. Its history is still to be written. It requires and it awaits a man of genius. This reflection will doubtless rise to the lips of everyone after reading the almost unknown incident which forms the basis of this study, and is one of the most remarkable facts in the history of that bourgeoisie. It will not be the first time in history that conclusion has preceded facts. In 1560, the houses of the Rue de la Vielle Pelleterie skirted the left bank of the Seine between the Pont Notre Dame and the Pont au Change. A public footpath and the houses then occupied the space covered by a present roadway. Each house, standing almost in the river, allowed its dwellers to get down to the water by stone or wooden stairways, closed and protected by strong iron railings or wooden gates, clamped with iron. The houses, like those in Venice, had an 
entrance on terra firma, and a water entrance. At the moment when the present sketch is published, only one of these houses remains to recall the old Paris of which we speak, and that is soon to disappear. It stands at the corner of the Petit Pont, directly opposite to the guardhouse of the Hôtel Dieu. Formerly, each dwelling presented on the riverside the fantastic appearance given either by the trade of its occupant and his habits, or by the originality of the exterior constructions invented by the proprietors to use or abuse the Seine. The bridges being encumbered with more mills than the necessities of navigation could allow, the Seine formed as many enclosed basins as there were bridges. Some of these basins in the heart of old Paris would have offered precious stones and tones of colour to painters. What a forest of cross-beams supported the mills, with their huge sails and their wheels! What strange effects were produced by the piles or props driven into the water to project the upper floors of the houses above the stream! Unfortunately, the art of genre painting did not exist in those days, and that of engraving was in its infancy. We have therefore lost that curious spectacle, still offered, though in miniature, by certain provincial towns, where the rivers are overhung with wooden houses, and where, as at Vendome, the basins, full of water grasses, are enclosed by immense iron railings, to isolate each proprietor's share of the stream, which extends from bank to bank. The name of this street, which has now disappeared from the map, sufficiently indicates the trade that was carried on in it. In those days the merchants of each class of commerce, instead of dispersing themselves about the city, kept together in the same neighbourhood, and protected themselves mutually. Associated in corporations which limited their number, they were still further united into guilds by the church. In this way, prices were maintained. Also, the masters were not at the mercy of their workmen, and did not obey their whims as they do today. On the contrary, they made them their children, their apprentices took care of them, and taught them the intricacies of the trade. In order to become a master, a workman had to produce a masterpiece, which was always dedicated to the saint of his guild. Would any one dare to say that the absence of competition destroyed the desire for perfection, or lessened the beauty of products? What say you, you whose admiration for the masterpieces of past ages has created the modern trade of the sellers of bric-a-brac? In the 15th and 16th centuries, the trade of the furrier was one of the most flourishing industries. The difficulty of obtaining furs, which, being all brought from the north, required long and perilous journeys, gave a very high price and value to those products. Then, as now, high prices led to consumption, for vanity likes to override obstacles. In France, as in other kingdoms, not only did royal ordinances restrict the use of furs to the nobility, proved by the part which ermine plays in the old blazons, but also certain rare furs, such as vair, which was undoubtedly Siberian sable, could not be worn by any but kings, dukes, and certain lords clothed with official powers. A distinction was made between the greater and lesser vair. The very name has been so long disused that in a vast number of editions of Perrault's famous tale, Cinderella's slipper, which was no doubt of vair, the fur, is said to have been made of ver, glass. Lately, one of our most distinguished poets was obliged to establish the true orthography of the word for the instruction of his brother Fuitonists in giving an account of the opera of the Senen Rontela, where the symbolic slipper has been replaced by a ring, which symbolizes nothing at all. Naturally, the sumptuary laws about the wearing of fur were perpetually infringed upon, to the great satisfaction of the furriers. The costliness of stuffs and furs made a garment in those days a durable thing, as lasting as the furniture, the armour, and other items of that strong life of the fifteenth century. A woman of rank, a seigneur, all rich men, also all the burghers, possessed at the most two garments for each season, which lasted their lifetime and beyond it. These garments were bequeathed to their children. Consequently, the clause in the marriage contract relating to arms and clothes, which in these days is almost a dead letter because of the small value of wardrobes that need constant renewing, was then of much importance. Great costs brought with them solidity. The toilet of a woman constituted a large capital. It was reckoned among the family possessions, and was kept in those enormous chests which threatened to break through the floors of our modern houses. 
The jewels of a woman of 1840 would have been the undress ornaments of a great lady in 1540. Today, the discovery of America, the facilities of transportation, the ruin of social distinctions which has paved the way for the ruin of apparent distinctions, has reduced the trade of the furrier to what it now is, next to nothing. The article which a furrier sells today is in former days for 20 livres has followed the depreciation of money, formerly the livre, which is now worth one franc, and is usually so called, was worth twenty francs. Today, the lesser bourgeoisie and the courtesans who edge their capes with sable are ignorant that in 1440 an ill-disposed police officer would have incontinently arrested them and marched them before the justice at the Châtelet. English women, who are so fond of vermin, do not know that in former times none but queens, duchesses, and chancellors were allowed to wear that royal fur. There are today in France several ennobled families whose true name is Pelletier or Le Pelletier, the origin of which is evidently derived from some rich furrier's counter, for most of our burghers' names began in some such way. This digression will explain not only the long feud as to the precedence which the Guild of Drapers maintained for two centuries against the Guild of Furriers, and also of Mercers, each claiming the right to walk first as being the most important guild in Paris, but it will also serve to explain the importance of the Sieur Le Camus, a furrier honoured with the custom of two queens, Catherine de' Medici and Mary Stuart, also the custom of the Parliament, a man who for twenty years was the syndic of his corporation and who lived in the street we have just described. The house of Lecamus was one of three which formed to the three angles of the open space at the end of the Pont au Change, where nothing now remains but the tower of the Palais de Justice, which made the fourth angle. On the corner of this house, which stood at the angle of the Pont au Change and the Caille, now called the Caille aux Fleurs, the architect had constructed a little shrine for a Madonna, which was always lighted by wax tapers and decked with real flowers in summer and artificial ones in winter. On the side of the house toward the Rue du Pont, as on the side toward the Rue de la Vielle Pelleterie, the upper story of the house was supported by wooden pillars. All the houses in this mercantile quarter had an arcade behind these pillars, where the passers in the street walked under cover on a ground of trodden mud, which kept the place always dirty. In all French towns, these arcades or galleries are called les pilières a general term to which was added the name of the business transacted under them, as Pilier des Halles, markets, Pilier de la Boucherie, butchers. These galleries, a necessity in a Parisian climate, which is so changeable and so rainy, gave this part of the city a peculiar character of its own, but they have now disappeared. Not a single house on the river bank remains, and not more than about a hundred feet of the old Pilier des Halles, the last that have resisted the action of time, are left and before long even that relic of the sombre labyrinth of old Paris will be demolished. Certainly the existence of such old ruins of the Middle Ages is incompatible with the grandeurs of modern Paris. These observations are meant not so much to regret the destruction of the old town as to preserve in words, and by the history of those who lived there, the memory of a place now turned to dust, and to excuse the following description, which may be precious to a future age, now treading on the heels of our own. The walls of this house were of wood, covered with slate. The spaces between the uprights had been filled in, as we may still see in some provincial towns, with brick, so placed by reversing their thickness as to make a pattern called Hungarian point. The window casings and lintels, also in wood, were richly carved, and so was the corner pillar, where it rose above the shrine of the Madonna, and all the other pillars in front of the house. Each window and each main beam which separated the different stories was covered with arabesques of fantastic personages and animals, wreathed with conventional foliage. On the street side, as on the river side, the house was capped with a roof, looking as if two cards were set up one against the other, thus presenting a gable to the street and a gable to the water. This roof, like the roof of a Swiss chalet, overhung the building so far that on the second floor there was an outside gallery with a balustrade on which the owners of the house could walk under cover and survey the street also the river basin between the bridges and the two lines of houses. These houses on the river bank were very valuable. In those days, a system of drains and fountains was still to be invented. Nothing of the kind has yet existed except the circuit sewer constructed by Aubureau, provost of Paris under Charles the Wise, who also built the Bastille, 
the Pont Saint Michel, and other bridges, and was the first man of genius who ever thought of the sanitary improvement of Paris. The houses situated like that of Lecamus took from the river the water necessary for the purposes of life, and also made the river serve as a natural drain for rainwater and household refuse. The great works that the merchant's provosts did in this direction are fast disappearing. Middle-aged persons alone can remember to have seen the great holes in the Rue Montmartre, Rue du Temple, etc., down which the waters poured. Those terrible open doors were in the olden time of immense benefit to Paris. Their place will probably be forever marked by the sudden rise of the paved roadways at the spots where they opened, another archaeological detail which would be quite inexplicable to the historian two centuries hence. One day, about 1816, a little girl who was carrying a case of diamonds to an actress at the Ombigu for her part as queen was overtaken by a shower and so nearly washed down the great drain hole in the Rue du Temple that she would have disappeared had it not been for a passer who heard her cries. Unluckily, she had let go the diamonds, which were, however, recovered later at a manhole. This event made a great noise and gave rise to many petitions against these engulfers of water and little girls. They were singular constructions about five feet high, furnished with iron railings, more or less movable, which often caused the inundation of the neighbouring cellars, whenever the artificial river produced by sudden rains was arrested in its course by the filth and refuse collected about these railings, which the owners of the abutting houses sometimes forget to open. The front of this shop of the Sieur Lacamus was all window, formed of sashes of leaded panes which made the interior very dark. The furs were taken for selection to the houses of rich customers. As for those who came to the shop to buy, the goods were shown to them outside, between the pillars, the arcade being, let us remark, encumbered during the daytime with tables and clerks sitting on stools, such as we all remember seeing some fifteen years ago under the Pilier des Halles. From these outposts the clerks and apprentices talked, questioned, answered each other, and called to the passers, customs which the great Walter Scott was made use of in his fortunes of Nigel. The sign which represented an ermine hung outside, as we still see in some village hostelries from a rich bracket of gilded iron filigree. Above the ermine on one side of the sign were the words Le Camus Furrier. To Madame La Roine et du Roy Nostra Sire. On the other hand of the sign were the words To Madame La Roine Mère and Messieurs du Parlement. The words Madame la Roine Mère had been lately added. The gilding was fresh. This addition showed the recent changes produced by the sudden and violent death of Henri II, which overturned many fortunes at court and began that of the Guises. The back shop opened on the river. In this room usually sat the respectable proprietor himself and Mademoiselle la Camus. In those days, the wife of a man who was not noble had no right to the title of Dame, Madame but the wives of the burghers of Paris were allowed to use that of Mademoiselle. In virtue of privileges granted and confirmed to their husbands by the several kings to whom they had done service. Between this back shop and the main shop was the well of a corkscrew staircase, which gave access to the upper story, where were the great ware room and the dwelling rooms of the old couple, and the garrets lighted by skylights, where slept the children, the servant women, the apprentices, and the clerks. This crowding of families, servants, and apprentices, the little space which each took up in the building where the apprentices all slept in one large chamber under the roof, explains the enormous population of Paris, then agglomerated on one-tenth of the surface of the present city, also the queer details of private life in the Middle Ages, also the contrivances of love, which with all due deference to historians are found only in the pages of the romance writers, without whom they would be lost to the world. At this period, very great seigneurs, such, for instance, as Admiral de Coligny, occupied three rooms, and their suites lived at some neighbouring inn. There were not in those days more than fifty private mansions in Paris, and those were filthy palaces belonging to sovereign princes or to great vassals whose way of living was superior to that of the greatest German rulers, such as the Duke of Bavaria and the Elector of Saxony. The kitchen of the Lecamus family was beneath the back shop and looked out upon the river. It had a glass door opening upon a sort of iron balcony from which the cook drew up water in a bucket and where the household washing was done. The back shop was made the dining room, office and salon of the merchant. In this important room, 
in all such houses richly panelled and adorned with some special work of art and also a carved chest the life of the merchant was passed there the joyous suppers after the work of the day was over there the secret conferences on the political interests of the burghers and of royalty took place the formidable corporations of paris were at that time able to arm a hundred thousand men therefore the opinions of the merchants were backed by their servants their clerks their apprentices their workmen the burghers had a chief in the provost of the merchants who commanded them and in the hotel de ville a palace where they possessed the right to assemble in the famous burghers parlour their solemn deliberations took place had it not been for the continual sacrifices which by that time made war intolerable to the corporations who were weary of their losses and of the famine on Louis the fourth that factionist who became king might never perhaps have entered paris everyone can now picture to himself the appearance of this corner of old paris where the bridge and quai still are where the trees of the quai aux fleurs now stand and where no trace remains of the period of which we write except the tall and famous tower of the palais de justice from which the signal was given for the saint bartholomew strange circumstance one of the houses standing at the foot of that tower then surrounded by wooden shops that namely of le camus which was about to witness the birth of facts which were destined to prepare for that night of massacre which was unhappily more favourable than fatal to calvinism at the moment when our history begins the audacity of the new religious doctrines was pulling all paris in a ferment a scotchman named stuart had just assassinated president minard the member of the parliament to whom public opinion attributed the largest share in the execution of councillor anne de bourg who was burned on the place de greve after the king's tailor to whom henri the second and diane de poitiers had caused the torture of the question to be applied in their very presence paris was so closely watched that the archers compelled all passers along the street to pray before the shrines of the madonna so as to discover heretics by their unwillingness or even refusal to do an act contrary to their beliefs the two archers who were stationed at the corner of the lecamu house had departed and christophe son of the furrier vehemently suspected of deserting catholicism was able to leave the shop without fear of being made to adore the virgin by seven in the evening in april fifteen sixty darkness was already falling and the apprentices seeing no signs of customers on either side of the arcade were beginning to take in the merchandise exposed as samples beneath the pillars in order to close the shop christophe le camus an ardent young man about twenty-two years old was standing on the sill of the shop door apparently watching the apprentices monsieur said one of them addressing christophe and pointing to a man who was walking to and fro under the gallery with an air of indecision perhaps that's a thief or a spy anyhow the shabby wretch can't be an honest man if he wanted to speak to us he would come over frankly instead of sidling along as he does and what a face continued the apprentice mimicking the man with his nose and his cloak his yellow eyes and that famished look when the stranger thus described caught sight of christophe alone on the door sill he suddenly left the opposite gallery where he was then walking crossed the street rapidly and came under the arcade in front of the lecamu house there he passed slowly along in front of the shop and before the apprentices returned to close the outer shutters he said to christophe in a low voice i am should you hearing the name of one of the most illustrious ministers and devoted actors in a terrible drama called the reformation christophe quivered as a faithful peasant might have quivered on recognizing his disguised king perhaps you would like to see some furs though it is almost dark i will show you some myself said christophe wishing to throw the apprentices whom he had heard behind him off the scent with a wave of his hand he invited the minister to enter the shop but the latter replied that he preferred to converse outside christophe then fetched his cap and followed the disciple of calvin though banished by an edict chaudieu the secret envoy of theodore de bez and calvin who were directing the french reformation from geneva went and came risking the cruel punishment to which the parliament in unison with the church and royalty had condemned one of their number the celebrated anne de bourg in order to make a terrible example chaudieu whose brother was a captain and one of admiral coligny's best soldiers was a powerful auxiliary by whose arm calvin shook france at the beginning of the twenty-two years of religious warfare now on the point of breaking out this minister was one of the hidden wheels whose movements can best exhibit the widespread action of the reform chaudieu led christophe to the water's edge through an underground passage which was like that of the marion tunnel filled up by the authorities about ten years ago 
This passage, which was situated between the Le Camus House and the one adjoining it, ran under the Rue de la Vielle Pelletierie and was called the Pont aux Foreurs. It was used by the dyers of the city to go to the river and wash their flax and silks and other stuffs. A little boat was at the entrance of it, rowed by a single sailor. In the bow was a man unknown to Christophe, a man of low stature and very simply dressed. Chaudieu and Christophe entered the boat, which in a moment was in the middle of the Seine. The sailor then directed its course beneath one of the wooden arches of the Pont au Change, where he tied up quickly to an iron ring. As yet no one had said a word. "'Here we can speak without fear. There are no traitors or spies here,' said Chaudieu, looking at two as yet unnamed men, and turning an ardent face to Christophe. "'Are you,' he said, "'full of that devotion that should animate a martyr? Are you ready to endure all for our sacred cause? Do you fear the tortures applied to the consulat de Bourg? to the king's tailor, tortures which await the majority of us. I shall confess the gospel, replied Lecamou, simply looking at the windows of his father's back shop. Family lamp standing on the table where his father was making up his books for the day spoke to him, no doubt of the joys of family and the peaceful existence which he now renounced. The vision was rapid but complete. His mind took in at a glance the burger quarter full of its own harmonies, where his happy childhood had been spent where lived his promised bride, Babette Lallier, where all things promised him a sweet and full existence. He saw the past, he saw the future, and he sacrificed it, or at any rate, he staked it all. Such were the men of that day. You need us no more, said the impetuous sailor. You know him for one of our saints. If the Scotchman had not done the deed, he would kill us that infamous Minard. Yes, said Lecamus. My life belongs to the church. I shall give it with joy for the triumph of the Reformation, on which I have seriously reflected. I know that what we do is for the happiness of the peoples. In two words, popery drives to celibacy. The Reformation establishes the family. It is time to rid France of her monks, to restore their lands to the crown, who will sooner or later sell them to the burghers. Let us learn to die for our children, and to make our families some day free and prosperous. The face of the young enthusiast, that of Chaudieu, that of the sailor, that of the stranger seated in the bow, lighted by the last gleams of the twilight, formed a picture which ought the more to be described, because the description contains in itself the whole history of the times, if it is indeed true that to certain men it is given to sum up in their own persons the spirit of their age. The religious reform undertaken by Luther in Germany, John Knox in Scotland, Calvin in France, took hold especially of those minds in the lower classes into which thought had penetrated. The great lords sustained the movement only to serve interests that were foreign to the religious cause. To these two classes were added adventurers, ruined noblemen, younger sons to whom all troubles were equally acceptable. But among the artisan and merchant classes the new faith was sincere and based on calculation. The masses of the poorer people adhered at once to a religion which gave the ecclesiastical property to the state, and deprived the dignitaries of the church of their enormous revenues. Commerce, everywhere, reckoned up the profits of this religious operation, and devoted itself, body, soul, and purse, to the cause. But among the young men of the French bourgeoisie, the Protestant movement found that noble inclination to sacrifices of all kinds which inspires youth, to which selfishness is as yet unknown. Eminent men, sagacious minds, discerned the Republic in the Reformation. They desired to establish throughout Europe the government of the United Provinces, which ended by triumphing over the greatest power of those times, Spain under Philip II, represented in the Low Countries by the Duke of Alba. John Ottoman was then meditating his famous book in which this project is put forth, a book which spread throughout France the leaven of these ideas, which was stirred up anew by the League, represented by Richelieu, then by Louis the Fourteenth, always protected by the younger branches, by the House of Orléans in 1789, as by the House of Bourbon in 1589. Rousseau says investigate, says revolt. All revolt is either the cloak that hides a prince, or the swaddling clothes of a new mastery. The House of Bourbon, the younger sons of the Valois, were at work beneath the surface of the Reformation. At the moment when the little boat floated beneath the arch of the Pont au Change, the question was strangely complicated by the ambitions of the Guises, who were rivalling the Bourbons. Thus the crown, represented by Catherine de' Medici, was able to sustain the struggle for thirty years by pitting the one house against the other house, 
whereas later the crown, instead of standing between various jealous ambitions, found itself without a barrier, face to face with the people, Richelieu and Louis the Fourteenth had broken down the barrier of nobility. Louis the Fifteenth had broken down that of the parliaments. Alone before the people, as Louis the Sixteenth was, a king must inevitably succumb. Christophe Le Camus was a fine representative of the ardent and devoted portion of the people. His one face had the sharp hectic tones which distinguish certain fair complexions. His hair was yellow, of a coppery shade. His grey-blue eyes were sparkling. In them alone was his fine soul visible, for his ill-proportioned face did not atone for its triangular shape by the noble mien of an elevated mind, and his low forehead indicated only extreme energy. Life seemed to centre in his chest, which was rather hollow. More nervous than sanguine, Christophe's bodily appearance was thin and thread-like, but wiry. His pointed nose expressed the shrewdness of the people, and his countenance revealed an intelligence capable of conducting itself well on a single point of the circumference, without having the faculty of seeing all around it. His eyes, the arching brows of which, scarcely covered with a whitish down projected like an awning, were strongly circled by a pale blue band, the skin being white and shining at the spring of the nose a sign which almost always denotes excessive enthusiasm. Christophe was of the people, the people who devote themselves, who fight for their devotions, who let themselves be inveiled and betrayed, intelligent enough to comprehend and serve an idea, too upright to turn it to his own account, too noble to sell themselves. Contrasting with this son of Lecamou, Chaudieu, the ardent minister with brown hair thinned by vigils, a yellow skin and eloquent mouth, a militant brow with flaming brown eyes and a short and prominent chin embodied well the Christian faith which brought to the Reformation so many sincere and fanatical pastors, whose courage and spirit aroused the populations. The aide de camp of Calvin and Theodore de Bez contrasted admirably with the son of the Fourier. He represented the fiery cause of which the effect was seen in Christophe. The sailor and impetuous being, tanned by the open air, accustomed to dewy nights and burning days, with closed lips, hasty gestures, orange eyes, ravenous of those of a vulture, and black frizzled hair was the embodiment of an adventurer who risks all in a venture, as a gambler stakes all on a card. His whole appearance revealed terrific passions and an audacity that flinched at nothing. His vigorous muscles were made to be quiescent as well as to act. His manner was more audacious than noble. His nose, though thin, turned up and snuffed battle. He seemed agile and capable would have known him in all ages for the leader of a party. If we were not of the Reformation, he might have been Pizarro, Fernando Cortes, or Morgan the Exterminator, a man of violent action of some kind. The fourth man, sitting on a thwart, wrapped in his cloak, belonged evidently to the highest portion of society. The fineness of his linen, its cut, the material and scent of his clothing, the style and skin of his gloves, showed him to be a man of courts, just as his bearing, his haughtiness, his composure and his all-embracing glance proved him to be a man of war. The aspect of this personage made a spectator uneasy in the first place, and then inclined him to respect. We respect a man who respects himself. Though short and deformed, his manners instantly redeemed the disadvantages of his figure. The ice once broken, he showed a lively rapidity of decision, with an indefinable dash and fire which made him seem affable and winning. He had the blue eyes and the curved nose of the House of Navarre, and the Spanish cut of the marked features which were in after days the type of the Bourbon kings. In a word, the scene now assumed a startling interest. Well, said Chaudieu, as young Lecamus ended his speech, this boatman is Le Renardi, and he is Monseigneur de Prince de Conde, he added, motioning to the deformed little man. Thus these four men represented the faith of the people, the spirit of the scriptures, the mailed hand of the soldier, and royalty itself hidden in that dark shadow of the bridge. You shall know what we expect of you, resumed the minister, after allowing a short pause of Christophe's astonishment, in order that, you may make no mistake, we feel obliged to initiate you into the most important secrets of the Reformation. The prince and their Renaudie emphasized the minister's speech by gesture, the latter having paused to allow the prince to speak, if he so wished. Like all great men engaged in plotting, whose system it is to conceal their hand until the decisive moment, the prince kept silence, but not from cowardice. In these crises he was always the soul of the conspiracy, recoiling from no danger and ready to risk his own head 
but from a sort of royal dignity he left the explanation of the enterprise to his minister and contented himself with studying the new instruments he was about to use. "'My child,' said Chaudieu, in the Huguenot style of address, "'we are about to do battle for the first time with the Roman prostitute. In a few days either our legions will be dying on the scaffold or the Guises will be dead. This is the first call to arms on behalf of our religion in France, and France will not lay down those arms till they have conquered. The question, mark you this, concerns the nation, not the kingdom. The majority of the nobles of the kingdom see plainly what the Cardinal de Lorraine and his brother are seeking. Under pretext of defending the Catholic religion, the House of Lorraine means to claim the crown of France as its patrimony. Relying on the church, it has made the church a formidable ally. The monks are its support, its acolytes, its spies. It has assumed the post of guardian to the throne it is seeking to usurp. It protects the house of Valois, which it means to destroy. We have decided to take up arms because the liberties of the people and the interests of the nobles are equally threatened. Let us smother at its birth a faction as odious as that of the Burgundians who formerly put Paris and all France to fire on sword. It required a Louis XI to put a stop to the quarrel between the Burgundians and the crown, and today a prince de Gond is needed to prevent the house of Laurent from re-attempting that struggle. This is not a civil war. It is a duel between the Guises and the Reformation. A duel to the death. We will make their heads fall, or they shall have ours. Well said, cried the prince. In this crisis, Christophe, said Larondi, we mean to neglect nothing which shall strengthen our party, for there is a party in the Reformation, the party of thwarted interests, of nobles sacrificed to the Lorrains, of old captains shamefully treated at Fontainebleau, from which the cardinal has banished them by setting up gibbets in which to hang those who ask the king for the cost of their equipment and their back pay. This, my child, resumed Chaudieu, observing a sort of terror in Christophe, this is which compels us to conquer by arms instead of conquering by conviction and by martyrdom. The Queen Mother is on the point of entering into our views. Not that she means to abjure, she has not reached that decision as yet, but she may be forced to it by a triumph. However that may be, Queen Catherine, humiliated and in despair at seeing the power she expected to wield on the death of the King, passing into the hands of the Guises, alarmed at the empire of the young Queen, Mary, niece of the Lorraine, and their auxiliary, Queen Catherine is doubtless inclined to lend her support to the princes and lords who are now about to make an attempt which would deliver her from the Guises. At this moment, devoted as she may seem to them, she hates them, she desires their overthrow, and will try to make use of us against them. But, Monseigneur, the Prince de Conde intends to make use of her against all. The Queen Mother will undoubtedly consent to all our plans. We shall have the Connetable on our side. Monseigneur has just been to see him at Chantilly, but he has not wished to move without an order from his masters. Being the uncle of Monseigneur, you will not leave him in the lurch, and this generous prince does not hesitate to fling himself into danger to force Anne de Montmorency to a decision. All is prepared, and we have cast our eyes on you as the means of communicating to Queen Catherine our treaty of alliance, the drafts of edicts, and the basis of the new government. The court is at Blois. Many of our friends are with it but they are to be our future chiefs, and like Monseigneur of importance, they would instantly be suspected and kept from communicating with Madame Catherine. God sends us, at this crisis, the shepherd David and his sling to do battle with Goliath of Guise. Your father, unfortunate for him, a good Catholic, is furrier to the two queens. He is constantly supplying them with garments. Let him to send you some errand to the court, you will excite no suspicion, and you cannot compromise Queen Catherine in any way. All our leaders would lose their heads if a single imprudent act allowed their connivance with the Queen Mother to be seen. Where a great lord, if discovered, would give the alarm and destroy our chances, an insignificant man like you would pass unnoticed. See, the Guises keep the town so full of spies that we have only the river where we can talk without fear. You will now, my son, like a sentinel who must die at his post. Remember this. If you are discovered, we shall all abandon you. We shall even cast, if necessary, opprobrium and infamy upon you. We shall say that you are a creature of the Guises, and to play this part to ruin us. 
You see, therefore, that we ask of you a total sacrifice. If you perish, said the Prince de Conde, I pledge my honour as a noble that your family shall be sacred for the house of Navarre. I will bear it on my heart and serve it in all things. Those words, my prince, suffice, replied Christophe, without reflecting that the conspirator was a Gascon. We live in times when each man, prince or burgher, must do his duty. There speaks the true Huguenot. If all our men were like that, said La Renouille, laying his hand on Christophe's shoulder, we should be conquerors tomorrow. Young man, resumed the prince, I desire to show you that of Chaudier preaches. If the nobleman goes armed, the prince fights. Therefore, in this hot game, all stakes are played. Now listen to me, said La Renaudie. I will not give you the papers until you reach Bougancy. They must not be risked during the whole of your journey. You will find me waiting for you there, on the wharf. My face, voice, and clothes will be so changed you cannot recognize me. But I shall say to you, are you a croipin? And you will answer, ready to serve. As to the performance of your mission, these are the means. You will find a horse at the Tinte Fleury, close to Saint Germain l'Auxerrois. You will there ask for Jean Le Breton, who will take you to the stable and give you one of my ponies, which is known to do thirty leagues in eight hours. Leave by the gate of Boussy. Breton has a pass for me. Use it yourself and make your way by skirting the towns. You can thus reach Orléans by daybreak. But the horse, said young Lecamon, he will not give out till you reach Orléans, replied Le Rondy. Leave him at the entrance of the Faubourg Bannier, for the gates are well guarded and you must not excite suspicion. It is for you, friend, to play your part intelligently. You must invent whatever fable seems to you best to reach the third house to the left on entering Orléans. It belongs to a certain Torillon glove-maker. Strike three blows on the door and call out on service for Monsieur de Guise. The man will appear to be a rabid Guisist. No one knows but our four selves that he is one of us. He will give you a faithful boatman, another Guisist of his own cut. Go down at once to the wharf and embark in a boat painted green and edged with white. You will doubtless land at Bougancy tomorrow about midday. There I will arrange to find you a boat which will take you to Blois without running any risk. Our enemies, the Guises, do not watch the rivers, only the landings. Thus you will be able to see the Queen Mother tomorrow or the day after. Your words are written there, said Christophe, touching his forehead. Chaudieu embraced his child with singular religious fusion. He was proud of him. God keep thee, he said, pointing to the ruddy light of the sinking sun, which was touching the old roofs, covered with shingles and sending its gleams slantwise to the forest of piles among which the water was rippling. We belong to the race of the Jacques Bonhomme, said La Renaudie, pressing Christophe's sand. We shall meet again, monsieur said the prince, with a gesture of infinite grace in which there was something that seemed almost friendship. With a stroke of his oars, La Renaudie put the boat at the lower step of the stairway which led to the house. Christophe landed, and the boat disappeared instantly beneath the arches of the Pont au Change. End of section 3Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine de' Medici, Chapter 2 The Burghers Christophe shook the iron railing which closed the stairway on the river and called. His mother heard him, opened one of the windows of the back shop, and asked what he was doing there. Christophe answered that he was cold and wanted to get in. Ah, my master, said the Burgundian maid. You went out by the street door, and you returned by the water gate. Your father will be fine and angry. Christophe, bewildered by a confidence which had just brought him into communication with the Prince de Conde, La Renaudie, and Chaudieu, and still more moved at the prospect of impending civil war, made no answer. He ran hastily up from the kitchen to the back shop, but his mother, a rabid Catholic, could not control her anger. I'll wager those three men I saw you talking with are... Hold your tongue, wife, said the cautious old man with white hair who was turning over a thick ledger. You dawdling fellows, he went on, addressing three journeymen who had long finished their suppers. Why don't you go to bed? It is eight o'clock, and you have to be up at five. Besides, you must carry home tonight. Rosalind, a deuced cap and mantle. 
or three of you had better go and take your sticks and rapiers, and then, if you meet scamps like yourselves, at least you'll be in force. Are we going to take the ermine circle? The young queen has ordered to be sent to the Hotel de Soissons. There's an express going from there to Blois for the queen mother, said one of the clerks. No, said his master. The queen mother's bill amounts to three thousand crowns. It is time to get the money, and I am going to Blois myself very soon. Father, I do not think it right at your age, and in these dangerous times, to expose yourself on the high roads. I am twenty-two years old, and you ought to employ me on such errands, said Christophe, eyeing the box which he supposed contained the surcoat. Are you glued to your seats? cried the old man to his apprentices, who at once jumped up and seized their rapiers, cloaks, and Monsieur de Tous' furs. The next day the Parliament was to receive in state as its president this illustrious judge, who, after signing a death warrant of Councillor de Bourg, was destined before the close of the year to sit in judgment on the Ponce de Conde. Here, yeah, said the old man, calling to the maid, go and ask friend Lallier if you will come and sup with us and bring the wine. We'll furnish the victuals. Tell him above all to bring his daughter. Lecamus, the syndic of the Guild of Furriers, was a handsome old man of sixty, with white hair and broad, open brow. As court furrier for the past forty years, he had witnessed all the revolutions of the reign of Francois I. He had seen the arrival at the French court of the young girl Catherine de Medici, then scarcely fifteen years of age. He had observed her giving way before the Duchesse de Tempe, her father-in-law's mistress, giving way before the Duchesse de Valentinois, the mistress of her husband, the late king. But the furrier had brought himself safely through all the chances and changes by which court merchants were often involved in the disgrace and overthrow of mistresses. His caution led to his good luck. He maintained an attitude of extreme humility. Pride had never caught him in its toils. He made himself so small, so gentle, so compliant, or so little account at court, and before the queens and princesses and favourites, that this modesty, combined with good humour, had kept the royal sign above his door. Such a policy was, of course, indicative of a shrewd and perspicacious mind. Humble as Lecamu seemed to the outer world, he was despotic in his own home. There he was an autocrat. Most respected and honoured by his brother craftsmen, he owed to his long possession of the first place in the trade much of the consideration that was shown to him. He was, besides, very willing to do kindness to others and among the many servants he had rendered, none was more striking than the assistance he had long given to the greatest surgeon of the 16th century, Bomboise Par, who owed to him the possibility of studying for his profession. In all the difficulties which came up among the merchants, Le Camus was always conciliating. Thus a general good opinion of him consolidated his position among his equals, while his borrowed characteristics kept him steadily in favour with the court. Not only this, but having intrigued for the honour of being on the vestry of his parish church, he did what was necessary to bring him into the odour of sanctity with the rector of saint pierre aux Boeuf, who looked upon him as one of the men most devoted to the Catholic religion in Paris. Consequently, at the time of the convocation of the States General, he was unanimously elected to represent the tiers etat through the influence of the clergy of Paris, an influence which, at that period, was immense. The old man was, in short, one of those secretly ambitious souls who will bend for fifty years before all the world, gliding from office to office, no one exactly knowing how it came about that he was found securely and peacefully seated at last, where no man, even the boldest, would have had the ambition at the beginning of life to fancy himself. So great was the distance, so many the gulfs and the precipices to cross. Le Camus, who had immense concealed wealth, would not run any risks and was silently preparing a brilliant future for his son. Instead of having the personal ambition which sacrifices the future to the present, he had family ambition, the lost sentiment in our time. A sentiment suppressed by the folly of our laws of inheritance. Lacamu saw himself first president of the Parliament of Paris in the person of his grandson. Christophe, godson of the famous historian de Doux, was given a most solid education, but it led him to doubt into the spirit of examination which was then affecting both the faculties and the students of the universities. Christophe was, at the period of which we are now writing, pursuing his studies for the bar, that first step towards magistracy. 
the old furrier was pretending to some hesitation as to his son. Sometimes he seemed to wish to make Christophe his successor. Then again he spoke of him as a lawyer. But in his heart he was ambitious of a place for this son as councillor of the parliament. He wanted to put the Lecamou family on a level with those old and celebrated burgher families from which came the Pasquier, the Molle, the Meron, the Seguier, la Mouinon, du Tillet, le Coineux, l'Escalopier, Gois, Arnaud, those famous sheriffs and grand provosts of the merchants among whom the throne found such strong defenders. Therefore, in order that Christophe might in due course of time maintain his rank, he wished to marry him to the daughter of the richest jeweller in the city, his friend Lallier, whose nephew was destined to present to Henri the Fourth the keys of Paris. The strongest desire rooted in the heart of the worthy burgher was to use half of his fortune and half of that of the jeweller in the purchase of a large and beautiful seigneurial estate, which in those days was a long and very difficult affair. But his shrewd mind knew the age in which he lived too well to be ignorant of the great movements which were now in preparation. He saw clearly, and he saw justly, and knew that the kingdom was about to be divided into two camps. The useless executions in the Place de l'Estrapade, that of the king's tailor, and the more recent one of the councillor and the Borg, the actual connivance of the great lords, and that of the favourite of Francois I with the reformers, were terrible indications. The furrier resolved to remain, whatever happened, Catholic, royalist, and parliamentarian. But it suited him privately that Christophe should belong to the Reformation. He knew he was rich enough to ransom his son Christophe, too much compromised. And on the other hand, if France became Calvinist, his son could save the family in the event of one of those furious Parisian riots, the memory of which was ever living with the bourgeoisie. Riots they were destined to see renewed through four reigns. But these thoughts, the old furrier, like Louis XI, did not even say to himself, his wariness went so far as to deceive his wife and son. This grave personage had long been the chief man of the richest and most populous quarter of Paris, that of the centre, under the title of Cotenier, the title and office which became so celebrated some fifteen months later. Clothed in cloth like all the prudent burghers who obeyed the sumptuary laws, Sieur Le Camus, he was tenacious of that title, which Charles V granted to the burghers of Paris, permitting them also to buy baronial estates and call their wives by the fine name of Demoiselle, but not by that of Madame, wore neither gold chains nor silk, but always a good doublet with large tarnished silver buttons, cloth gaiters mounting to the knee, and leather shoes with clasps. His shirt of fine linen showed, according to the fashion of the time, in great puffs between his half-open jacket and his breeches. Though his large and handsome face received the full light of the lamp standing on the table, Christophe had no conception of the thoughts which lay buried beneath the rich and florid Dutch skin of the old man. But he understood well enough the advantage he himself had expected to obtain from his affection for pretty Babette Lallier. So Christophe, with the air of a man who had come to a decision, smiled bitterly as he heard of the invitation to his promised bride. When the Burgundian cook and the apprentices had departed on their several errands, old Le Camus looked at his wife with a glance which showed the firmness and resolution of his character. You will not be satisfied till you have got that boy hanged with your damned tongue, he said in a stern voice. I would rather see him hanged and saved than living in a Huguenot, she answered gloomily. To think that a child whom I carried nine months in my womb should be a bad Catholic and be doomed to hell for all eternity. She began to weep. Old silly, said the furrier. Let him live, if only to convert him. You said before the apprentices a word which may set fire to our house and roast us all like fleas in a straw bed. The mother crossed herself and sat down silently. Now then, you, said the old man with a judicial glance at his son, explain to me what you are doing on the river with come closer that i may speak to you he added grasping his son by the arm and drawing him to him the prince de conde he whispered christophe trembled do you suppose the court furrier does not know every face that frequents the palace think you i am ignorant of what is going on monseigneur the grand master has been giving orders to send troops to amboise withdrawing troops from paris to send them to amboise when the king is at blois and making them march through chartres and vendome Instead of going by Orléans, isn't the meaning of that clear enough? There'd be troubles. 
If the queens want their surcoats, they must send for them. The Prince de Conde has perhaps made up his mind to kill Monsieur de Guise, who, on their side, expect to rid themselves of him. The prince will use the Huguenots to protect himself. Why should the son of a furrier get himself into that fray? When you are married, and when you are counsellor to the parliament, you will be as prudent as your father. Before belonging to the new religion, the son of a furrier ought to wait until the rest of the world belongs to it. I don't condemn the reformers. It is not my business to do so. But the court is Catholic. The two queens are Catholic. The parliament is Catholic. We must supply them with furs, and therefore we must be Catholic ourselves. You shall not go out from here, Christophe. If you do, I will send you to your godfather, President de Thou. He will, he will keep you night and day blackening paper, instead of blackening your soul in company with those damned Genevese. Father, said Christophe, leaning upon the back of the old man's chair, send me to Blois to carry that circuit to Queen Mary, and get our money from the Queen Mother. If you do not, I am lost, and you care for your son. Lost? repeated the old man without showing the least surprise. If you stay here, you can't be lost. I shall have my eye on you all the time. They will kill me here. Why? The most important among the Huguenots have cast their eyes on me to serve them in a certain matter. If I fail to do what I have just promised to do, they will kill me in open day, here in the street, as they killed me now. But if you send me to court on your affairs, perhaps I can justify myself equally well to both sides. Either I shall succeed without having run any danger at all, I shall then win a fine position in the party, or, if the danger turns out very great, I shall be there simply on your business. The father rose as if his chair was of red-hot iron. Wife, he said, leave us and watch that we are left quite alone, Christophe and I. When Mademoiselle Lecamus had left them, the furrier took his son by a button and led him to the corner of the room which made the angle of the bridge. Christophe, he said, whispering in his ear, as he had done when he mentioned the name of the Prince of Conde. Be a Huguenot, if you have that vice, but be so cautiously in the depths of your soul, and not in a way to be pointed at as a heretic throughout the quarter. What you have just confessed to me shows that the leaders have confidence in you. What are you going to do for them at court? I cannot tell you, replied Christophe, for I do not know myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. muttered the old man, looking at his son. The scamp means to hoodwink his father. He'll go far. You are not going to court, he went on in a low tone, to carry remittances to Monsieur de Guise, or to the little king or master, or to the little Queen Marie. All those arts are Catholic, but I would take my oath the Italian woman as some spite against the Scotch girl and against the Lorrain. I know her. She has a desperate desire to put her hand into the door. The late king was so afraid of her that he did as the jewellers do. He cut diamond by diamond. He pitted one woman against another. That caused Queen Catherine's hatred to the poor Duchess de Valentinois, from whom she took the beautiful chateau of Chenonceau. If it hadn't been for the connetable, the Duchess might have been strangled. Back, back, my son, don't put yourself in the hands of that Italian, who has no passion except in her brain, and that's a bad kind of woman. Yes, what they are sending you to do at court may give you a bad headache, cried the father, seeing that Christophe was about to reply. My son, I have plans for your future, which you will not upset by making yourself useful to Queen Catherine, but heavens and earth don't risk your head. Messieurs de Guise would cut it off as easily as they began the cuts of turnip, and then those persons who are now employing you will disown you utterly. I know that, father, said Christophe. What? Are you really so strong, my son? You know it? Then are willing to risk all? Yes, father. By the powers above us, cried the father, pressing his son in his arms. We can understand each other. You are worthy of your father. My child, you will be the honour of the family. And I see that your old father can speak plainly with you, but do not be more Huguenot than Monsieur de Coligny. Never draw your sword. Be a penman. Keep to your future role of lawyer. Now then, tell me nothing until after you have succeeded. If I do not hear from you by the fourth day after you reach Blar, that silence will tell me that you are in some danger. The old man will go to save the young one. I have not sold furs for thirty-two years without a good knowledge of the wrong side of court robes. I have the means of making my way through many doors. 
Christophe opened his eyes very wide as he heard his father talking thus, but he thought there might be some parental trap in it, and he made no reply further than to say, Well, make out the bill and write a letter to the Queen. I must start at once, or the greatest misfortunes may happen. Start? How? I shall buy a horse. Write at once, in God's name. Hey, mother, give your son some money, cried the furrier to his wife. The mother returned and went to her chest, took out a purse of gold and gave it to Christophe, who kissed her with emotion. The bill was all ready, said his father. Here it is. I will write the letter at once. Christophe took the bill and put it in his pocket. But you will sup with us at any rate, said the old man. In such a crisis you ought to exchange wings with Lallier's daughter. Very well, I will go and fetch her, said Christophe. The young man was distrustful of his father's stability in the matter. The old man's character was not yet fully known to him. He ran up to his room, dressed himself, took a valise, came downstairs softly, and laid it on a counter in the shop, together with his rapier and cloak. "'What the devil are you doing?' asked his father, hearing him. Christophe came up to the old man and kissed him on both cheeks. "'I don't want anyone to see my preparations for departure, and I put them on a counter in the shop,' he whispered. "'Here's the letter,' said his father. Christophe took the paper and went out, as if to fetch his young neighbour. A few moments after his departure, the goodman Lallier and his daughter arrived, preceded by a servant woman bearing three bottles of old wine. Well, where is Christophe? said old Lecamus. Christophe! exclaimed Babette. We have not seen him. Ah, ah, my son is a bold scamp. He tricks me as if I had no beard. My dear crony, what think you he will turn out to be? We live in days when the children have more sense than their fathers. Why, the quarter has long been saying he is in some mischief, said Lallier. Excuse him on that point, Crony, said the furrier. Youth is foolish. It runs after new things. But Babette will keep him quiet. She is newer than Calvin. Babette smiled. She loved Christophe and was angry when anything was said against him. She was one of those daughters of the old bourgeoisie, brought up under the eyes of a mother who never left her. Her bearing was gentle and correct as her face. She always wore woolen stuffs of grey, harmonious in tone. Her chemisette, simply pleated, contrasted its whiteness against the gown. Her cap of brown velvet was like an infant's coif, but it was trimmed with a ruche and lapets of tanned gauze, that is, of a tan colour, which came down on each side of her face. Though fair and white as a true blonde, she seemed to be shrewd and roguish. All the while, trying to hide her roguishness under the air and manner of a well-trained girl. While the two servant women went and came, laying the cloth and placing the jugs, the great pewter dishes and the knives and forks, the jeweller and his daughter, the furrier and his wife, sat before the tall chimney-piece draped with lambricans of red serge and black fringes, and were talking of trifles. Babette asked once or twice where Christophe could be, and the father and mother of the young Huguenot gave evasive answers. But when the two families were seated at table, and the two servants had retired to the kitchen, Lecamus said to his future daughter-in-law, Christophe has gone to court. To Blois? Such a journey as that, without bidding me good-bye? She said. The matter was pressing, said the old mother. Crony, said the furrier, resuming a suspended conversation. We are going to have troublous times in France. The reformers are bestirring themselves. If they triumph, it will only be after a long war, during which business will be at a standstill, said Lallier, incapable of rising higher than the commercial sphere. My father, who saw the wars between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, told me that our family would never have come out safely if one of his grandfathers, his mother's father, had not been a guar, one of those famous butchers in the market who stood by the Burgundians, whereas the other, the Lecamus, was for the Armagnacs. They seemed ready to flay each other alive before the world, but they were excellent friends in the family. So let us both try to save Christophe. Perhaps the time may come when he will save us. You are a shrewd one, said the jeweller. No, replied Lecamus. The burghers ought to think of themselves. The populace and the nobility are both against them. The Parisian bourgeoisie alarms everybody except the king, who knows it is his friend. You who are so wise and have seen so many things, said Babette timidly. Explain to me what the reformers really want. Yes, tell us that, Corny, cried the jeweller. I knew the late king's tailor, and I held him to be a man of simple life, without great talent. He was something like you, a man to whom they'd give the sacrament without confession, 
and behold, he plunged to the depths of this new religion. He, a man whose two years were worth all of a hundred thousand crowns apiece. He must have had secrets to reveal to induce the king and the duchess of de Valentinois to be present at his torture. And terrible secrets, too, said the furrier. The Reformation, my friends, he continued in a low voice, will give back to the bourgeoisie the estates of the church. When the ecclesiastical privileges are suspended, pressed the reformers intend to ask that the villain shall be imposed on nobles as well as on burghers and they mean to insist that the king alone shall be above others if indeed they allow the state to have a king suppress the throne ejaculated lalier eh crony said lecamus in the low countries the burghers govern themselves with burgomasters of their own who elect their own temporary head God bless me, Crony, we ought to do these fine things, and yet stay Catholics, cried the jeweller. We are too old, you and I, to see the triumph of the poesy and bourgeoisie, but it will triumph, I tell you, in times to come, as it did of yore. Ah, the king must rest upon it in order to resist, and we have always sold him our help dear. The last time all the burghers were ennobled, and he gave them permission to buy seigneurial estates and take titles from the land without special letters from the king. You and I, grandsons of the Gua, through our mothers, are not we as good as any lord? These words were so alarming to the jeweller and the two women that they were followed by a dead silence. The ferments of 1789 were already tingling in the veins of Lecamus, who was not yet so old, but what he could live to see the bold burghers of the League. Are you selling well in spite of these troubles? said Lallier to Mademoiselle Lecamus. Troubles always do harm, she replied. That's one reason why I'm so set on making my son a lawyer said lecom for squabbles and law go on for ever the conversation then turned to commonplace topics to the great satisfaction of the jeweller who was not fond of either political troubles or audacity of thought End of chapter two section four section five of catherine de medici by honor des balzac translated by Catherine Prescott Warman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: The Chateau de Blois. The banks of the Loire, from Blois to Angers, were the favourite resort of the last two branches of the royal race which occupied the throne before the House of Bourbon. That beautiful valley plain so well deserves the honour bestowed upon it by kings that we must here repeat what was said of it by one of our most eloquent writers. There is one province in France which is never sufficiently admired, fragrant as Italy, flowery as the banks of the Guadalquivir, beautiful especially in its own characteristics, wholly French, having always been French, unlike in that respect to our northern provinces which have degenerated by contact with Germany, and to our southern provinces which have lived in concubinage with Moors, Spaniards, and all other nationalities that adjoined them. This pure, chaste, brave, and loyal province is Touraine. Historic France is there. Auvergne is Auvergne. Languedoc is only Languedoc. But Touraine is France. The most national river for Frenchmen is the Loire, which waters Touraine. For this reason, we ought not to be surprised at the great number of historically noble buildings possessed by those departments which have taken the name, or derivations of the name, of the Loire. At every step we take in this land of enchantment, we discover a new picture, bordered, it may be, by a river, or a tranquil lake reflecting in its liquid depths a castle with towers and woods and sparkling waterfalls. It is quite natural that in a region chosen by royalty for its sojourn where the court was long established, great families and fortunes and distinguished men should have settled and built palaces as grand as themselves. But it is not incomprehensible that royalty did not follow the advice indirectly given by Louis XI to place the capital of the kingdom at Tours. There, without great expense, the Loire might have been made accessible for the merchant service and also for vessels of war of light draught. There, too, the seat of government would have been safe from the dangers of invasion. Had this been done, the northern cities would not have required such vast sums of money spent to fortify them, sums as vast as were those expended on the sumptuous glories of Versailles. 
If Louis the Fourteenth had listened to Vauban, who wished to build his great palace at Mont Louis between the Loire and the Cher, perhaps the revolution of seventeen eighty nine might never have taken place. These beautiful shores still bear the marks of royal tenderness. The chateaux of Chambord, Amboise, Blois, Chenonceau, Chaumont, de Six les Tours, all those which the mistresses of kings, financiers, and nobles built at Verrets, Essay, Le Redou, Ousset, Villandry, Valence, Chanteloup, de la Tal, some of which have disappeared, though most of them still remain, are admirable relics, which remind us of the marvels of a period that is little understood by the literary sect of the Middle Ages. Among all these chateaux, that of Blois, where the court was then staying, is one on which the magnificence of the houses of Orléans and of Valois has placed its brilliant sign manual, making it the most interesting of all for historians, archaeologists, and Catholics. It was at the time of which we write completely isolated. The town, enclosed by massive walls supported by towers, lay below the fortress. The chateau served, in fact, as fort and pleasure house. Above the town, with its blue-tiled, crowded roofs, extending then, as now, from the river to the crest of the hill, which commands the right bank, lies a triangular plateau, bounded to the west by a streamlet, which in these days is of no importance, for it flows beneath the town. But in the 15th century, so say historians, it formed quite a deep ravine, of which there still remains a sunken road, almost an abyss between the suburbs of the town and the chateau. It was on this plateau, with a double exposure to the north and south, that the Counts of Blois built, in the architecture of the 12th century, a castle where the famous Thibault de Tierchure, Thibault le Vieux, and others held a celebrated court. In those days of pure feudality, in which the king was merely primus inter pares, to use the fine expression of a king of Poland, the Counts of Champagne, the Counts of Blois, those of Anjou, the simple barons of Normandy, the dukes of Bretagne, lived with the splendour of sovereign princes and gave kings to the proudest kingdoms. The Plantagenets of Anjou, the Lucinans of Poitou, the Roberts of Normandie, maintained with a bold hand the royal races, and sometimes simple knights like Du Glaguin refused the purple, preferring the sword of Gonetable. When the crown annexed the county of Blois to its domain, Louis XII, who had a liking for this residence, perhaps to escape Plessis of sinister memory, built at the back of the first building another building, facing east and west, which connected the chateau of the Counts of Blois with the rest of the old structures, of which nothing now remains but the vast hall in which the States General were held under Henri III. Before he became enamoured of Chambord, Francois I wished to complete the chateau of Blois by adding two other wings which would have made the structure a perfect square. Chambord weaned him from Blois, but he built only one wing, which in his time and that of his grandchildren was the only inhabited part of the chateau. This third building, erected by Francois I, is more vast and far more decorated than the Louvre, the chateau of Henri II. It is in the style of architecture now called Renaissance, and presents the most fantastic features of that style. Therefore, at a period when a strict and jealous architecture ruled construction, when the Middle Ages were not even considered, at a time when literature was not as clearly welded to art as it is now, La Fontaine said of the Chateau de Blois in his hearty, good-humoured way, The part that Francois I built, if looked at from the outside, pleased me better than all the rest. There I saw numbers of little galleries, little windows, little balconies, little ornamentations, without order or regularity, and they make up a grand hall, which I like. The Chateau of Blois had therefore the merit of representing three orders of architecture, three epochs, three systems, three dominions. Perhaps there is no other royal residence that can compare with it in that respect. This immense structure presents to the eye in one enclosure round one courtyard a complete and perfect image of that grand presentation of the manners and customs and life of nations which is called architecture. At the moment when Christophe was to visit the court, that part of the adjacent land which in our day is covered by a fourth palace built seventy years later by Gaston, the rebellious brother of Louis the Thirteenth, then exiled to Blois, was an open space containing pleasure grounds and hanging gardens picturesquely placed among the battlements and unfinished turrets of Francois I's chateau. These gardens, 
communicated by a bridge of a fine, bold construction, which the old men of Blois may still remember to have seen demolished, with a pleasure ground on the other side of the chateau, which, by the lay of the land, was on the same level. The nobles attached to the court of Anne de Bretagne or those of that province who came to solicit favours or to confer with the queen as to the fate and condition of Brittany, awaited in this pleasure ground the opportunity for an audience, either at the queen's rising or at her coming out to walk. Consequently, history has given the name of Peshoir or Breton to this piece of ground, which in our day is the fruit garden of a wealthy bourgeois and forms a projection into the Place des Jesuites. The latter place was included in the gardens of this beautiful royal residence, which had, as we have said, its upper and its lower gardens. Not far from the Place des Jesuites may still be seen a pavilion built by Catherine de' Medici, where, according to the historians of Blois, warm mineral baths were placed for her to use. This detail enables us to trace the very irregular disposition of the gardens, which went up and down according to the undulations of the ground, becoming extremely intricate around the chateau a fact which helped to give it strength and caused, as we shall see, the discomfiture of the Duc de Guise. The gardens were reached from the chateau through external and internal galleries, the most important of which was called the Gallery de Cerf, on account of its decoration. This gallery led to the magnificent staircase which no doubt inspired the famous double staircase of Chambord. It led from floor to floor to all the apartments of the castle. Though La Fontaine preferred the Chateau of Francois I to that of Louis XII, perhaps the naivete of that of the good king will give true artists more pleasure, while at the same time they admire the magnificent structure of the knightly king. The elegance of the two staircases, which are placed at each end of the Chateau of Louis XII, the delicate carving and sculpture, so original in design, which abound everywhere, the remains of which, though time has done its worst, still charm the antiquary all, even to the semi-cloistral distribution of the apartments, reveals a great simplicity of manners. Evidently, the court did not yet exist. It had not developed, as it did under Francois I and Catherine de' Medici, to the great detriment of feudal customs. As we admire the galleries, or most of them, the capitals of the columns and certain figurines of exquisite delicacy, it is impossible not to imagine that Michel Gollum, that great sculpture, the Michelangelo of Brittany, passed that way for the pleasure of Queen Anne, whom he afterwards immortalised in the tomb of her father, the last Duke of Brittany. Whatever La Fontaine may choose to say about the little galleries and the little ornamentations, nothing can be more grandiose than the dwelling of the splendid Francois. Thanks to I know not what indifference, to forgetfulness perhaps, the apartments occupied by Catherine de' Medici and her son Francois II present to us today the leading features of that time. The historian can there restore the tragic scenes of the drama of the Reformation, a drama in which the dual struggle of the Guises and the Bourbons against the Valois was a series of most complicated acts, the plot of which was here unravelled. The Chateau of Francois I completely crushes the artless habitation of Louis XII by its imposing masses. On the side of the gardens, that is, toward the modern Place des Jesuites, the castle presents an elevation nearly double that which it shows on the side of the courtyard. The ground floor on this side forms the second floor on the side of the gardens, where are placed the celebrated galleries. Thus the first floor above the ground floor toward the courtyard, where Queen Catherine was lodged, is the third floor on the garden side, and the king's apartments were four stories above the garden, which at the time of which we write was separated from the base of the castle by a deep moat. The chateau, already colossal as viewed from the courtyard, appears gigantic when seen from below, as La Fontaine saw it. He mentions particularly that he did not enter either the courtyard or the apartments, and it is to be remarked that from the Place des Jesuites all the details seem small. The balconies on which the courtiers promenaded, the galleries marvellously executed, the sculptured windows whose embrasures are so deep as to form boudoirs, for which indeed they served, resemble at that great height of the fantastic decorations which scene painters give to a fairy palace at the opera. But in the courtyard, although the three stories above the ground floor rise as high as the clock tower of the Tuileries, the infinite delicacy of the architecture reveals itself to the rapture of our astonished eyes. This wing of the great building, in which the two queens, Catherine de' Medici and Mary Stuart, 
hurled their sumptuous court, is divided in the centre by a hexagon tower, in the empty well of which winds up a spiral staircase, a Moorish caprice designed by giants, made by dwarfs, which gives to this wonderful facade the effect of a dream. The baluster of this staircase forms a spiral connecting itself by a square landing to five of the six sides of the tower, requiring at each landing transversal corbels which are decorated with arabesque carvings without and within. This bewildering creation of ingenious and delicate details, of marvels which give speech to stones, can be compared only to the deeply worked and crowded carving of the Chinese ivories. Stone is made to look like lace work. The flowers, the figures of men and animals clinging to the structure of the stairway are multiplied step by step until they crown the tower with a keystone on which the chisels of the art of the 16th century have contended against the naive cutters of images who 50 years earlier had carved the keystones of Louis XII's two stairways. However dazzled we may be by these recurring forms of indefatigable labour, we cannot fail to see that money was lacking to Francois I, for Blois as it was to Louis XIV of Versailles. More than one figurine lifts its delicate head from a block of rough stone behind it. More than one fantastic flower is merely indicated by chiselled touchings on the abandoned stone, though dampness has since laid its blossoms of mouldy greenery upon it. On a facade side by side with the tracery of one window, another window presents its masses of jagged stone carved only by the hand of time. Here, to the least artistic and the least trained eye, is a ravishing contrast between this frontage where marvels throng and the interior frontage of the Chateau of Louis XII, which is composed of a ground floor of arcades of fairy lightness supported by tiny columns resting at their base on a graceful platform, and of two stories above it the windows of which are carved with delightful sobriety. Beneath the arcade is a gallery, the walls of which are painted in fresco. The ceiling also being painted, traces can still be found of this magnificence, derived from Italy and testifying to the expeditions of our kings, to which the Principality of Milan then belonged. Opposite to Francois I's wing was the chapel of the Counts of Blois, the façade of which is almost in harmony with the architecture of the later dwelling of Louis XII. No words can picture the majestic solidity of these three distinct masses of building. In spite of their non-conformity of style, royalty, powerful and firm, demonstrating its dangers by the greatness of its precautions, was a bond, uniting these three edifices, so different in character, two of which rested against the vast hall of the States General, towering high like a church. Certainly neither the simplicity nor the strength of the burgher existence, which were depicted at the beginning of this history, in which art was always represented, were lacking to this royal habitation. Blois was the fruitful and brilliant example to which the bourgeoisie and feudality, wealth and nobility, gave such splendid replies in the towns and in the rural regions. Imagination could not desire any other sort of dwelling for the prince who reigned over France in the 16th century. The richness of seigneurial garments, the luxury of female adornment, must have harmonized delightfully with the lace work of these stones, so wonderfully manipulated. From floor to floor, as the King of France went up the marvellous staircase of his Chateau of Bois, he could see the broad expanse of the beautiful Loire, which brought him news of all his kingdom as it lay on either side of the great river, two halves of a state facing each other and semi-rivals. If, instead of building Chambord in a barren, gloomy plain two leagues away, Francois I had placed it where, seventy years later, Gaston built his palace, Versailles would never have existed, and Blois would have become, necessarily, the capital of France. Four Valois and Catherine de' Medici lavished their wealth on the wing built by Francois I at Blois. Who can look at those massive partition walls, the spinal column of the castle in which are sunken deep alcoves, secret staircases, cabinets, while they themselves enclose halls as vast as that great council room, the guardroom, and the royal chambers in which, in our day, a regiment of infantry is comfortably lodged? Who can look at all this and not be aware of the prodigalities of crown and court? Even if a visitor does not at once understand how the splendour within must have corresponded with the splendour without, the remaining vestiges of Catherine de Medici's cabinet, where Christophe was about to be introduced, would bear sufficient testimony to the elegancies of art, which P. 
peopled those apartments with animated designs in which salamanders sparkled among the wreaths and the palette of the sixteenth century illumined the darkest corners with its brilliant colouring in this cabinet an observer will still find traces of that taste for gilding which catherine brought with her from italy for the princesses of her house loved in the words of the author already quoted to veneer the castles of france with the gold earned by their ancestors in commerce and to hang out their wealth on the walls of their apartments the queen mother occupied on the first upper floor of the apartments of queen claude of france wife of francois the first which may still be seen delicately carved the double c accompanied by figures purely white swans and lilies signifying candidior candidis more white than the whitest the motto of the queen whose name began like that of catherine with a c and which applied as well to the daughter of louis the twelfth as to the mother of the last valois for no suspicion in spite of the violence of calvinist calumny has tarnished the fidelity of catherine de medici to henri the second the queen mother still charged with the care of two young children him who was afterward duke d'alencon and marguerite the wife of henri the fourth the sister whom charles the ninth called margot had need of the whole of the first upper floor the king francois the second and the queen mary stuart occupied on the second floor the royal apartments which had formerly been those of francois the first and were subsequently those of henri the third this floor like that taken by the queen mother is divided in two parts throughout its whole length by the famous partition wall which is more than four feet thick against which rests the enormous walls which separate the rooms from each other thus on both floors the apartments are in two distinct halves one half to the south looking to the courtyard serve for public receptions and for the transaction of business whereas the private apartments were placed partly to escape the heat to the north overlooking the gardens on which side is the splendid facade with its balconies and galleries looking out upon the open country of the vendomois and down upon the pochoir des bretons and the moat the only side of which la fontaine speaks chateau francois the first was in those days terminated by an enormous unfinished tower which was intended to mark the colossal angle of the building when the succeeding wing was built later gaston took down one side of it in order to build his palace on to it but he never finished the work and the tower remained in ruins his royal stronghold served as a prison or dungeon according to popular tradition as we wander today to the halls of this matchless chateau so precious to art and to history what poet would not be haunted by regrets and grieved for france at seeing the arabesques of catherine's boudoir whitewashed and almost obliterated by order of the quartermaster of the barracks this royal residence is now a barrack at the time of an outbreak of cholera the panels of catherine's boudoir a room of which we are about to speak is the last remaining relic of the rich decorations accumulated by five artistic kings making our way through the labyrinth of chambers halls stairways towers we may say to ourselves with solemn certitude here mary stuart cajoled her husband on behalf of the guises there the guises insulted catherine later at the very spot the second balafre fell beneath the daggers of the avengers of the crown a century earlier from this very window louis the twelfth made signs to his friend cardinal d'amboire to come to him here on this balcony d'epernon the accomplice of ravelac met marie de medici who knew it was said of the proposed regicide and allowed it to be committed in the chapel where the marriage of Henri the Fourth and Marguerite de Valois took place, the sole remaining fragment of the chateau of the Counts of Blois, a regiment now makes its shoes. This wonderful structure, in which so many styles may still be seen, so many great deeds have been performed, is in a state of dilapidation which disgraces France. What grief for those who love the great historic monuments of our country to know that soon those eloquent stones will be lost to sight and knowledge like others at the corner of the rue de la vielle pelleterie possibly they will exist nowhere in these pages it is necessary to remark that in order to watch the royal court more closely the guises although they had a house of their own in the town which still exists had obtained permission to occupy the upper floor above the apartments of louis the twelfth the same lodgings afterwards occupied by the duchess de nemours under the roof the young king francois the second 
and his bride, Mary Stuart, in love with each other like the girl and boy of sixteen which they were, had been abruptly transferred in the depth of winter from the chateau de Saint-Germain, which the Duc de Guise thought liable to attack to the fortress which the chateau of Blois then was, being isolated and protected on three sides by precipices, and admirably defended as to its entrance. The Guises, uncles of Mary Stuart, had powerful reasons for not residing in Paris, and for keeping the king and court in a castle, the whole exterior surroundings of which could easily be watched and defended. A struggle was now beginning around the throne, between the house of Loire and the house of Valois, which was destined to end in this very chateau, twenty-eight years later, namely in 1588, when Henri III, under the very eyes of his mother, at that moment deeply humiliated by the Dorians, heard the fall upon the floor of his own cabinet, the head of the boldest of all the Guises, second Balafre, son of that first Balafre, by whom Catherine de' Medici was now being tricked, watched, threatened, and virtually imprisoned. End of section 5《セクション6》of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This noble chateau of Blois was to Catherine de Medici the narrowest of prisons. On the death of her husband, who had always held her in subjection, she expected to reign, but on the contrary, she found herself crushed under the thraldom of strangers, whose polished manners were really far more brutal than those of jailers. No action of hers could be done secretly. The women who attended her either had lovers among the Guises, or were watched by Argus eyes. These were times when passions notably exhibited the strange effects produced in all ages by the strong antagonism of two powerful conflicting interests in the state. Gallantry, which served Catherine so well, was also an auxiliary for the Guises. The Prince de Conde, the first leader of the Reformation, was a lover of the Marshal de Saint-André, whose husband was the tool of the Grand Master. The cardinal, convinced by the affair of the Vidame de Chartres that Catherine was more unconquered than invulnerable as to love, was paying court to her. The play of all these passions strangely complicated those of politics, making, as it were, a double game of chess in which both parties had to watch the head and heart of their opponent in order to know, when a crisis came, whether the one would betray the other. Though she was constantly in presence of the Cardinal de Lorraine or of Duke François de Guise, who had both distrusted her, the closest and ablest enemy of Catherine de Medici was her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, a fair little creature, malicious as a waiting maid, proud as a steward wearing three crowns, learned as an old pedant, giddy as a schoolgirl, as much in love with her husband as a courtesan is with her lover, devoted to her uncles whom she admired and delighted to see the king share at her instigation the regard she had for them. A mother-in-law is always a person whom the daughter-in-law is inclined not to like, especially when she wears the crown and wishes to retain it, which Catherine had imprudently made but too well known. Her former position, when Diane de Poitiers had ruled Henri II, was more tolerable than this, then at least she received the external honours that were due to a queen, and the homage of the court. But now the duke and the cardinal, who had none by their own minions about them, seemed to take pleasure in abasing her. Catherine, hemmed in on all sides by their courtiers, received not only day by day, but from hour to hour, terrible blows to her pride and her self-love the Guises were determined to treat her on the same system of repression which the late king, her husband, had so long pursued. The thirty-six years of anguish which were now about to desolate France may perhaps be said to have begun by the scene in which the son of the furrier of the two queens was sent on the perilous errand which makes him the chief figure of our present study. The danger into which this zealous reformer was about to fall became imminent the very morning on which he started from the port of Bourgancy for the Chateau de Blois, bearing precious documents which compromised the highest heads of the nobility placed in his hands by that wily partisan the indefatigable le Renaudi, who met him as agreed upon at bourgancy having reached that port before him while the tow-boat in which christophe now embarked floated impelled by a light east wind down the river loire the famous cardinal de lorraine and his brother the second duc de guise one of the greatest warriors of those days were contemplating, like eagles perched on a rocky summit, their present situation, and looking prudently about them before striking the great blow by which they intended to kill the reform in France 
at Amboise. An attempt renewed twelve years later in Paris, August the 24th, 1572, on the feast of Saint Bartholomew. During the night, three seigneurs, who each played a great part in the twelve years' drama which followed this double plot now laid by the Guises and also by the reformers, had arrived at Blois from different directions each riding at full speed and leaving their horses half dead at the postern gate of the chateau, which was guarded by captains and soldiers absolutely devoted to the Duc de Guise, the idol of all warriors. One word about that great man, a word that must tell in the first instance whence his fortunes took their rise. His mother was Antoinette de Bourbon, great aunt of Henri IV. Of what avail is consanguinity? He was at this moment aiming at the head of his cousin, the Prince de Conde, his niece was Mary Stuart. His wife was Anne, a daughter of the Duke of Ferrara. The Grand Contable de Montmorency called the Duc de Guise Monseigneur as he would the king, ending his letter with your very humble servant. Guise, Grand Master of the King's household, replied Monsieur le Connetable, and signed as he did for the Parliament, your very good friend. As for the cardinal, called the Transalpine Pope and His Holiness by Estienne, he had the whole monastic church of France on his side and treated the Holy Father as an equal. Vain of his eloquence and one of the greatest theologians of his time, he kept incessant watch over France and Italy by means of three religious orders who were absolutely devoted to him, toiling day and night in his service and serving him as spies and counsellors. These few words will explain to what heights of power the Duke and the Cardinal had attained. In spite of their wealth and the enormous revenues of their several offices, they were so personally disinterested, so eagerly carried away on the current of their statesmanship, and so generous at heart, that they were always in debt, doubtless after the manner of Caesar. When Henri III caused the death of the second Balafre, whose life was a menace to him, the house of Guise was necessarily ruined. The costs of endeavouring to seize the crown during a whole century will explain the lowered position of this great house during the reigns of Louis the Thirteenth and Louis the Fourteenth, when the sudden death of Madame told all Europe the infamous part which the Chevalier de Lorraine had debased himself to play. Calling themselves the heirs of the dispossessed, Carolovingians, the Duke and Cardinal acted with the utmost insolence towards Catherine de' Medici, the mother-in-law of their niece. The Duchess de Guise spared her no mortification. This Duchess was a d'Este, and Catherine was a Medici, the daughter of upstart Florentine merchants, whom the sovereigns of Europe had never yet admitted into their royal fraternity. Francois I himself has always considered his son's marriage with the Medici as a mesalliance, and only consented to it under the expectation that his second son would never be Dauphin. Hence his fury when his eldest son was poisoned by the Florentine Montecuculi. Destes refused to recognize the Medici as Italian princes. Those former merchants were in fact trying to solve the impossible problem of maintaining a throne in the midst of republican institutions. The title of Grand Duke was only granted very tardily by Philip II, King of Spain, to reward those Medici who bought it by betraying France their benefactress and severely attaching themselves to the court of Spain which was at the time covertly counteracting them in Italy. Flatter none but your enemies. The famous saying of Catherine de' Medici seems to have been the political rule of life with that family of merchant princes in which great men were never lacking until their destinies became great, when they fell, before their time, into that degeneracy in which royal races and noble families are wont to end. For three generations there had been a great Lorrain warrior and a great Lorrain churchman, and what is more singular, the churchmen all bore a strong resemblance in the face to Jimenez, as did Cardinal Richelieu in after days. These five great cardinals all had sly, mean, and yet terrible faces, while the warriors, on the other hand, were of that type of Basque mountaineer which we see in Henri the Fourth. The two Balafres, father and son, wounded and scarred in the same manner, lost something of this type, but not the grace and affability by which, as much as by their bravery, they won the hearts of the soldiery. It is not useless to relate how the present Grand Master received his wound, for it was healed by the heroic measures of a personage of our drama, by Ambroise Paré, the man we have already mentioned as under obligations to Leckerman, syndic of the Guild Furries. At the siege of Calais, the Duke had his face pierced through and through by a lance, the point of which, after entering the cheek just below the right eye, went through to the neck below the left eye, and remained broken off in the face. 
The duke lay dying in his tent in the midst of universal distress, and he would have died had it not been for the devotion and prompt courage of Amboise Poiret. The duke is not dead, gentlemen, he said to the weeping attendants, but he will soon die if I dare not treat him as I would a dead man, and I shall risk doing so, no matter what it may cost me in the end. See. And with that he put his left foot on the duke's breast, took the broken wooden end of the lance in his fingers, shook and loosened it by degrees in the wound, and finally succeeded in drawing out the iron head, as if he were handling a thing, not a man. Though he saved the prince by this heroic treatment, he could not prevent the horrible scar which gave the great soldier his nickname, the Balafre, the Scarred. This name descended to the son, and for a similar reason. Absolutely masters of Francois II, whom his wife ruled through their mutual and excessive passion, these two great Lorrain princes, the Duke and the Cardinal, were masters of France, and had no other enemy at court than Catherine de' Medici. No great statesman ever played a closer or more watchful game. The mutual position of the ambitious widow of Henri II and the ambitious house of Lorraine was pictured, as it were, to the eye, by a scene which took place on the terrace of the Chateau de Blois very early in the morning of the day on which Christophe Lecamus was destined to arrive there. The Queen Mother, who feigned an extreme attachment to the Guises, had asked to be informed of the news brought by the three seigneurs coming from three different parts of the kingdom. But she had the mortification of being courteously dismissed by the Cardinal. She then walked to the parterres, which overhung the Loire, where she was building, under the superintendence of her astrologer, Ruggieri, an observatory, which is still standing, and from which the eye may range over the whole landscape of that delightful valley. The two Lorrain princes were at the other end of the terrace, facing the Vendemois, which overlooks the upper part of the town, the perch of the Breton, and the postern gate of the chateau. Catherine had deceived the two brothers by pretending to a slight displeasure she was in reality very well pleased to have an opportunity to speak to one of the three young men who had arrived in such haste. This was a young nobleman named Chivany, apparently a tool of the cardinal, in reality a devoted servant of Catherine. Catherine also counted among her devoted servants two Florentine nobles, the Gondi, but they were so suspected by the Guises that she dared not send them on any errand away from the court, where she kept them watched, it is true, in all their words and actions, but where at least they were able to watch and study the Guises and counsel Catherine. These two Florentines maintained in the interests of the Queen Mother another Italian, Bidago, a clever Piedmontese, who pretended, with Giverni, to have abandoned their mistress and gone over to the Guises, who encouraged their enterprises and employed them to watch Catherine. Giverni had come from Paris and Ecouen. The last to arrive was Saint-André, who was Marshal of France, and became so important that the Guises, whose creature he was, made him the third person in the triumvirate they formed the following year against Catherine. The other seigneur who had arrived during the night was Villeville, also a creature of the Guises, and a marshal of France, who was returning from a secret mission known only to the Grand Master, who had entrusted to him. As for Saint-André, he was in charge of military measures, taken with the object of driving all reformers under arms into Amboise, a scheme which now formed the subject of a council held by the Duke and Cardinal, Birago, Giverni, Villeville, and Saint-André. As the two Lorrains employed Birago, it is to be supposed that they relied upon their own powers, for they knew of his attachment to the Queen Mother. At this singular epoch, the double part played by many of the political men of the day was well known to both parties. They were like cards in the hands of gamblers. The cleverest player won the game. During this council, the two brothers maintained the most impenetrable reserve. The conversation which now took place between Catherine and certain of her friends will explain the object of this council, held by the Guises in the open air, in the hanging gardens, at break of day, as if they feared to speak within the walls of the Chateau de Blois. The Queen Mother, under pretense of examining the observatory then in process of construction, walked in that direction, accompanied by the two Gondis, glancing with a suspicious and inquisitive eye at the group of enemies, who were still standing at the further end of the terrace, and from whom Kiverni now detached himself to join the Queen Mother. She was then at the corner of the terrace, which looked down upon the church of St. Nicholas. There, at least, would be no danger of the slightest overhearing. The wall of the terrace is on a level with the towers of the church, and the Guises invariably held their council at the farther corner of the same terrace, at the base of the great unfinished keep or dungeon going and returning between the Pechois de Breton 
and the gallery by the bridge which joined them to the gardens. No one was within sight. Kiverni raised the hand of the Queen Mother to kiss it, and as he did so he slipped a little note from his hand to hers, without being observed by the two Italians. Catherine turned to the angle of the parapet and read as follows. You are powerful enough to hold the balance between the leaders and to force them into a struggle as to who shall serve you. Your house is full of kings, and you have nothing to fear from the Lorrain. All the Bourbons, provided you pit them one against the other, for both are striving to snatch the crown from your children. Be the mistress and not the servant of your counsellors. Support them in turn one against the other, or the kingdom will go from bad to worse, and mighty wars may come of it. L'Hôpital. The queen put the letter in the hollow of her corset, resolving to burn it as soon as she was alone. When did you see him? she asked Kiverni. On my way back from visiting the Connetable at Malone, where I met him with the Duchess de Berry, whom he was most impatient to convey to Savoir, that he might return here and open the eyes of the Chancellor Olivier, who is now completely duped by the Lorrains. As soon as Monsieur L'Hôpital saw the true object of the Guises, he determined to support your interests. That is why he is so anxious to get here and give you his vote at the councils. Is he sincere? asked Catherine. You know very well that if the Lorrains have put him in the council, it is that he may help them to reign. L'Hôpital is a Frenchman who comes off to good a stock not to be honest and sincere, said Giverny. Besides, his note is a sufficiently strong pledge. What answer did the Connetable send to the Guises? He replied that he was the servant of the king and would await his orders. On receiving that answer, the cardinal, to suppress all resistance, determined to propose the appointment of his brother as lieutenant general of the kingdom. Have they got as far as that? exclaimed Catherine, alarmed. Well, did Monsieur L'Hôpital send me no other message? He told me to say to you, madame, that you alone could stand between the crown and the Guises. Does he think that I ought to use the Huguenot as a weapon? Ah, madame, cried Kiverny, surprised at such astuteness. We never dreamed of casting you into such difficulties. Does he know the position I am in? asked the queen calmly. Very nearly. He thinks you were duped after the death of the king into accepting that castle on Madame Diane's overthrow. The Guises consider themselves released toward the queen by having satisfied the woman. Yes, said the queen, looking at the two Gondi. I made a blunder. A blunder of the gods, replied Charles de Gondi. Gentlemen, said Catherine, if I go over openly to the reformers, I shall become the slave of a party. Madame, said Kiverny eagerly, I approve entirely of your meaning. We must use them, but not serve them. Though your support does undoubtedly, for the time being, lie there, said Charles de Gondi. We must not conceal from ourselves that success and defeat are both equally perilous. I know it, said the Queen. A single false step would be a pretext on which the Guises would seize at once to get rid of me. The niece of a pope, the mother of Four Valois, a queen of France, the widow of the most ardent persecutor of the Huguenot, an Italian Catholic. The aunt of Leo X, can she ally herself with the Reformation? asked Charles de Gondi. But, said his brother Albert, if she seconds the Guises, does she not play into the hands of a usurpation? We have to do with men who see a crown to seize in the coming struggle between Catholicism and Reform. It is possible to support the reformers without abjuring. Reflect, madame, that your family, which ought to have been wholly devoted to the king of France, is at this moment the servant of the king of Spain, and tomorrow it will be that of the reformation, if the reformation could make a king of the duke of Florence. I am certainly disposed to lend a hand for a time to the Huguenot, said Catherine, if only to revenge myself on that soldier and that priest, and that woman, as she spoke, she called attention with her subtle Italian glance to the Duke and Cardinal, and then to the second floor of the chateau on which were the apartments of her son and Mary Stuart. That trio has taken from my hands the reins of state for which I waited long while the old woman filled my place, she said gloomily, glancing toward Chenonceau, the chateau which she had lately exchanged with Diane de Poitiers against that of Chaumont. Ma, she added in Italian, it seems that this 
reforming gentry in Geneva have not the wit to address themselves to me, and on my conscience I cannot go to them. Not one of you would dare to risk carrying them a message. She stamped her foot. I did hope you would have met the cripple at Ecouen. He has sense, she said to Giverny. The prince de Conde was there, madame, said Giverny, but he could not persuade the connetable to join him. Monsieur de Montmorency wants to overthrow the Guises, who have sent him into exile, but he will not encourage heresy. What will ever break these individual wills which are forever thwarting royalty? God's truth, exclaimed the queen. The great nobles must be made to destroy each other, as Louis XI, the greatest of your kings, did with those of his time. There are four or five parties now in this kingdom, and the weakest of them is that of my children. The Reformation is an idea, said Charles de Gondi. The parties that Louis XI crushed were moved by self-interests only. Ideas are behind selfish interests, replied Giverny. Under Louis XI, the idea was the great fiefs. Make heresy an axe, said Albert de Gondi, and you will escape the odium of executions. Ah, cried the queen, but I am ignorant of the strength and also of the plans of the reformers, and I have no safe way of communicating with them. If I were detected in any manoeuvre of that kind, either by the queen, who watches me like an infant in a cradle, or by those two jailers over there, I should be banished from France and sent back to Florence with a terrible escort commanded by Guise minions. Thank you, no, my daughter-in-law, but I wish you the fate of being a prisoner in your own home, that you may know that you have made me suffer. Their plans, exclaimed Giverny. The Duke and the Cardinal know what they are, but those two foxes will not divulge them. If you could induce them to do so, madame, I would sacrifice myself for your sake and come to an understanding with the Prince de Conte. How much of the Guises' own plans have they been forced to reveal to you? asked the Queen with a glance at the two brothers. Monsieur de Villeville and Monsieur de Saint André have just received fresh orders, the nature of which is concealed from us, but I think the Duke is intending to concentrate his best troops on the left bank. Within a few days you will all be moved to Amboise. The Duke has been studying the position from this terrace and decides that Blois is not a propitious spot for his secret schemes. What can he want better? added Cavini, pointing to the precipices which surrounded the chateau. There is no place in the world where the court is more secure from attack than it is here. Abdicate or reign, said Albert in a low voice to the queen, who stood motionless and thoughtful. A terrible expression of inward rage passed over the fine ivory face of Catherine de Medici, who was not yet forty years old, though she had lived for twenty-six years at the court of France. Without power, she who from the moment of her arrival intended to play a leading part. Then in her native language, the language of Dante, these terrible words came slowly from her lips. Nothing, so long as that son lives, his little wife bewitches him, she added after a pause. Catherine's exclamation was inspired by a prophecy which had been made to her a few days earlier at the Chateau de Chaumont on the opposite bank of the river, where she had been taken by Ruggieri astrologer to obtain information as to the lives of her four children from a celebrated female seer secretly brought there by nostradamus chief among the physicians of that great sixteenth century who practised like the rigieri the cardans paracelsus and others the occult sciences this woman whose name and life have eluded history foretold one year as the length of francois reign give me your opinion on all this said catherine to giverny we shall have a battle replied the prudent courtier. The king of Navarre. Oh, say the queen, interrupted Catherine. True, the queen, said Giverny, smiling. The queen has given the prince de Conde as leader to the reformers, and he in his position of youngest son can venture all. Consequently, the cardinal talks of ordering him here. If he comes, said the queen, I am saved. Thus the leaders of the great movement of the Reformation of France were justified in hoping for an ally in Catherine de Medici. There is one thing to be considered, said the queen. The Bourbons may fool the Huguenots, and the Sears Calvin and de Bez may fool the Bourbons, but are we strong enough to fool the Huguenots, Bourbons, and Guises? In presence of three such enemies, it is allowable to feel one's pulse. But they have not the king, said Albert de Gondi. You will always triumph, having the king on your side. Maladetta Maria, muttered Catherine between her teeth. 
the Lorrains are even now endeavouring to turn the burghers against you, remarked Pirago. End of section six. Section seven of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. The court. The hope of gaining the crown was not the result of a premeditated plan in the minds of the restless Guises. Nothing warranted such a hope or such a plan. Circumstances alone inspired their audacity. The two cardinals and the two balafres were four ambitious minds, superior in talents to all the other politicians who surrounded them. This family was never really brought low except by Henri IV, a factionist himself, trained in the great school of which Catherine and the Guises were masters. By his lessons, he had profited but too well. At this moment, the two brothers, the Duke and Cardinal, were the arbiters of the greatest revolution attempted in Europe since that of Henry VIII in England, which was the direct consequence of the invention of printing. Adversaries to the Reformation, they meant to stifle it, power being in their hands. But their opponent, Calvin, though less famous than Luther, was far the stronger of the two. Calvin saw government, where Luther saw dogma only. While the stout beer-drinker and amorous German fought with the devil and flung an ink-bottle at his head, the man from Picardy, a sickly celibate, made plans of campaign, directed battles, armed princes, and roused whole peoples by sowing republican doctrines in the hearts of the burghers, recouping his continual defeats in the field by fresh progress in the mind of the nations. The Cardinal de Lorrain and the Duc de Guise, like Philip II and the Duke of Alba, knew where and when the monarchy was threatened, and how close the alliance ought to be between Catholicism and royalty. Charles V, drunk with the wine of Charlemagne's cup, believing too blindly in the strength of his monarchy, and confident of sharing the world with Suleiman, did not at first feel the blow at his head, but no sooner had Cardinal Gonvay made him aware of the extent of the wound than he abdicated. The Guises had but one scheme, that of annihilating heresy at a single blow. The blow they were now to attempt, for the first time, to strike at Amboise. Failing there, they tried it again, twelve years later, at the Saint Bartholomew, on the latter occasion in conjunction with Catherine de Medici, enlightened by that time by the flames of a twelve years' war, enlightened above all by the significant word, Republic, uttered later, and printed by the writers of the Reformation, already foreseen, as we have said before, by Leckerman, that type of Parisian bourgeoisie. The two Guise is now on the point of striking a murderous blow at the heart of the French nobility, in order to separate it once for all from a religious party, whose triumph would be its ruin, still stood together on the terrace, concerting as to the best means of revealing their coup d'etat to the king, while Catherine was talking with her counsellors. Jean d'Abray knew what she was about when she declared herself protectress of the Huguenots. She has a battering ram in the Reformation, and she knows how to use it, said the Duke, who fathomed the deep designs of the Queen of Navarre, one of the great minds of the century. Theodore de Bez is now in Iraq, remarked the Cardinal, after first going to Geneva to take Calvin's orders. What men these burghers know how to find, exclaimed the Duke. Ah, we have none on our side of the quality of la Ronadie, cried the Cardinal. He is a true Cataline. Such men always act for their own interests, replied the Duke. Didn't I fathom La Renaudy? I loaded him with favours. I helped him to escape when he was condemned by the Parliament of Bourgogne. I brought him back from exile by obtaining a revision of his sentence. I intended to do far more for him, and all the while he was plotting a diabolical conspiracy against us. That rascal has united the Protestants of Germany with the heretics of France by reconciling the differences that grew up between the dogmas of Luther and those of Calvin. He has brought the discontented great seigneurs into the party of the Reformation without obliging them to abjure Catholicism openly. For the last year he has had thirty captains under him. He is everywhere at once, at Lyon, in Languedoc, in Nantes. It was he who drew up the minutes of a consultation which were hawked about all Germany, in which the theologians declared that force might be resorted to in order to throw from the king from our rule and tutelage. 
The paper is now being circulated from town to town. Wherever we look for him, we never find him. And yet I have never done him anything but good. It comes to this, that we must now either thrash him like a dog, or try to throw him a golden bridge by which he will cross into our camp. Bretagne, like a dog, in fact the whole kingdom is in league to deal us a mortal blow, said the cardinal. After the fete was over yesterday, I spent the rest of the night in reading the reports sent me by the monks, in which I found that the only persons who have compromised themselves are poor gentlemen, artisans as to whom it doesn't signify whether you hang them or let them live. The colonies and Conde do not show their hand as yet, though they hold the threads of the whole conspiracy. Yes, replied the duke. And therefore, as soon as that lawyer Avenel sold the secret of the plot, I told Bragelon to let the conspirators carry it out. They have no suspicion that we know it. They are so sure of surprising us that the leaders may possibly show themselves then. My advice is to allow ourselves to be beaten for forty-eight hours. Half an hour would be too much, cried the cardinal alarmed. So this is your courage, is it? retorted the balafre. The cardinal, quite unmoved, replied, Whether the Prince de Conde is compromised or not, if we are certain that he is the leader, we should strike him down at once and secure tranquillity. We need judges rather than soldiers for this business, and judges are never lacking. Victory is always more certain in the Parliament than on the field, and it costs less. I consent, willingly, said the Duke. But do you think the Prince de Conde is powerful enough to inspire himself alone? The audacity of those who are making this first attack upon us. Isn't there, behind him, the King of Navarre? said the Cardinal. Pooh, a fool who speaks to me cap in hand, replied the Duke. The coquetries of that Florentine woman seem to blind your eyes. Oh, as for that, exclaimed the priest, if I do play the gallant with her, it is only that I may read to the bottom of her heart. She has no heart, said the Duke sharply. She is even more ambitious than you and I. You are a brave soldier, said the cardinal. But believe me, I distance you in this matter. I have had Catherine watched by Mary Stuart long before you even suspected her. She has no more religion than my shoe. If she is not the soul of this plot, it is not for want of will. But we shall now be able to test her on the scene itself and find out then how she stands by us. Up to this time, however, I am certain she has held no communication whatever with the heretics. Well, it is time now to reveal the whole plot to the king, and to the queen mother, who you say knows nothing of it. That is the sole proof of her innocence. Perhaps the conspirators have waited till the last moment, expecting to dazzle her with the probabilities of success. La Renaudie must soon discover by my arrangements that we are warned. Last night Nemo was to follow detachments of the reformers who are pouring in along the crossroads, and the conspirators will be forced to attack us at Amboise, which place I intend to let them enter. Here, added the duke, pointing to three sides of the rock on which the Chateau de Bois is built. We should have an assault without any result. The Huguenots could come and go at will. Bola is an open hall with four entrances, whereas Amboise is a sack with a single mouth. I shall not leave Catherine's side, said the cardinal. We have made a blunder, reported the duke, who was playing with his dagger, tossing it into the air and catching it by the hilt. We ought to have treated her as we did the reformers, given her complete freedom of action, and caught her in the act. The cardinal looked at his brother for an instant, and shook his head. What does Padayon want? said the duke, observing the approach of the young nobleman, who was later to become celebrated by his encounter with La Renaudie, in which they both lost their lives. Monseigneur, a man sent by the Queen's furrier is at the gate, and he says he has an ermine suit to convey to her. Am I to let him enter? Ah, yes, the ermine coat she spoke of yesterday, returned the cardinal. Let the shop fellow pass. She will want the garment for the voyage down the Loire. How did he get here without being stopped until he reached the gate? asked the duke. I do not know, replied Padillon. I'll ask to see him when he's with the queen, thought the balafre. Let him wait in the salle de garde, he said aloud. Is he young, Padillon? The yes, monseigneur, says he is son of Lecamus, the Fourier. Lecamus is a good Catholic, replied the cardinal, who, like his brother the duke, was endowed with Caesar's memory. The rector of Saint-Pierre-Aubeuf relies upon him. He is the provost of that quarter. 
Nevertheless, said the duke, make the son talk with the captain of the Scotch guard, laying an emphasis on the verb which was readily understood. Ambroise is in the chateau. He can tell us whether the fellow is really the son of Le Camus, for the old man did him good service in times past. Send for Ambroise Paré. It was at this moment that Queen Catherine went unattended toward the two brothers, who hastened to meet her with their accustomed show of respect, in which the Italian princess detected constant irony. Messieurs, she said, will you deign to inform me of what is about to take place? Is the widow of your former master of less importance in your esteem than the Sieur Villeville, Virago, and Giverny? Madame, replied the cardinal, in a tone of gallantry, our duty as men, taking precedence of that of statecraft, forbids us to alarm the fair sex by false reports. But this morning there is indeed good reason to confer with you on the affairs of the country. You must excuse my brother for having already given orders to the gentleman you mention. Orders which are purely military and therefore did not concern you. The matters of royal importance are still to be decided. If you are willing, we will now go to the liver of the king and queen. It is nearly time. And what is all this, Monsieur le Duc? cried Catherine, pretending alarm. Is anything the matter? The Reformation, madame, is no longer a mere heresy. It is a party which has taken arms and is coming here to snatch the king away from you. Catherine, the cardinal, the duke, and the three gentlemen made their way to the staircase through the gallery, which was crowded with courtiers, who, being off duty, no longer had the right of entrance to the royal apartments, and stood in two hedges on either side. Gondi, who watched them while the queen mother talked with the Laurent princes, whispered in her ear, in good Tuscan, two words which afterwards became proverbs, words which are the keynote to one aspect of her regal character. Odiate e aspettate. Hate and wait. Fadian had gone to order the officer of the guard at the gate of the chateau to let the clerk of the queen's furrier enter, found Christophe open mouthed before the portal, staring at the facade built by the good king Louis the Twelfth, in which there was at that time a much greater number of grotesque carvings than we see there today. Grotesque this is to say, if we may judge by those that remain to us. For instance, a person curious in such matters may remark the figurine of a woman carved on the capital of one of the portal columns, with her robe caught up to show to a stout monk crouching in the capital of the corresponding column that which Brunel showed to Marfis, while above this portal stood at the time of which we write the statue of Louis the Twelfth. Several of the window casings of this facade, carved in the same style, are now unfortunately destroyed, amused, or seemed to amuse, Christophe, on whom the arquebusiers of the guard were raining jests. "'You would like to live there,' said the sub-corporal, playing with the cartridges of his weapon, which were prepared for use in the shape of little sugar-loaves, and slung to the baldricks of the men. "'A Parisian,' said another. "'You never saw the like of that, did you?' "'He recognises the good King Louis the Twelfth, said a third. Christophe pretended not to hear, and tried to exaggerate his amazement, the result being that his silly attitude and his behaviour before the guard proved an excellent passport to the eyes of Pardéon. "'The Queen has not yet risen,' said the young captain. "'Come and wait for her in the salle de garde.' Christophe followed Pardéon rather slowly. On the way he stopped to admire the pretty gallery in the form of an arcade, where the courtiers of Louis the Twelfth awaited the reception hour when it rained, and where, at the present moment, were several seigneurs attached to the guises to the staircase so well preserved to the present day, which led to their apartments, is at the end of this gallery in a tower, the architecture of which commends itself to the admiration of intelligent beholders. "'Well, well, did you come here to study the carving of images?' cried Padia, as Christophe stood before the charming sculptures of the balustrade, which unites, or if you prefer it, separates the columns of each arcade. Christophe followed the young officer to the grand staircase, not without a glance of ecstasy at the semi-Moorish tower. The weather was fine, and the court was crowded with staff officers and seigneurs, talking together in little groups, their dazzling uniforms and court dresses brightening a spot which the marvels of architecture, then fresh and new, had already made so brilliant. "'Come in here,' said Padillon, making Lecamo a sign to follow him through a carved wooden door, leading to the second floor, which the doorkeeper opened on recognising the young officer. It is easy to imagine Christophe's amazement as he entered the great salle de garde, 
then so vast that military necessity has since divided it by a partition into two chambers. It occupied on the second floor, that of the king, as did the corresponding hall on the first floor, that of the queen mother, one-third of the whole front of the chateau facing the courtyard, and it was lighted by two windows to right and two to left of the tower on which the famous staircase winds up. The young captain went to the door of the royal chamber, which opened upon this vast hall, and told one of the two pages on duty to inform Madame Daye, the queen's bedchamber woman, that the furrier was in the hall with her surcoat. On a sign from Pardier, Christophe placed himself near an officer, who was seated on a stool at the corner of a fireplace, as large as his father's whole shop, which was at the end of the great hall, opposite to a precisely similar fireplace at the other end. While talking to this officer, a lieutenant, he contrived to interest him with an account of the stagnation of trade. Christophe seemed so thoroughly a shopkeeper that the officer imparted that conviction to the captain of the Scotch guard, who came in from the courtyard to question Lecamus, all the while watching him covertly and narrowly. However much Christophe Lecamus had been warned, it was impossible for him to really apprehend the cold ferocity of the interests between which Chaudieu had slipped him. To an observer of this scene, who had known the secrets of it, as the historian understands it, in the light of today, there was indeed cause to tremble for this young man. The hope of two families, thrust between those powerful and pitiless machines, Catherine and the Guises, but to courageous beings, as a rule, measure the full extent of their dangers. By the way in which the port of Blois, the chateau and the town were guarded, Christophe was prepared to find spies and traps everywhere and he therefore resolved to conceal the importance of his mission and the tension of his mind under the empty-headed and shopkeeping appearance with which he presented himself to the eyes of young Pardaillon, the officer of the guard and the Scottish captain. The agitation which, in a royal castle, always attends the hour of the king's rising, was beginning to show itself. The great lords, whose horses, pages or grooms remained in the outer courtyard, for no one except the king and the queen's, had the right to enter the inner courtyard on horseback, were mounting by groups the magnificent staircase, and filling by degrees the vast hall, beams of which are now stripped of the decorations that then adorned them. Miserable little red tiles have replaced the ingenious mosaics of the floors, and the thick walls, then draped with the crown tapestries and glowing with all the arts of that unique period of the splendours of humanity, are now denuded and whitewashed. Reformers and Catholics were pressing in to hear the news and to watch faces quite as much as to pay their duty to the king. Francois II's excessive love for Mary Stuart, to which neither the Queen Mother nor the Guises made any opposition, and the politic compliance of Mary Stuart herself, deprived the king of all regal power. At seventeen years of age, he knew nothing of royalty but his pleasures, or of marriage beyond the indulgence of first passion. As a matter of fact, all present paid their court to Queen Mary and to her uncles, the Cardinal de Lorrain and the Duc de Guise, rather than to the king. This stir took place before Christophe, who watched the arrival of each new personage with natural eagerness. The magnificent poitier, on either side of which stood two pages and two soldiers of the Scotch Guard, then on duty, showed him the entrance to the royal chamber. The chamber so fatal to the son of the present Duc de Guise, the second Balafre who fell at the foot of the bed now occupied by Mary Stuart and Francois II. The Queen's maids of honour surrounded the fireplace opposite to that where Christophe was being talked with by the captain of the guard. The second fireplace was considered the chimney of honour. It was built in a thick wall of the Salle de Conseil, between the door of the royal chamber and that of the council hall, so that the maids of honour and the lords in waiting, who had the right to be there, were on the direct passage of the king and queen. The courtiers were certain on this occasion of seeing Catherine, for her maids of honour, dressed like the rest of the court ladies in black, came up the staircase from the Queen Mother's apartment and took their places, marshalled by the Comtesse de Fieschi. On the side toward the council hall and opposite to the maids of honour of the young queen, led by the Duchesse de Guise, who occupied the other side of the fireplace on the side of the royal bedroom, the courtiers left an open space between the ranks of these young ladies, who all belonged to the first families of the kingdom, which none but the greatest lords had the right to enter. The Comtesse de Fiesque and the Duchesse de Guise were, in virtue of their office, seated in the midst of these noble maids, who were all standing. 
The first gentleman who approached the dangerous ranks was the Duc d'Orléans, the king's brother, who had come down from his apartment on the third floor, accompanied by Monsieur de Cipierre, his governor. This young prince, destined before the end of the year to reign under the title of Charles the Ninth, was only ten years old and extremely timid. The Duc d'Anjou and the Duc d'Alençon, his younger brothers, also the Princesse Marguerite, afterwards the wife of Henri the Fourth, the Reine de Magor, were too young to come to court, and were therefore kept by their mother in her own apartments. The Duc d'Orléans, richly dressed after the fashion of the times, in silken trunk hose, a close-fitting jacket of cloth of gold embroidered with black flowers, and a little mantle of embroidered velvet, all black, for he still wore mourning for his father, bowed to the two ladies of honour and took his place beside his mother's maids. Already full of antipathy for the adherents of the house of Guise, he replied coldly to the remarks of the Duchess and leaned his arm on the back of the chair of the Comtesse de Fiesque. His governor, Monsieur de Cibier, one of the noblest characters of that day, stood beside him like a shield. Amur, afterwards Bishop of Orsaya and translator of Plutarch, in the simple soutane of an abbe, also accompanied the young prince, being his tutor, as he was of the two other princes whose affection became so profitable to him. Between the chimney of honour and the other chimney at the end of the hall, around which were grouped the guards, the captain of few courtiers, and Christophe carrying his box of furs, the Chancellor Olivier, protector and predecessor of l'Hôpital in the robes which the Chancellors of France have always worn, was walking up and down with the Cardinal de Tournon, who had recently returned from Rome. The pair were exchanging a few whispered sentences in the midst of great attention from the lords of the court, massed against the wall which separated the salle des gardes from the royal bedroom, like a living tapestry backed by the rich tapestry of art, crowded by a thousand personages. In spite of the present grave events, the court presented the appearance of all courts in all lands at all epochs, and in the midst of the greatest dangers. The courtiers talked of trivial matters, thinking of serious ones, they jested as they studied faces and apparently concerned themselves about love and the marriage of rich heiresses amid the bloodiest catastrophes. "'What did you think of yesterday's fate?' asked Baudet, Seigneur of Banton, approaching Mademoiselle de Pienne, one of the Queen Mother's maids of honour. "'Monsieur du Baif et de Baie were inspired with delightful ideas,' she replied, indicating the organisers of the fate who were standing near. "'I thought it all in the worst taste,' she added in a low voice. "'You had no part to play in it, I think,' remarked Mademoiselle de Lewiston from the opposite ranks of Queen Mary's maids. "'What are you reading there, madame?' asked Amiot of the Comtesse de Fiesque. "'Madi de Gaulle by the Seigneur de Esta. Commissary in ordinary to the King's artillery,' she replied. "'A charming work,' replied the beautiful girl, who was afterwards so celebrated under the name of Fosseuse, when she was lady of honour to Queen Marguerite of Navarre. "'The style is a novelty in form,' said Amiel. "'Do you accept such barbarisms?' he added, addressing Branton. "'They please the ladies, you know,' said Branton, crossing over to the Duchess de Guise, who held the Decan Marron in her hand. "'Some of the women of your house must appear in the book, madame,' he said. "'It is a pity that the Sieur Boccaccio did not live in our day. "'He would have known plenty of ladies to swell his volume.' "'How shrewd that Monsieur de Brantome is,' said the beautiful Mademoiselle de Lemieux to the Comtesse de Fiesque. "'He came to us first, but he means to remain in the Guise quarters.' "'Hush,' said Madame de Fiesque, glancing at the beautiful Lemouille. "'Attend to what concerns yourself.' The young girl turned her eyes to the door. She was expecting Sardini, a noble Italian with whom the Queen Mother, her relative, married her after an accident which happened in the dressing room of Catherine de' Medici herself, but which the young lady won the honour of having a queen as midwife. By the holy Ali Panton, Mademoiselle Davia seems to me pretty and prettier every morning, said Monsieur de Robert, Secretary of State, bowing to the ladies of the Queen Mother. The arrival of the Secretary of State made no commotion whatever, though his office was precisely what that of a minister is in these days. "'If you really think so, monsieur,' said the beauty, "'lend me the squib which was writing against the Monsieur de Guise, and I know it was lent to you.' "'It is no longer in my possession,' replied the Secretary, turning round to bow to the Duchess de Guise. "'I have it,' 
said the Comte de Gormont to Mademoiselle Davier. But I will give it to you on one condition only. Condition fie! exclaimed Madame de Fiesque. You don't know what it is, replied Gramont. Oh, it is easy to guess, remarked La Limeuil. The Italian custom of calling ladies as peasants call their wives, their such a one, was then the fashion of the court of France. You are mistaken, said the Count hastily. The matter is simply to give a letter from my cousin de Jeannac to one of the maids on the other side, Mademoiselle de Mata. You must not compromise, my young ladies, said the Comtesse de Fiesco. I will deliver the letter myself. Do you know what is happening in Flanders? she continued, turning to the Cardinal de Tournon. It seems that Monsieur Delmont is given to surprises. He and the Prince of Orange, remarked Cipier with a significant shrug of his shoulders. The Duke of Alba and Cardinal Granvey are going there, are they not, monsieur? said Amiot to the Cardinal de Tournon, who remained standing gloomy and anxious between the opposing groups after his conversation with the Chancellor. Happily, we are at peace. We need only conquer heresy on the stage, remarked the young Duc d'Orléans alluding to a part he had played the night before, that of a knight subduing a hydra, which bore upon its foreheads the word Reformation. Catherine de Medici, agreeing in this with her daughter-in-law, had allowed a theatre to be made of the great hall, afterwards arranged for the Parliament of Bois, which, as we have already said, connected the Chateau of Francois I with that of Louis the Twelfth. The cardinal made no answer to Amiel's question, but resumed his walk to the centre of the hall, talking in low tones with Monsieur de Robertet, and the Chancellor. Many persons are ignorant of the difficulties which secretaries of state, subsequently called ministers, met with at the first establishment of their office, and how much trouble the kings of France had in creating it. At this epoch, a secretary of state, like Robertet, was purely and simply a writer. He counted for almost nothing among the princes and grandees who decided the affairs of state. His functions were little more than those of the superintendent of finances, the Chancellor and the Keeper of the Seals. The kings granted seats at the council by letters patent to those of their subjects, whose advice seemed to them useful in the management of public affairs. Entrance to the council was given in this way to a president of the chamber of parliament, to a bishop, or to an untitled favourite. Once admitted to the council, the subject strengthened his position there by obtaining various crown offices on which devolved such prerogatives as the sword of a constable, the government of provinces, the grand mastership of artillery, the baton of a marshal, a leading rank in the army, or the admiralty, or a captaincy of the galleys. Often some office at court, like that of Grand Master of the Household, now held, as we have already said, by the Duc de Guise. Do you think that the Duc de Nemours will marry Françoise? said Madame de Guise to the tutor of the Duc d'Orléans. Ah, oh, madame, he replied, I know nothing but Latin. This answer made all who were within hearing of it smile. The seduction of Françoise de Rohan by the Duc de Nemours was the topic of all conversations. But as the Duke was cousin to François II, and doubly allied to the House of Valois, through his mother, the Guises regarded him more as the seduced than the seducer. Nevertheless, the power of the House of Rohan was such that the Duc de Nemours was obliged, after the death of François II, to leave France on consequence of suits brought against him by the Rohan, which suits the Guises settled. The Duke's marriage with the Duchesse de Guise after Poltrot's assassination of her husband in 1563 may explain the question which she put to Amiel by revealing the rivalry which must have existed between Mademoiselle de Rohan and the Duchess. Do you see that group of the discontented over there? said the Comte de Gamont, motioning towards the Monsieur de Coligny, the Cardinal de Chatillon, Danville, Dor, Moray, and several other seigneurs suspected of tampering with the Reformation who were standing between two windows on the other side of the fireplace. The Huguenots are bestirring themselves, said Spier. We know that Theodore de Bez has gone to Narac to induce the Queen of Navarre to declare for the reformers. By abjuring publicly, he added, looking at the Bailly of Orléans, who held the office of Chancellor to the Queen of Navarre and was watching the court attentively. She will do it, said the Bailly dryly. This personage, the Orléans Jacques Gueux, of the richest burghers of the day, was named Croslot and had charge of Jean d'Albois' business with the court of France. Do you really think so? said the Chancellor of France, appreciating the full importance of Croslot's declaration. 
Are you not aware, said the burgher, that the Queen of Navarre has nothing of the woman in her except sex? She is holy for things virile. Her powerful mind turns to the great affairs of state. Her heart is invincible under adversity. Monsieur le cardinal, whispered the Chancellor Olivier to Monsieur de Donon, who had overheard Goslow, what do you think of that audacity? The Queen of Navarre did well in choosing for her Chancellor a man for whom the house of Lorraine borrows money, and who offers his house to the king if his majesty visits Orleans, replied the cardinal. The Chancellor and the Cardinal looked at each other, without venturing to further communicate their thoughts, but Robertet expressed them, for he thought it necessary to show more devotion to the Guises than these great personages, inasmuch as he was smaller than they. It is a great misfortune that the House of Navarre, instead of abjuring the religion of its fathers, does not abjure the spirit of vengeance and rebellion, and which the Connetable de Bourbon breathed into it, he said aloud. We shall see the quarrels of the Armagnacs and the Bourguignons revive in our day. No, said Goslaw. There's another Louis XI in the Cardinal de Lorraine. And also in Queen Catherine, replied Robert. At this moment, Madame Daye, the favourite bedchamber woman of Queen Mary Stuart, crossed the hall and went toward the royal chamber. A passage caused a general commotion. We shall soon enter, said Madame de Fisquil. I don't think so, replied the Duchess de Guise. Their Majesties will come out. A grand council is to be held. End of section seven. Section eight of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Wall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six. The Little Lever of Francois the Second. Madame Dale glided into the royal chamber after scratching on the door, a respectful custom invented by Catherine de' Medici and adopted by the court of France. Falls the weather, my dear Dale, said Queen Mary, showing her fresh young face out of the bed and shaking the curtains. Ah, madame, what's the matter, my Dale? You look as if the archers of the guard were after ye. Oh, madame, is the king still asleep? Yes. We are to leave the chateau. Monsieur le cardinal requests me to tell you so, and to ask you to make the king agree to it. Do you know why, my good Dael? The reformers want to seize you and carry you off. Ah, that new religion does not leave me a minute's peace. I dreamed last night that I was in prison. I, who will some day unite the crowns of the three noblest kingdoms in the world. Therefore, it could only be a dream, madame. Carry me off. Well, would be rather pleasant, but on account of religion and by heretics, oh, that would be horrid. The queen sprang from the bed and placed herself in a large armchair of red velvet before the fireplace, after Dale had given her a dressing gown of black velvet, which she fastened loosely round her waist by a silken cord. Dale lit the fire, for the mornings are cool, on the banks of the Loire, in the month of May. My emperors must have received some news during the night, said the queen, inquiringly to Dale, whom she treated with great familiarity. Monsieur de Guise have been walking together from early morning on the terrace, so as not to be overheard by any one, and there they received messengers who came in hot haste from all the different points of the kingdom where the reformers are stirring. Madame Lorraine Mare was there too, with her Italians, hoping she would be consulted. But no, she was not admitted to the council. She must have been furious. All the more because she was so angry yesterday, replied Dale. They say that when she saw your majesty appear in that beautiful dress of woven gold, with the charming veil of tan-coloured crepe, she was none too pleased. Leave us, my good Dale. The king is waking up. Let no one, even those who have the little entrees, disturb us. An affair of state is in hand, and my uncles will not disturb us. Why? My dear Mary, already out of bed. Is it daylight? said the young king, waking up. My dear darling, while we were asleep, the wicked waked, and now they are forcing us to leave this delightful place. What makes you think of wicked people, my treasure? I am sure we enjoyed the prettiest fate in the world last night. If it were not for the Latin words those gentlemen would put into our French. Ah, said Mary, your language is really in very good taste. 
and Rabelais exhibits it finely. You are such a learned woman. I am so vexed that I can't sing your praises in verse. If I were not the king, I would take my brother's tutor, Amiot, and let him make me as accomplished as Charles. You need not envy your brother, who writes verses and shows them to me, asking for mine in return. You are the best of the four, and will make as good a king as you are the dearest of lovers. Perhaps that is why your mother does not like you. But never mind, I, dear heart, will love you for all the world. I have no great merit in loving such a perfect queen, said the little king. I don't know what prevented me from kissing you before the whole court when you danced the brandler with the torches last night. I saw plainly that all the other women were mere servants compared to you, my beautiful Mary. It may be only prose you spoke, but it is ravishing speech, dear darling, for it is love that says those words. And you, you know well, my beloved, that were you only a poor little page, I should love you as much as I do now. And yet there is nothing so sweet as to whisper to oneself, my lover is king. Ah, the pretty arm, why must we dress ourselves? I love to pass my fingers through your silky hair and tangle its blonde curls. Ah, sir, sweet one, don't let your women kiss that pretty throat and those white shoulders any more. Don't allow it, I say. It is too much that the fogs of Scotland ever touch them. Won't you come with me to see my dear country? The Scotch love you. There are no rebellions there. Who rebels in this our kingdom? said Francois, crossing his dressing gown and taking Mary Stuart on his knee. Oh, "'Tis all very charming, I know that,' she said, withdrawing her cheek from the king. "'But it is your business to reign, if you please, my sweet sire. "'Why talk of reigning? This morning I wish... "'Why say wish when you have only to will all? "'That's not the speech of a king, nor that of a lover. "'But no more of love just now. Let us drop it. "'We have business more important to speak of.' "'Oh?' cried the king. "'It is long since we have had any business.' Is it amusing? No, said Mary, not at all. We have to move from Blois. I'll wager, darling, you have seen your uncles who manage so well that I, at seventeen years of age, am no better than a raw fagnon. In fact, I don't know why I've attended any of the councils since the first. They can manage matters just as well by putting the crown in my chair. I see only through their eyes, and I'm forced to consent to things blindly. Oh, monsieur, said the queen, rising from the king's knee with a little air of indignation. You said you would never worry me again on this subject, and that my uncles used the royal power only for the good of your people. Your people, they are so nice. They would gobble you up like a strawberry if you tried to rule them yourself. You want a warrior, a rough master of mailed hands, whereas you, you are a darling whom I love as you are, whom I should never love otherwise. Do you hear me, monsieur? She added, kissing the forehead of the lad, who seemed inclined to rebel at her speech, but softened at her kisses. Oh, how I wish they were not your uncles, cried Francois II. I particularly dislike the cardinal, and when he puts on his wheedling air and his submissive manner and says to me, bowing, Sir, the honour of the crown and the faith of your fathers forbid your majesty to do this and that, I am sure he is working only for his cursed house of Lorraine. Oh, how well you mimicked him, cried the queen. But why don't you make the guises inform you of what is going on, so that when you attain your grand majority, you may know how to reign yourself? I am your wife, and your honour is mine. Trust me, we will reign together, my darling, but it won't be a bed of roses for us until the day comes when we have our own wills. There is nothing so difficult for a king as to reign. Am I a queen, for example? Don't you know that your mother returns me evil for all the good my uncles do to raise the splendour of your throne? Eh, hey, what difference between them? My uncles are great princes, nephews of Charlemagne, filled with ardour and ready to die for you, whereas this daughter of a doctor or a shopkeeper, queen of France by accident, scolds like a burgher woman who can't manage her own household. She is discontented because she can't set everyone by the ears. And then she looks at me with a sour pale face and says from her pinched lips, My daughter, 
You are a queen. I am only the second woman in the kingdom. She is really furious, you know, my darling. But if I were in your place, I should not wear crimson velvet while all the court is in mourning. Neither should I appear in public with my own hair and no jewels, because what is not becoming in a simple lady is still less becoming in a queen. Also, I should not dance myself. I should content myself with seeing others dance. That is what she says to me. Heavens, cried the king. I think I hear her coming, if she were to know. Oh, how you tremble before her. She worries you. Only say so and we will send her away. Faith, she's Florentine and we cannot help her clicking you. But when it comes to worrying... For heaven's sake, Mary, hold your tongue, said Francois, frightened and also pleased. I don't want you to lose her goodwill. Don't be afraid that she will ever break with me, who will some day wear the three noblest crowns in the world, my dearest little king, cried Mary Stuart. Though she hates me for a thousand reasons, she is always caressing me in the hope of turning me against my uncles. Hates you? Yes, my angel. And if I had not proofs of that feeling such as women only understand, for they alone know its malignity, I would forgive her perpetual opposition to our dear love, my darling. Is it my fault that your father could not endure Mademoiselle Medici, or that her son loves me? The truth is, she hates me so much that if you had not put yourself into a rage, we should each have had our separate chamber at Saint-Germain, and also here. She pretended it was the custom of the kings and queens of France. Custom, indeed. It was your father's custom, and that is easily understood. As for your grandfather, Francois, the good man set up the custom for the convenience of his loves. Therefore, I say, take care, and if we have to leave this place, be sure that we are not separated. Leave Blois? Marie, what do you mean? I don't wish to leave this beautiful chateau, where we can see the Loire and the country around us, with a town at our feet, and all these pretty gardens. If I go away, it will be to Italy, with you, to see St. Peter's and Raphael's pictures, and the orange trees. Oh, my darling king, if you knew the longing your Mary has to ramble among the orange groves in fruit and flower. Let us go, then, cried the king. Go, exclaimed the Grand Master as he entered the room. Yes, sire, you must leave Blois. Pardon my boldness in entering your chamber, but circumstances are stronger than etiquette, and I come to entreat you to hold the council. Finding themselves thus surprised, Mary and Francois hastily separated, and on their faces was the same expression of offended royal majesty. You are too much of a grand master, Monsieur de Guise, said the king, though controlling his anger. The devil take lovers, murmured the cardinal in Catherine's ear. My son, replied the queen mother, appearing behind the cardinal. It is a matter concerning your safety, and that of your kingdom. I'll see wakes while you have slept, sire, said the cardinal. Withdraw into the hall, cried the little king, and then we will order counsel. Madame, said the queen master to the young queen, the son of your fourier has brought some furs which was just in time for the journey, for it is probable we shall sail down the Loire. But, he added, turning to the queen mother, he also wishes to speak to you, madame. While the king dresses you and Madame Laurent had better see and dismiss him, so that we may not be delayed and harassed by this trifle. Certainly, said Catherine, thinking to herself, if he tries to get rid of me with any such trick, he little knows me. The cardinal and the duke withdrew, leaving the two queens and the king alone together. As they crossed the salle des gardes to enter the council chamber, the grand master told the usher to bring the queen's furrier to him and Christophe saw the usher approaching from the farther end of the great hall. He took him on account of his uniform for some great personage, and his heart sank within him. But that sensation, natural as it was at the approach of the critical moment, grew terrible when the usher, whose movement had attracted the eyes of all that brilliant assembly upon Christophe, his homely face and his bundle, said to him, Monsieur, the Cardinal de Lorraine, the Grand Master, wished to speak to you in the council chamber. Can I have been betrayed, thought the helpless ambassador of the reformers. Christophe followed the usher with lowered eyes, which he did not raise till he stood in the great council chamber, the size of which is almost equal to that of the Salle de Garde. The two Lorrain princes were there alone, standing before the magnificent fireplace, which backs against that in the Salle de Garde, around which the ladies of the two queens were grouped. You have come from Paris. Which route did you take? said the cardinal. 
I came by water, monseigneur, replied the reformer. How did you enter Blois? asked the grand master. By the docks, monseigneur. Did no one question you? exclaimed the duke, who was watching the young man closely. Uh, no, monseigneur. T to the first soldier who looked as if he meant to stop me, I said I came on duty to the two queens, to whom my father was furrier. What is happening in Paris? asked the cardinal. They are still looking for the murderer of the President Minard. Are you not the son of my surgeon's greatest friend? said the Duc de Guise, misled by the candour of Christophe's expression after his first alarm had passed away. Yes, Monseigneur. The Grand Master turned aside, abruptly raised the portiere which concealed the double door of the council chamber, and showed his face to the whole assembly, among whom he was searching for the king's surgeon. And was Paré standing in a corner, caught a glance which the duke cast upon him, and immediately advanced. Ambroise, who was at this time, was inclined to the reformed religion, eventually adopted it. But the friendship of the Guises, and that of the kings of France, guaranteed him against the evils which overtook his co-religionists. The duke, who considered himself under obligations for life to Ambroise Paré, had lately caused him to be appointed chief surgeon to the king. "'What is it, Monseigneur?' said Ambroise. "'Is the king ill? I think it likely.' "'Likely? Why?' "'The queen is too pretty,' replied the surgeon. "'Ah!' exclaimed the duke in astonishment. "'However, that is not the matter now,' he added after a pause. "'Ambroise, I want you to see a friend of yours.' So saying, he drew him to the door of the council room and showed him Christophe. "'Ah, true, Monseigneur,' cried the surgeon, extending his hand to the young furrier. "'How is your father, my lad?' "'Very well, Mathieu Ambroise,' replied Christophe. "'What are you doing at court?' asked the surgeon. "'It is not your business to carry parcels. Your father intends you for the law. Do you want the protection of these two great princes to make you a solicitor?' "'Indeed I do,' said Christophe. "'But I am here only in the interests of my father, and if you could intercede for us, please do so,' he added in a piteous tone, and asked the Grand Master for an order to pay certain sums that are due to my father, for he is at his wit's end just now for money.' The cardinal and the duke glanced at each other and seemed satisfied. Now we leave us, said the duke to the surgeon, making him a sign. And you, my friend, turning to Christophe, do your errand quickly and return to Paris. My secretary will give you a pass, for it is not safe, my dear, to be travelling on my high roads. Neither of the brothers formed the slightest suspicion of the grave importance of Christophe's errand, convinced as they now were that he was really the son of the good Catholic Lecamou the court furrier sent to collect payment for their wares. "'Take him close to the door of the queen's chamber. She will probably ask for him soon,' said the cardinal to the surgeon, motioning to Christophe. While the son of the furrier was undergoing this brief examination in the council chamber, the king, leaving the queen in company with her mother-in-law, had passed into his dressing-room, which was entered through another small room next to the chamber. Standing in the wide recess of an immense window, Catherine looked at the gardens her mind a prey to painful thoughts. She saw that in all probability one of the greatest captains of the age would be foisted that very day to the place and power of her son, the King of France, under the formidable title of Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. Before this peril she stood alone, without power of action, without defence. She might have been likened to a phantom as she stood there in her mourning garments, which she had not quitted since the death of Henri II. So motionless was her pallid face in the grasp of her bitter reflections. Her black eyes floated in that species of indecision for which great statesmen are so often blamed, though it comes from the vast extent of the glance with which they embrace all difficulties. Setting one against the other, and adding up, as it were, all chances before deciding on a course. Her ears rang, her blood tingled, and yet she stood there calm and dignified, all the while measuring in her soul the depths of the political abyss which lay before her like the natural depths which rolled away at her feet. This day was the second of those terrible days, that of the arrest of Vidame of Chartres being the first, which she was destined to meet in so great numbers throughout her regal life. It also witnessed her last blunder in the school of power. Though the sceptre seemed escaping from her hands, she wished to seize it. And she did seize it, by a flash of that power of will which was never relaxed by either the disdain of her father-in-law, Francois I, and his court, for in spite of her rank of dauphiness, she had been of no account. 
of the constant repulses of her husband Henri the Second and the terrible opposition of her rival Diane de Poitiers. A man would never have fathomed this thwarted queen, but the fair-haired Mary, so subtle, so clever, so girlish, and already so well trained, examined her out of the corners of her eyes as she hummed an Italian air and assumed a careless countenance. Without being able to guess the storms of repressed ambition, which sent the dew of a cold sweat to the forehead of the Florentine, the pretty Scotch girl, with her willful, piquant face, knew very well that the advancement of her uncle, the Duke de Guise, to the lieutenant generalship of the kingdom, was filling the Queen Mother with inward rage. Nothing amused her more than to watch her mother-in-law, in whom she saw only an intriguing woman of low birth, always ready to avenge herself. The face of the one was grave and gloomy, and somewhat terrible, by reason of the livid tones which transform the skin of Italian women to yellow ivory by daylight, though it recovers its dazzling brilliancy under candlelight. The face of the other was fair and fresh and gay. At sixteen, Mary Stuart's skin had that exquisite blonde whiteness which made her beauty so celebrated. Her fresh and piquant face, with its pure lines, shone with the roguish mischief of childhood, expressed in the regular eyebrows, the vivacious eyes, and the archness of the pretty mouth. Already she displayed those feline graces which nothing, not even captivity, nor the side of her dreadful scaffold could lessen. The two queens, one at the dawn, the other in the midsummer of life, presented at this moment the utmost contrast. Catherine was an imposing queen an impenetrable widow, without other passion than that of power. Mary was a light-hearted, careless bride, making playthings of her triple crowns. One foreboded great evils, foreseeing the assassination of the Guises as the only means of suppressing enemies who were resolved to rise above the throne and the parliament, foreseeing also the bloodshed of a long and bitter struggle, while the other little anticipated her own judicial murder. A sudden and strange reflection calmed the mind of the Italian. That sorceress and Ruggiero both declare this reign is coming to an end. Difficulties will not last long, she thought. And so, strangely enough, an occult science forgotten in our day, that of astrology, supported Catherine at this moment, as it did, in fact, throughout her life, for as she witnessed the minute fulfilment of the prophecies of those who practised the art, her belief in it steadily increased. You are very gloomy, madame said Mary Stuart, taking from the hands of her waiting woman, Dale, a little cap, and placing the point of it on the parting of her hair, while two wings of rich lace surrounded the tufts of blonde curls which clustered on her temples. The pencil of many painters have so frequently represented this headdress that it is thought to have belonged exclusively to Mary, Queen of Scots, whereas it was really invented by Catherine de' Medici when she put on mourning for Henri the Second but she never knew how to wear it with the grace of her daughter-in-law, to whom it was becoming. This annoyance was not the least among the many which the Queen Mother cherished against the young Queen. "'Is the Queen reproving me?' said Catherine, turning to Mary. "'I owe you all respect, and should not dare to do so,' said the Scottish Queen, maliciously glancing at Dael. Placed between the rival queens, the favourite waiting woman stood rigid as an andiron. A smile of comprehension might have cost her her life. Can I be as gay as you, after losing the late king, and now beholding my son's kingdom about to burst into flames? Public affairs do not concern women, said Mary Stuart. Besides, my uncles are there. These words were, under the circumstances, like so many poisoned arrows. Let us look at our furs, madame, replied the Italian sarcastically. That will employ us in our legitimate female affairs, while your uncles decide those of the kingdom. Oh, but we will go the council, madame. We shall be more useful than you think. We, oui, said Catherine with an air of astonishment, but I do not understand the Latin myself. You think me very learned, cried Mary Stuart, laughing, but I assure you, madame, I study only to reach the level of the Medici and to learn how to cure the wounds of the kingdom. Catherine was silenced by this sharp thrust, which referred to the origin of the Medici, who had descended, some said, from a doctor of medicine, others from a rich druggist. She made no direct answer. Dial coloured as her mistress looked at her, asking for the applause that even queens demand from their inferiors, if there are no other spectators. Your charming speeches, madame, will unfortunately 
cure the wounds of neither church nor state said catherine at last with a calm and cold dignity the science of my fathers in that direction gave them thrones whereas if you continue to trifle in the midst of danger you are liable to lose yours it was at this moment that Ambroise Paré, the chief surgeon, scratched softly on the door, and Madame Dayel, opening it, admitted Christophe. End of section 8. Section 9 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor to Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A Drama in a Surcoat. The young reformer intended to study Catherine's face, all the while affecting a natural embarrassment at finding himself in such a place, but his proceedings were much hastened by the eagerness with which the younger queen darted to the cartons to see her circuit. Madame, said Christophe, addressing Catherine. He turned his back on the other queen and on Dayel, instantly profiting by the attention the two women were eager to bestow upon the furs to play a bold stroke. "'What do you want of me?' said Catherine, giving him a searching look. Christophe had put the treaty proposed by the Prince de Conde, the plan of the reformers and the detail of their forces in his bosom between his shirt and his cloth jacket, fording them, however, within the bill which Catherine owed to the furrier. "'Madame,' he said, "'my father is in horrible need of money, and if you will deign to cast your eyes over your bill—' Here he unfolded the paper and put the treaty on top of it. "'You will see that your majesty owes him six thousand crowns, have the goodness to take pity on us. See, madame, and he held the treaty out to her. Read it. The account dates from the time the late king came to the throne. Catherine was bewildered by the preamble of the treaty which met her eye, but she did not lose her head. She folded the paper quickly, admiring the audacity and presence of mind of the youth, and feeling sure that after performing such a masterly stroke, he would not fail to understand her. She therefore tapped him on the head with the folded paper, saying, It is very clumsy of you, my little friend, to present your bill before the furs. Learn to know women. You must never ask us to pay until the moment when we are satisfied. Is that traditional? said the young queen, turning to her mother-in-law, who made no reply. Ah, oh, madame, uh, pray excuse my father, said Christophe. If he had not had such need of money, you would not have had your furs at all. Your country is in arms, and there are so many dangers to run in getting here that nothing but our great distress would have brought me. No one but me was willing to risk them. The lad is new to his business, said Mary Stuart, smiling. It may not be useless for the understanding of this trifling, but very important scene, to remark that a surcoat was, the name implies, surcot, a species of close-fitting spencer, which women wore over their bodies and down to their thighs, defining the figure. This garment protected the back, chest, and throat from cold. These surcoats were lined with fur, a band of which, wide or narrow, as the case might be, bordered the outer material. Mary Stuart, as she tried the garment on, looked at herself in a large Venetian mirror to see the effect behind, this leaving her mother-in-law an opportunity to examine the papers, the bulk of which might have excited the young queen's suspicions had she noticed it. Never tell women of the dangers you have run when you have come out of them safe and sound, she said, turning to show herself to Christophe. Ah, madame, I have your bill too, he said, looking at her, with well-played simplicity. The young queen eyed him, but did not take the paper, and she noticed, though, without at the moment drawing any conclusions, that he had taken her bill from his pocket, whereas he had carried Queen Catherine's in his bosom. Neither did she find in the lad's eyes that glance of admiration which her presence invariably excited in all beholders but she was so engrossed by her surcoat that for the moment she did not ask herself the meaning of such indifference. "'Take the bill, Dale,' she said to her waiting woman. "'Give it to Monsieur de Versailles, Lamanie, and tell him from me to pay it.' "'Oh, madame,' said Christophe, "'if you do not ask the king or Monseigneur the Grand Master to sign me an order, your gracious word will have no effect.' "'Oh, rather more eager than becomes a subject, my friend,' said Mary Stuart. "'Do you not believe my royal word?' The king now appeared in silk stockings and trunk hose, the breeches of that period, but without his doublet and mantle. He had, however, a rich loose coat of velvet edged with miniver. "'Who is the wretch who dares to doubt your word?' he said, overhearing, in spite of his distance, his wife's last words. The door of the dressing-room was hidden by the royal bed. This room was afterwards called the Old Cabinet, to distinguish it from the fine cabinet of pictures which Henri the Third constructed 
at the farther end of the same suite of rooms, next to the Hall of the States General. It was in the old cabinet that Henri III hid the murderers when he sent for the Duc de Guise, while he himself remained hidden in the new cabinet during the murder, only emerging in time to see the overbearing subject for whom there were no longer prisons, tribunals, judges, nor even laws, draw his last breath. Were it not for these terrible circumstances, the historian of today could hardly trace the former occupation of these cabinets, now filled with soldiers. A quartermaster writes to his mistress on the very spot where the pensive Catherine once decided on her course between the parties. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Queen Mother, "'and I will see that you are paid. Commerce must live, and money is its backbone.' "'Go, my lad,' cried the young Queen, laughing. "'My august mother knows more than I do about commerce.' Catherine was about to leave the room without replying to this last taunt, but she remembered that her indifference to it might provoke suspicion, and she answered hastily, But you, my dear, understand the business of love. Then she descended to her own apartments. Put away these furs, Dale, and let us go to the council, monsieur, said Mary to the young king, enchanted with the opportunity of deciding in the absence of the queen mother so important a question as the lieutenant generalship of the kingdom. Mary Stuart took the king's arm. Dale went out before them, whispering to the pages, one of whom, it was young Teligny, who afterwards perished so miserably during the saint Bartholomew, cried out, The king! Hearing the words, the two soldiers of the guard presented arms, and the two pages went forward to the door of the council room, through the lane of courtiers, and that of the maids of honour of the two queens. All the members of the council then grouped themselves about the door of their chamber, which was not very far from the door to the staircase. The Grand Master, the Cardinal, and the Chancellor advanced to meet the young sovereign, who smiled to several of the maids of honour, and replied to the remarks of a few courtiers more privileged than the rest. But the Queen, evidently impatient, drew Francois II as quickly as possible toward the council chamber. When the sound of arquebuses dropping heavily on the floor had announced the entrance of the couple, the pages replaced their caps upon their heads and the private talk among the courtiers and the gravity of the matters now about to be discussed began again. They sent Chivani to fetch the connetable, but he has not come, said one. There is not a single prince of the blood present, said another. The Chancellor and Monsieur de Tonneau looked anxious, remarked a third. The Grand Master sent word to the keeper of the seals to be sure not to miss the council. Therefore you may be certain they will issue letters patent. Why does the Queen Mother stay in her apartments at such a time? They have cut out plenty of work for us, remarked Roslo, the Cardinal de Chatillon. In short, everybody had a word to say. Some went and came in and out of the great hall. Others hovered about the maids of honour of both queens, as if it might be possible to catch a few words through a wall three feet thick, or through the double doors draped on each side with heavy curtains. Seated at the upper end of a long table covered with blue velvet, which stood in the middle of the room, the king, near to whom the young queen was seated in an armchair, waited for his mother. Roi the secretary, was mending pens. The two cardinals, the grand master, the chancellor, the keeper of the seals, and all the rest of the council looked at the little king, wondering why he did not give them the usual order to sit down. The two Lorrain princes attributed the queen mother's absence to some trick of their niece, incited presently by a significant glance the audacious cardinal said to his majesty is it the king's good pleasure to bring the council without waiting for madame la ramayre francois the second without daring to answer directly said monsieur be seated the cardinal then explained succinctly the dangers of the situation this great political character who showed extraordinary ability under these pressing circumstances, led up to the question of the lieutenancy of the kingdom in the midst of the deepest silence. The young king doubtless felt the tyranny that was being exercised over him. He knew that his mother had a deep sense of the rights of the crown, and was fully aware of the danger that threatened his power. He therefore replied to a positive question addressed to him by the cardinal by saying, We will wait for the queen, my mother. Suddenly enlightened by the Queen Mother's delay, Mary Stuart recalled, in a flash of thought, three circumstances which now struck her vividly. First, the bulk of the papers presented to her mother-in-law, which she had noticed, absorbed as she was, for women who seems to see nothing is often a lynx. Next, the place where Christopher carried them to keep them separate from hers. 
Why so, she thought to herself, and thirdly, she remembered the cold, indifferent glance of the young man, which she suddenly attributed to the hatred of the reformers to a niece of the Guises. A voice cried to her, He may have been an emissary of the Huguenot. Obeying, like all excitable natures, her first impulse, she explained, I will go and fetch my mother myself. Then she left the room hurriedly, ran down the staircase to the amazement of the courtiers and the ladies of honour, entered her mother-in-law's apartments, crossed the guard-room, opened the door of the chamber with the caution of a thief, glided like a shadow over the carpet, saw no one, and bethought her that she should surely surprise the queen mother in that magnificent dressing-room which comes between the bedroom and the oratory. The arrangement of this oratory, to which the manners of that period gave a role in private life like that of the boudoirs of our day, can still be traced. By an almost inexplicable chance, when we consider the state of dilapidation into which the crown has allowed the chateau of Blois to fall, the admirable woodwork of Catherine's cabinet still exists, and in those delicately carved panels, persons interested in such things may still see traces of Italian splendour, and discover the secret hiding places employed by the Queen Mother. An exact description of these curious arrangements is necessary in order to give a clear understanding of what was now to happen. The woodwork of the oratory then consisted of about a hundred and eighty oblong panels, one hundred of which still exist, all presenting arabesques of different designs, evidently suggested by the most beautiful arabesques of Italy. The wood is live oak. The red tones, seen through the layer of whitewash put on to avert cholera, useless precaution, shows very plainly that the ground of the panels was formerly gilt. Certain portions of the design, visible where the wash has fallen away, seem to show that they once detached themselves from the gilded ground in colours, either blue or all red or green. The multitude of these panels shows an evident intention to foil a search, but even if this could be doubted, the concierge of the chateau, while devoting the memory of Catherine to the execration of the humanity of our day, shows at the base of these panels and close to the floor a rather heavy footboard which can be lifted and beneath which still remain the ingenious springs which move the panels. By pressing a knob thus hidden, the queen was able to open certain panels known to her alone, behind which, sunk in the wall, were hiding places, oblong like the panels, and more or less deep. It is difficult, even in these days of dilapidation, for the best-trained eye to detect which of those panels is thus hinged. But when the eye was distracted by colours and gilding, cleverly used to conceal the joints, we can readily conceive that to find one or two such panels among two hundred was almost an impossible thing. At the moment when Mary Stuart laid her hand on the somewhat complicated lock of the door of this oratory, the Queen Mother, who had just become convinced of the greatness of the Prince de Conde's plans, had touched the spring hidden beneath the footboard, and one of the mysterious panels had turned over on its hinges. Catherine was in the act of lifting the papers from the table to hide them, intending after that to secure the safety of the devoted messenger, who had brought them to her, when, hearing the sudden opening of the door, she at once knew that none but Queen Mary herself would dare thus to enter without announcement. "'You are lost,' she said to Christophe, perceiving that she could no longer put away the papers, nor close with sufficient rapidity the open panel, the secret of which was now betrayed. Christophe answered her with a glance that was sublime. Povero mio, said Catherine, before she looked at her daughter-in-law. Treason, madame, I hold the traitors at last, she cried. Send for the duke and the cardinal, and see that that man, pointing to Christophe, does not escape. In an instant the able woman had seen the necessity of sacrificing the poor youth. She could not hide him. It was impossible to save him. Eight days earlier it might have been done, but the Guises now knew of the plot. They must already possess the lists she held in her hand, and were evidently drawing the reformers into a trap. Thus, rejoiced to find in these adversaries the very spirit she desired them to have. Her policy now led her to make a merit of the discovery of their plot. These horrible calculations were made during the rapid moment while the young queen was opening the door. Mary Stuart stood dumb for an instant. The gay look left her eyes, which took on the acuteness that suspicion gives to the eyes of all, and which in hers became terrible from the suddenness of the change. She glanced from Christophe to the Queen Mother, and from the Queen Mother back to Christophe, her face expressing malignant doubt. Then she seized a bell, at the sound of which one of the Queen Mother's maids of honour came running in. Mademoiselle de Rouet, send for the captain of the guard, said Mary Stuart to the maid of honour, contrary to all etiquette, which was necessarily violated under the circumstances. While the young queen gave this order, Catherine looked intently at Christophe 
as if saying to him, Courage. The reformer understood, and replied by another glance which seemed to say, Sacrifice me, as they have sacrificed me. Rely on me, said Catherine by a gesture. Then she absorbed herself in the documents as her daughter-in-law turned to him. You belong to the reformed religion, inquired Mary Stuart of Christophe. Yes, madame, he answered. I was not mistaken, she murmured as she again noticed in the eyes of the young reformer the same cold glance in which dislike was hidden beneath an expression of humility. Pardéen suddenly appeared, sent by two Lorrain princes and by the king to escort the queens. The captain of the guard, called for by Mary Stuart, followed the young officer who was devoted to the Guises. Go and tell the king and the grand master and the cardinal from me to come here at once and say that I should not take the liberty of sending for them if something of the utmost importance had not occurred. Go, Padaya. As for you, Lewiston, keep guard of that traitor of a reformer, she said to the Scotchman in his mother tongue, pointing to Christophe. The young queen and queen mother maintained a total silence until the arrival of the king and princes. The moments that elapsed were terrible. Mary Stuart had betrayed to her mother-in-law in its fullest extent the part her uncles were inducing her to play, her constant and habitual distrust and espionage were now revealed, and her young conscience told her how dishonouring to a great queen was the work that she was doing. Catherine, on the other hand, had yielded out of fear. She was still afraid of being rightly understood, and she trembled for her future. Both women, one ashamed and angry, the other filled with hatred and yet calm, went to the embouchure of the window and leaned against the casing one to right, the other to left, silent. But their feelings were expressed in such speaking glances that they averted their eyes and with mutual artfulness gazed through the window at the sky. These two great and superior women had, at this crisis, no greater art of behaviour than the vulgarest of their sex. Perhaps it is always thus when circumstances arise which overwhelm the human being. There is inevitably a moment when genius itself feels its littleness in presence of great catastrophes. As for Christophe, he was like a man in the act of rolling down a precipice. Lewiston, the Scotch captain, listened to this silence, watching the son of the furrier and the two queens with soldierly curiosity. The entrance of the king and Mary Stuart's two uncles put an end to the painful situation. End of section 9《Section X of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott warmly. The sleep of Ox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: Martyrdom. The cardinal went straight to the queen mother. I hold the threads of the conspiracy of the heretics," said Catherine. "They have sent me this treaty and these documents by the hands of that child," she added. During the time that Catherine was explaining matters to the cardinal, Queen Mary whispered a few words to the Grand Master. "'What is this all about?' asked the young king, who was left alone in the midst of the violent clash of interests. "'The proofs of what I was telling your majesty have not been long in reaching us,' said the cardinal, who had grasped the papers. The Duc de Guise drew his brother aside without caring that he interrupted him and said in his ear, "'This makes me lieutenant-general.' without opposition. A shrewd glance was the cardinal's only answer, showing his brother that he fully understood the advantages to be gained from Catherine's false position. "'Who sent you here?' said the duke to Christophe. "'Chaudieu, the minister,' he replied. "'Young man, you lie,' said the soldier sharply. "'It was the Prince de Conde.' "'The Prince de Conde, monseigneur,' replied Christophe with a puzzled look. "'I never met him. I am studying law with Monsieur de Tu. I am his secretary, and he does not know that I belong to the reformed religion. I yielded only to the entreaties of a minister. Enough, exclaimed the cardinal. Call Monsieur de Robertet, he said to Lewiston, for this young scamp is slyer than an old statesman. He has managed to deceive my brother and me too. An hour ago I would have given him this sacrament without confession. You are not a child, Morbleu, said the duke, and we will treat you as a man. The heretics have attempted to beguile your august mother, said the cardinal, addressing the king and trying to draw him apart, to win him over to their ends. Alas, said the queen mother to her son, assuming a reproachful look and stopping the king at the moment when the cardinal was leading him into the oratory to subject him to his dangerous eloquence. You see the result of the situation in which I am. 
who think me irritated by the little influence that I have in public affairs. I, the mother of four princes of the House of Valois. The young king listened attentively. Mary Stuart, seeing the frown upon his brow, took his arm and led him away into the recess of the window, where she cajoled him with sweet speeches in a low voice, no doubt like those she had used that morning in their chamber. The two Guises read the documents given up to them by Catherine, finding that they contained information which their spies and Monsieur Boisgolon, the lieutenant of the Châtelet, had not obtained, were inclined to believe in the sincerity of Catherine de' Medici. Robert A. came and received certain secret orders relative to Christophe. The youthful instrument of the leaders of the Reformation was then led away by four soldiers of the Scottish Guard, who took him down the stairs and delivered him to Monsieur de Montresor, provost of the chateau. A terrible personage himself, accompanied by six of his men, conducted Christophe to the prison in the vaulted cellar of the tower, now in ruins, which the concierge of the Chateau de Blois shows you with the information that these were the dungeons. After such an event, the council could be only a formality. The king, the young queen, the grand master, and the cardinal returned to it, taking with them the vanquished Catherine, who said no word except to approve the measures proposed by the Guises. In spite of a slight opposition from the Chancellor Olivier, the only person present who said one word that expressed the independence to which his office bound him, the Duc de Guise was appointed Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. Robertet brought the required documents, showing a devotion which might be called collusion. The king, giving his arm to his mother, recrossed the Salle des Gardes, announcing to the court as he passed along that on the following day he should leave Blois for the chateau of Amboise. The latter residence had been abandoned since the time when Charles the Eighth accidentally killed himself by striking his head against the casing of a door on which he had ordered a carvings, supposing that he could enter without stopping below the scaffolding. Catherine, to mask the plans of the Guises, remarked aloud that they intended to complete the chateau of Amboise for the crown at the same time, that her own chateau of Chemonceau was finished, but no one was the dupe of that pretext, and all present awaited great events. After spending about two hours endeavouring to see where he was in the obscurity of the dungeon, Christophe ended by discovering that the place was sheathed in rough woodwork, thick enough to make the square hole into which he was put into both healthy and habitable. The door, like that of a pig pen, was so low that he stooped almost double on entering it. Beside this door was a heavy iron grating, opening upon a sort of corridor, which gave a little light and a little air. This arrangement, in all respects like that of the dungeons of Venice, showed plainly that the architecture of the Chateau of Blois belonged to the Venetian school, which during the Middle Ages sent so many builders into all parts of Europe. By tapping this species of pit above the woodwork, Christophe discovered that the walls which separated his cell to right and left from the adjoining ones were made of brick. Striking one of them to get an idea of its thickness, he was somewhat surprised to hear return blows given on the other side. "'Who are you?' said his neighbour, speaking to him through the corridor. "'I am Christophe Lecamon.' "'I,' replied the voice, "'I'm Captain Chaudieu, brother of the minister. I was taken prisoner tonight at Bougancy, but luckily... There is nothing against me. All is discovered, said Christophe. We are fortunate to be saved from the fray. We have three thousand men at the moment in the forests of the Vendemois, all determined men who mean to abduct the king and the queen mother during their journey. Happily, La Renaudie was cleverer than I. He managed to escape. You had only just left us when the Guise men surprised us. But I don't know La Renaudie. Pooh, my brother has told me all about it, said the captain. Hearing that, Christophe sat down upon his bench and made no further answer to the pretended captain, for he knew enough of the police to be aware how necessary it was to act with prudence in a prison. In the middle of the night, he saw the pale light of a lantern in the corridor. After hearing the ponderous locks of the iron door, which closed the cellar groan as they were turned, the provost himself had come to fetch Christophe. This attention to a prisoner who had been left in his dark dungeon for hours without food struck the poor lad as singular. One of the provost's men bound his hands with a rope and held him by the end of it until they reached one of the lower halls of the chateau of Louis the Twelfth, which was evidently the antechamber to the apartments of some important personage. The provost and his men bade him sit upon a bench, and the man then bound his feet as he had before bound his hands. On a sign from Monsieur de Montresor, the man left the room. Now listen to me, my friend 
the provost marshal, toying with the collar of the order, for late as the hour was, he was in full uniform. This little circumstance gave the young man several thoughts. He saw that all was not over. On the contrary, it was evidently neither to hang nor yet to condemn him that he was brought here. My friend, you may spare yourself cruel torture by telling me all you know of the understanding between Monsieur le Prince de Conde and Queen Catherine. Not only will no harm be done to you, but you shall enter the service of Monseigneur, the Lieutenant General of the Kingdom, who likes intelligent men, and on whom your honest face has produced a good impression. The Queen Mother is about to be sent back to Florence, and Monsieur de Conde will no doubt be brought to trial. Therefore, believe me, humble folks ought to attach themselves to the great men who are in power. Tell me all, and you will find your profit in it. Alas, monsieur, replied Christophe, I have nothing to tell. I told all I know to Monsieur de Guise in the Queen's chamber. Should you have persuaded me to put those papers under the eyes of the Queen Mother, assuring me that they concerned the peace of the kingdom? You have never seen the Prince de Conde? Never. Thereupon, Monsieur de Montresor left Christophe and went into the adjoining room, but the youth was not left long alone. The door through which he had been brought opened and gave entrance to several men who did not close it. Sounds that were far from reassuring were heard from the courtyard. Men were bringing wood and machinery, evidently intended for the punishment of the reformer's messenger. Christophe's anxiety soon had matter for reflection in the preparations which were made in the hall before his eyes. Two coarse and ill-dressed serving men obeyed the orders of a stout, squat, vigorous man, who cast upon Christophe, as he entered, the glance of a cannibal upon his victim. He looked him over and estimated him, measuring, like a connoisseur, the strength of his nerves, their power, and their endurance. The man was the executioner of Blois. Coming and going, his assistants brought in a mattress, several mallets and wooden wedges, also planks and other articles, the use of which was not plain nor their look comforting to the poor boy concerned in these preparations, whose blood now curdled in his veins, from a vague but most terrible apprehension. Two personages entered the hall at the moment when Monsieur de Montresor reappeared. Eh, hey, nothing, buddy, cried the provost marshal, to whom the newcomers bowed with great respect. Don't you know, he said, addressing the stout man and his two assistants, that Monseigneur the Cardinal thinks you already at work? Doctor, had the provost turning to one of the newcomers. This is the man, and he pointed to Christophe. The doctor went straight to the prisoner, unbound his hands, and struck him on the breast and back. Science now continued. In a serious manner, the truculent examination of the executioner's eye. During this time, a servant in the livery of the House of Guise brought in several armchairs, a table, and writing materials. Begin the proces verbal, said Monsieur de Montresor, motioning to the table, the second personage was dressed in black and was evidently a clerk. Then the provost went up to Christophe and said to him in a very gentle way, My friend, the Chancellor, having learned that you refuse to answer me in a satisfactory manner, decrees that you be put to the question ordinary and extraordinary. Is he in good health, and can he bear it? said the clerk to the doctor. Yes, replied the latter, who was one of the physicians of the House of Lorraine. In that case, Retire to the next room, we will send for you whenever we require your advice. The physician left the hall. His first terror having passed, Christophe rallied his courage. The hour of his martyrdom had come. Thenceforth, he looked with cold curiosity at the arrangements that were made by the executioner and his men. After hastily preparing a bed, the two assistants got ready certain appliances called boots, which consisted of several planks, between which each leg of the victim was placed. The legs thus placed were brought close together. The apparatus used by binders to press their volumes between two boards, which they fastened by cords, will give an exact idea of the manner in which each leg of the prisoner was bound. We can imagine the effect produced by the insertion of wooden wedges, driven in by hammers, between the planks of the two bound legs. The two sets of planks, of course, not yielding, being themselves bound together by ropes. These wedges were driven in on a line with the knees and the ankles. The choice of these places, where there is little flesh, and where consequently the wedge could only be forced in by crushing the bones, made this form of torture, called the question, horribly painful. In the ordinary question, four wedges were driven in, two at the knees, two at the ankles, but on the extraordinary question, the number was increased to eight, 
provided the doctor certified that the prisoner's vitality was not exhausted. At the time of which we write, the boots were also applied in the same manner to the hands and wrists, but being pressed for time, the cardinal, the lieutenant-general, and the chancellor spared Christophe at additional suffering. The protest verbal was begun. The provost dictated a few sentences as he walked up and down with a meditative air, asking Christophe his name, baptismal name, age, and profession. Then he inquired the name of the person from whom he had received the papers he had given to the queen. "'From the minister, Chaudieu,' answered Christophe. Uh, "'Where did he give them to you?' "'In Paris. In giving them to you, he must have told you whether the queen mother would receive you with pleasure.' "'He told me nothing of that kind,' said Christophe. "'He merely asked me to give them to Queen Catherine secretly.' You must have seen Chaudieu frequently, or you would not have known that you are going to Blois. The minister did not know from me that in carrying furs to the queen, I was also to ask on my father's behalf for the money the queen mother owes him, and I did not have time to ask the minister who had told him of it. But these papers, which are given to you without being sealed or enveloped, contained a treaty between the rebels and Queen Catherine. You must have seen that they exposed you to the punishment of all those who assist in a rebellion. Yes. The persons who persuaded you to this act of treason must have promised you rewards and the protection of the Queen Mother. I did it out of attachment to Chaudieu, the only person whom I saw in the matter. Do you persist in saying that you did not see the Prince de Conde? Yes. The Prince de Conde did not tell you that the Queen Mother was inclined to enter into his views against the Monsieur de Guise. I did not see him. Take care. One of your accomplices, Le Renaudie, has been arrested. Strong as he is, he was not able to bear the question, which will now be put to you. He confessed at last that both he and the Prince de Conde had an interview with you. If you wish to escape the torture of the question, I exhort you to tell me the simple truth. Perhaps you will thus obtain your full pardon. Christophe answered that he could not state a thing of which he had no knowledge, or give himself accomplices where he had none. Hearing these words, the provost marshal signed to the executioner and retired himself to the inner room. At that fatal sign, Christophe's brows contracted. His forehead worked with nervous convulsion as he prepared himself to suffer. His hands closed with such violence that the nails entered the flesh without his feeling them. Three men seized him, took him to the camp bed and laid him there letting his legs hang down, while the executioner fastened him to the rough bedstead with strong cords. The assistants bound his legs into the boots. Presently the cords were tightened, by means of a wrench, without the pressure causing much pain to the young reformer. When each leg was thus held, as it were, in a vice, the executioner grasped his hammer and picked up the wedges, looking ultimately at the victim and the clerk. "'Do you persist in your denial?' asked the clerk. I have told the truth, replied Christophe. Very well, go on, said the clerk, closing his eyes. The cords were tightened with great force. This was perhaps the most painful moment of the torture. The flesh being suddenly compressed, the blood rushed violently toward the breast. The poor boy could not restrain a dreadful cry and seemed about to faint. The doctor was called in. After feeling Christophe's pulse, he told the executioner to wait a quarter of an hour before driving the first wedge in let the action of the blood subside, and allow the victim to recover his full sensitiveness. Clark suggested, kindly, that if he could not bear this beginning of sufferings which he could not escape, it would be better to reveal all at once. But Christophe made no reply except to say, The king's tailor! The king's tailor! What do you mean by these words? asked the clerk. Seeing what torture I must bear, slowly hoping to gain time to rest. I call up all of my strength and try to increase it by thinking of the martyrdom borne by the king's tailor for the holy cause of the reformation when the question was applied to him in presence of madame la duchesse de valentinois and the king i shall try to be worthy of him while a physician exhorted the unfortunate lad not to force them to have recourse to more violent measures the cardinal and the duke impatient to know the result of the interrogations entered the hall and themselves asked christophe to speak the truth immediately the young man repeated the only confession he had allowed himself to make, which implicated no one but Chaudieu. The prince had made a sign, 
on which the executioner and his assistant seized their hammers, taking each a wedge which then they drove in between the joints, standing one to right, the other to left of their victim. The executioner's wedge was driven in at the knees, his assistants at the ankles. The eyes of all present fastened on those of Christophe, and he no doubt, excited by the presence of those great personages, shot forth such burning glances that they appeared to have all the brilliancy of flame. As the third and fourth wedges were driven in, a dreadful groan escaped him. When he saw the executioner take up the wedges for the extraordinary question, he said no word and made no sound, but his eyes took on so terrible a fixity that he cast upon the two great princes who were watching him a glance so penetrating that the duke and cardinal were forced to drop their eyes. Philippe le Bel met with the same resistance when the torture of the pendulum was applied in his presence to the Templars. That punishment consisted in striking the victim on the breast with one arm of the balance pole with which money is coined, its end being covered with a pad of leather. One of the knights thus tortured looked so intently at the king that Philippe could not detach his eyes from him. At the third blow, the king left the chamber on hearing the knights summon him to appear within a year before the judgment seat of God, as in fact he did. At the fifth blow, the first of the extraordinary question, Christophe said to the cardinal, Monseigneur, put an end to my torture. It is useless. The cardinal and the duke re-entered the adjoining hall, and Christophe distinctly heard the following words said by Queen Catherine. Go on. After all, he is only a heretic. She judged it prudent to be more stern to her accomplice than the executioners themselves. The sixth and seventh wedges were driven in without a word of complaint from Christophe. His face shone with extraordinary brilliancy, due no doubt to the excess of strength which his fanatic devotion gave him. Where else but in the feelings of the soul can we find the power necessary to bear such sufferings? Finally he smiled when he saw the executioner lifting the eighth and last wedge. The horrible torture had lasted by this time over an hour. The clerk now went to call a physician that he might decide whether the eighth wedge could be driven in without endangering the life of the victim. During this delay, the duke returned to look at Christophe. Ventre de Bichet, you are a fine fellow, said to him, bending down to whisper the words. I love brave men. Enter my service and you shall be rich and happy. My favours shall heal those wounded limbs. I do not propose to you any business. I will not ask you to return to your party and betrayed plans. There are always traitors enough for that and the proof is in the prisons of Blois. Tell me only on what terms are the Queen Mother and the Prince de Conde. I know nothing about it, Monseigneur, replied Christophe Lecamon. The physician came, examined the victim, and said that he could bear the eighth wedge. An insert it, said the cardinal. After all, as the Queen says, he is only a heretic, he added, looking at Christophe with a dreadful smile. At this moment, Catherine came with slow steps from the adjoining apartment and stood before Christophe, coldly observing him. Instantly, she was the object of the closest attention on the part of the two brothers, who watched alternately the queen and her accomplice. On this solemn test, the whole future of that ambitious woman depended. She felt the keenest admiration for Christophe, yet she gazed sternly at him. She hated the Guises, and she smiled upon them, Young man, said the queen, confess that you have seen the Prince de Conte, and you will be richly rewarded. Ah, what a business this is for your madam, cried Christophe, pitying her. The queen quivered. He insults me, she exclaimed. Why do you not hang him? she cried, turning to the two brothers, who stood thoughtful. What a woman, said the duke in a glance at his brother, consulting him by his eye and leading him to the window. I shall stay in France and be revenged upon them, thought the queen. Come, make him confess or let him die, she said aloud, addressing Montresor. The provost marshal turned away his eyes. The executioners were busy with the wedges. Catherine was free to cast one glance upon the martyr, unseen by others, which fell on Christophe like the dew. The eyes of the great queen seemed to him moist. Two tears were in them, but they did not fall. The wedges were driven. A plank was broken by the blow. Christophe gave one dreadful cry, after which he was silent. His face shone. He believed he was dying. Let him die, said the cardinal, echoing the queen's last words with a sort of irony. No, 
No, don't break that thread, he said to the provost. The duke and the cardinal consulted together in a low voice. What is to be done with him? asked the executioner. Send him to the prison at Orléans, said the duke, addressing Monsieur de Montresor, and don't hang him without my order. The extreme sensitiveness to which Christophe's internal organism had been brought, increased by a resistance which called into play every power of the human body, existed to the same degree in his senses. He alone heard the following words whispered by the Duc de Guise in the ear of his brother, the cardinal. I don't give up all hope of getting the truth out of that little fellow yet. When the princes had left the hall, the executioners unbound the legs of their victim roughly and without compassion. Did anyone ever see a criminal with such strength, said the chief executioner to his aides. The rascal bore that last wedge when he ought to have died. I have lost the price of his body. Unbind me gently. Don't make me suffer, friends, said poor Christophe. Some day I will reward you. Come, come, show some humanity, said the physician. Monseigneur esteems the young man and told me to look after him. I am going to Amboise with my assistants. Take care of him yourself, said the executioner brutally. Besides, here comes the jailer. The executioner departed, leaving Christophe in the hands of the soft-spoken doctor, who, by the aid of Christophe's future jailer, carried the poor boy to a bed, brought him some broth, helped him to swallow it, sat down beside him, felt his pulse, and tried to comfort him. You won't die of this, he said. You ought to feel great in inward comfort knowing that you have done your duty. The Queen Mother bids me take care of you, he added in a whisper. The Queen is very good, said Christophe, whose terrible sufferings had developed an extraordinary lucidity in his mind, and who, after enduring such unspeakable sufferings, was determined not to compromise the results of his devotion. But she might have spared me much agony by telling my persecutors herself the secrets that I know nothing about, instead of urging them on. Hearing that reply, the doctor took his cap and cloak, and left Christophe, rightly judging that he could worm nothing out of a man of that stamp. The jailer of Blois now ordered the poor lad to be carried away on a stretcher by four men, who took him to the prison in the town, where Christophe immediately fell into the deep sleep which they say comes to most mothers after the terrible pangs of childbirth. End of section 10《Section Eleven of Catherine de Medici by Honoured Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Wormley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Tumult at Amboise. By moving the court to the chateau of Amboise, the two Lorrain princes intended to set a trap for the leader of the party of the Reformation, the Prince de Conde, whom they had made the king summon to his presence. As vassal of the crown and prince of the blood, Conde was bound to obey the summons of his sovereign. Not to come to Amboise would constitute the crime of treason, but if he came, he put himself in the power of the crown. Now at this moment, as we have seen, the crown, the council, the court, and all their powers were solely in the hands of the Duc de Guise and the Cardinal de Lorraine. The Prince de Conde showed at this delicate crisis a presence of mind and a decision and willingness which made him the worthy exponent of Jean d'Albret and the valorous general of the reformers. He travelled at the rear of the conspirators as far as Vendome, intending to support them in case of their success. When the first uprising ended by a brief skirmish, in which the flower of the nobility beguiled by Calvin perished, the prince arrived with fifty noblemen at the chateau of Amboise on the very day after that fight, which the politic Guises termed the tumult of Amboise. As soon as the duke and cardinal heard of his coming, they sent the Marquis de saint andre with the escort of a hundred men to meet him. When the prince and his own escort reached the gates of the chateau, the marquis refused entrance to the latter. "'You must enter alone, monseigneur,' said the chancellor Olivier, the cardinal de Tourmont and Beargo, who were stationed outside of the portcullis. "'And why?' "'You are suspected of treason,' replied the chancellor. The prince, who saw that his suite were already surrounded by a troop with the Duc de Nemours, replied tranquilly, "'If that is so,' I will go alone to my cousin and prove to him my innocence. He dismounted, talked with perfect freedom of mind to Birago, the Cardinal de Tournon, the Chancellor and the Duc de Nemours, from whom he asked for particulars of the tumult. Monseigneur, replied the Duke, the rebels had confederates in Amboise. 
a captain named Lanou, had introduced armed men who opened the gate to them, through which they entered and made themselves masters of the town. That is, you say, you opened the mouth of a sack and they ran into it, replied the prince, looking at Barago. If they had been supported by the attack which Captain Chaudieu, the preacher's brother, was expected to make before the gate of the Bonhomme, they would have been completely successful, replied the Duc de Nemours. But in consequence of the position which the Duc de Guise ordered me to take up, Captain Chaudieu was obliged to turn my flank to avoid a fight. Go instead of arriving by night, like the rest, this rebel and his men got there by daybreak, by which time the king's troops had crushed the invaders of the town. And you had a reserve force to recover the gate which had been opened to them, said the prince. Monsieur le marquis de saint was there with five hundred men at arms. The prince gave the highest praise to these military arrangements. The lieutenant general must have been fully aware of the plans of the reformers to have acted as he did he said in conclusion. They were, no doubt, betrayed. The prince was treated with increasing harshness. After separating him from his escort at the gates, the cardinal and the chancellor barred his way when he reached the staircase which led to the apartments of the king. "'We are directed by his majesty, monseigneur, to take you to your own apartments,' they said. "'Am I then a prisoner?' "'If that were the king's intention, you would not be accompanied by a prince of the church.' nor by me, replied the Chancellor. These two personages escorted the prince to an apartment where guards of honour, so called, were given him. There he remained without seeing any one for some hours. From his window he looked down upon the Loire and the meadows of the beautiful valley stretching from Amboise to Tours. He was reflecting on the situation and asking himself whether the geezers would really dare anything against his person when the door of his chamber opened and Chicot, the king's fool, formerly a dependent of his own, entered the room. They told me you were in disgrace, said the prince. You'd never believe how virtuous the court has become since the death of Henri the Second. But the king loves a laugh. Which king, Francois the Second or Francois de Lorraine? You are not afraid of the duke if you talk in that way. He wouldn't punish me for it, monseigneur, replied Chico, laughing. To what do I owe the honour of this visit? Eh, hey, isn't it due to you on your return? I bring you my cap and bells. Can I go out? Toi? Suppose I do go out, what then? I should say that you are won again, by playing against the rules. Chicot, you alarm me. Are you sent here by someone who takes an interest in me? Yes, said Chico, nodding. He came nearer to the prince and made him understand that they were being watched and overheard. What have you to say to me? asked the prince de Conde in a low voice. Boldness alone can pull you out of this scrape. The message comes from the Queen Mother, replied the fool, slipping his words into the ear of the prince. Tell those who sent you, replied Conde, that I should not have entered this chateau if I had anything to reproach myself with, or to fear. I rush to report that lofty answer, cried the fool. Two hours later, that is about one o'clock in the afternoon, before the king's dinner, the Chancellor and Cardinal de Tournon came to fetch the prince, and present him to Francois the Second in the great gallery of the Chateau of Amboise, where the councils were held. There, before the whole court, Conde pretended surprise at the coldness with which the little king received him, and asked the reason of it. "'You are accused, cousin,' said the Queen Mother sternly, "'of taking part in the conspiracy of the reformers. You must prove yourself a faithful subject and a good Catholic, if you do not desire to draw upon your house the anger of the king.' Hearing these words said in the midst of the most profound silence by Catherine de Medici, on whose right arm the king was leaning, the Duc d'Orléans being on her left side, the Prince de Conde recalled three steps, laid his hand on his sword with a proud motion, and looked at all the persons who surrounded him. "'Those who said that, madame,' he cried in an angry voice, "'lied in their throats!' Then he flung his glove at the king's feet, saying, "'Let him who believes that calumny come forward the whole court trembled as the duc de guise was seen to leave his place but instead of picking up the glove he advanced to the intrepid hunchback if you desire a second in that duel monseigneur do me the honour to accept my services he said i will answer for you 
I know that you will show the reformers how mistaken they are if they think to have you for their leader. The prince was forced to take the hand of the lieutenant general of the kingdom. Chicot picked up the glove and returned it to Monsieur de Conde. Gazin, said the little king, you must draw your sword only for the defence of the kingdom. Come and dine. The cardinal de Lorrain, surprised at his brother's actions, drew him away to his own apartments. The prince de Conde, having escaped his apparent danger, offered his hand to Mary Stuart to lead her to the dining hall. But all the while that he made her flattering speeches, he pondered in his mind what trap the astute Balafre was setting for him. In vain he worked his brains, for it was not until Queen Mary herself betrayed it that he guessed the intention of the geezers. "'It would have been a great pity,' she said, laughing, "'if so clever a head had fallen. "'You must admit that my uncle has been generous.' "'Yes, madame, for my head is only useful on my shoulders, "'though one of them is notoriously higher than the other.' But is this really your uncle's generosity? Is he not getting the credit of it rather cheaply? Do you think it would be so easy to take off the head of a prince of the blood? All is not over yet, she said. We shall see what your conduct will be at the execution of the noblemen, your friends, by which the council has decided to make a great public display of severity. I shall do, said the prince, whatever the king does. The king, the queen mother, and myself, will be present at the execution, together with the whole court and the ambassadors. A fate, cried the prince sarcastically. Better than that, said the young queen, an act of faith, an act of the highest policy. To the question of forcing the noblemen of France to submit themselves to the crown and compelling them to give up their tastes for plots and factions. You will not break the belligerent timbers by the sure of danger, madame. Who risked the crown itself in the attempt, replied the prince. At the end of the dinner, which was gloomy enough, Queen Mary had the cruel boldness to turn the conversation openly upon the trial of the noblemen, on the charge of being seized with arms in their hands, and to speak of the necessity of making a great public show of execution. Madame, said Francois II, is it not enough for the King of France to know that so much brave blood is to flow? Must he make a triumph of it? No, sire but an example replied catherine it was the custom of your father and your grandfather to be present at the burning of heretics said mary stuart the kings reigned before me did as they thought best and i choose to do as i please said the little king philip the second remarked catherine who is certainly a great king lately postponed an auto de fe until he could return from the lower countries to valladolid what do you think, cousin? said the king to Prince de Conde. Sire, you can't avoid it, and the papal nuncio and all the ambassadors should be present. I shall go willingly as these ladies take part in the fete. Thus, the Prince de Conde, at a glance from Catherine de Medici, bravely chose his course. At the moment when the Prince de Conde was entering the Chateau d'Amboise, Lecamou, the furrier of the two queens, was also arriving from Paris brought to Amboise by the anxiety into which the news of the tumult had thrown both his family and that of Le Lallier. When the old man presented himself at the gate of the chateau, the captain of the guard, on hearing that he was the queen's furrier, said, My good man, if you want to be hanged, you have only to set foot in this courtyard. Hearing these words, the father, in despair, sat down on a stone at a little distance and waited until some retainer of the two queens or some servant woman might pass would give him news of his son. But he sat there all day without seeing anyone whom he knew. But he was forced at last to go down into the town, where he found, not without some difficulty, a lodging in a hostelry on the public square, where the executions took place. He was obliged to pay a pound a day to obtain a room with a window looking on the square. The next day he had the courage to watch, from his window, the execution of all the abettors of the rebellion who were condemned to be broken on the wheel or hanged as persons of little importance. He was happy indeed not to see his own son among the victims. When the execution was over, he went into the square and put himself in the way of the clerk of the court. After giving his name and slipping a purse full of crowns into the man's hand, he begged him to look on the records and see if the name of Christophe Legamou appeared in either of the three preceding executions. The clerk, touched by the manner and the tones of the despairing father, took him to his own house. 
After a careful search, he was able to give the old man an absolute assurance that Christophe was not among the persons thus far executed, nor among those that were to be put to death within a few days. "'My dear man,' said the clerk, "'Parliament has taken charge of the trial of the great lords implicated in the affair, and also that of the principal leaders. Perhaps your son is detained in the presence of the chateau, and he may be brought forth for the magnificent execution which their excellencies, the Duc de Guise and the Cardinal de Lorraine, are now preparing. The heads of twenty-seven barons, eleven counts, and seven marquises, in all fifty noblemen or leaders of the reformers, are to be cut off. As the judiciary of the county of Turin is quite distinct from that of the Parliament of Paris, if you are determined to know about your son, I advise you to go and see the Chancelier Olivier, who has the management of this great trial under orders from the Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. The poor old man, acting on this advice, went three times to see the Chancellor, standing in a long queue of persons waiting to ask mercy for their friends. But as the titled men were made to pass before the burghers, he was obliged to give up the hope of speaking to the Chancellor, though he saw him several times leave the house to go either to the chateau or to the committee appointed by the Parliament, passing each time between a double hedge of petitioners who were kept back by the guards to allow him free passage. It was a horrible scene of anguish and desolation, for among these petitioners were many women, wives, mothers, daughters, whole families in distress. Old Lecamus gave much gold to the footmen of the chateau, entreating them to put certain letters which he wrote into the hand either of Dael, Queen Mary's woman, or into that of the Queen Mother. But the footman took the poor man's money and carried the letters, according to the general order of the cardinal, to the provost marshal. By displaying such unheard of cruelty, the Guises knew that they incurred great dangers from revenge, and never did they take such precautions for their safety as they did while the court was at Amboise. Consequently, neither the greatest of all corruptors, gold, nor the incessant and active search which the old furrier instituted gave him the slightest gleam of light on the fate of his son. He went about the little town with a mournful air, watching the great preparations made by order of the cardinal for the dreadful show at which the Prince de Conde had agreed to be present. Public curiosity was stimulated from Paris to Nantes by the means adopted on this occasion. The execution was announced from all pulpits by the rectors of the churches, while at the same time they gave thanks for the victory of the king over the heretics. Three handsome balconies, the middle one more sumptuous than the other two, were built against the terrace of the Chateau of Amboise, at the foot of which the executions were appointed to take place. Around the open square, stagings were erected, and these were filled with an immense crowd of people attracted by the widespread notoriety given to this act of faith. Ten thousand persons camped in the adjoining field the night before the day on which the horrible spectacle was appointed to take place. The roofs on the houses were crowded with spectators, and windows were let at ten pounds apiece. An enormous sum in those days. The poor old father had engaged, as we may well believe, one of the best places from which the eye could take in the whole of the terrible scene, where so many men of noble blood were to perish on a vast scaffold covered with black cloth, erected in the middle of the open square. Thither, on the morning of the fatal day, they brought the Chouquet, the name given to the block on which the condemned man laid his head as he knelt before it. After this, they brought an armchair draped with black, for the clerk of the parliament, whose business it was to call up the condemned noblemen to their death and read their sentences. The whole square was guarded from early morning by the Scottish guard and the gendarme of the king's household, in order to keep back the crowd which threatened to fill it before the hour of the execution. After a solemn mass said at the chateau and in the churches of the town, the condemned lords, the last of the conspirators who were left alive, were led out. These gentlemen, some of whom had been put to the torture, were grouped at the foot of the scaffold and surrounded by monks who endeavoured to make them abjure the doctrines of Calvin. But not a single man listened to the words of the priests who had been appointed for this duty by the Cardinal of Lorraine, among whom the gentlemen no doubt feared to find spies of the Guises. In order to avoid the importunity of these antagonists, they chanted a psalm put into French verse by Clément Marot. Calvin, as we all know, had ordained that prayers to God should be in the language of each country as much from a principle of common sense as in opposition to the Roman worship. To those in the crowd who pitied these unfortunate gentlemen, 
It was a moving incident to hear them chant the following verse at the very moment when the king and court arrived and took their places. God be merciful unto us, and bless us, and show us the light of his countenance, and be merciful upon us. The eyes of all the reformers turned to their leader, the Ponce de Conde, who was placed intentionally between Queen Mary and the young Duke d'Orléans. Catherine de' Medici was beside the king, and the rest of the court were on her left. The papal nuncio stood behind Queen Mary. The lieutenant general of the kingdom, the Duc de Guise, was on horseback below the balcony, with two of the marshals of France and his staff captains. When the Ponce de Conde appeared, all the condemned noblemen who knew him bowed to him, and the brave hunchback returned their salutation. It would be hard, he remarked to the Duc d'Orléans, not to be civil to those about to die. The two other balconies were filled by invited guests, courtiers, and persons on duty about the court. In short, the whole company of the Chateau de Bois had come to Amboise to assist at this festival of death, precisely as it passed, a little later, from the pleasures of a court to the perils of war, with an easy facility which will always seem to foreigners one of the main supports of their policy toward France. The poor syndic of the furriers of Paris was filled with the keenest joy at not seeing his son among the fifty-seven gentlemen who were condemned to die. At a sign from the Duc de Guise, the clerk, seated on the scaffold, cried in a loud voice, Jean-Louis Alberic, Baron de René, guilty of heresy, of the crime of lese majesté and assault with armed hand against the person of the king. A tall, handsome man mounted the scaffold with a firm step, bowed to the people of the court, and said, That sentence lies. I took arms to deliver the king from his enemies, the Guises. He placed his head on the block, and it fell. The reformers chanted, Thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us. All silver as tried in the fire, so hast thou purified us. Robert, Jean, Rand, Brecmoi, Comte de Villemongis, guilty of the crime of lese majesté and of attempts against the person of the king, called the clerk. The count dipped his hands in the blood of the Baron de Ronay and said, May this blood Recoil upon those who are really guilty of those crimes. The reformers chanted, Thou broughtest us into the snare. Thou laidest afflictions upon our loins. Thou hast suffered our enemies to ride over us. You must admit, Monseigneur, said the Prince de Conde to the papal nuncio, that if these French gentlemen know how to conspire, they also know how to die. What? Hatred's brother, whispered the Duchess de Guise to the Cardinal de Lorraine. You are drawing down upon the heads of our children. The sight makes me sick, said the young king, turning pale with the flow of blood. Pooh, only rebels, replied Catherine de' Medici. The chance went on, the axe still fell. The sublime spectacle of men singing as they died and above all the impression produced upon the crowd by the progressive diminution of the chanting voices superseded the fear inspired by the Guises. Mercy! cried the people with one voice, when they heard the solitary chant of the last and most important of the great lords, who was saved to be the final victim. He alone remained at the foot of the steps by which the others had mounted the scaffold, and he chanted, Thou, O God, be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause thy face to shine upon us. Amen. Come, Duc de Nemours, said the Prince de Conde, weary of the part he was playing. You who have the credit of the skirmish, and who help to make these men prisoners, do you not feel under an obligation to ask mercy for this one? It is Gaston now, who they say received your word of honour that he should be courteously treated if he surrendered. Do you think I waited till he was here before trying to save him? said the Duc de Nemours, stung by the stern reproach. The clerk called slowly. No doubt, he was intentionally slow. Michel, Jean-Louis, Baron de Castelnau, Chalos, accused and convicted of the crime of lese majeste and of attempts against the person of the king. No, said Castelnau proudly, cannot be a crime to oppose 
tyranny and the projected usurpation of the Guises. The executioner, sick of his task, saw a movement in the king's gallery and fumbled with his axe. Monsieur le baron, he said, I do not want to execute you. A moment's delay may save you. All the people again cried, Mercy! Come, said the king, Mercy! For that poor Castelnau, who saved the life of the Duc d'Orléans. The cardinal intentionally misunderstood the king's speech. Go on, he motioned to the executioner, and the head of Castelnau fell at the very moment when the king had pronounced his pardon. Head, cardinal. Goes to your account, said Catherine de Medici. The day after this dreadful execution, the Prince de Conde returned to Navarre. The affair produced a great sensation in France and at all the foreign courts. The torrents of noble blood then shed caused such anguish to the Chancellor Olivier that his honourable mind, perceiving at last the real end and aim of the Guises disguised under a pretext of defending religion and the monarchy, felt itself no longer able to make head against them. Though he was their creature, he was not willing to sacrifice his duty and the throne to their ambition, and he withdrew from his post, suggesting L'Hôpital as his rightful successor. Catherine, hearing of Olivier's suggestion, immediately proposed Birago, and put much warmth into her request. The cardinal, knowing nothing of the letter written by L'Hôpital to the Queen Mother, and supposing him faithful to the house of Lorraine, pressed his appointment in opposition to that of Birago, and Catherine allowed herself to seem vanquished. From the moment that L'Hôpital entered upon his duties, he took measures against the Inquisition, which the Cardinal de Lorraine was desirous of introducing into France, and he thwarted so successfully all the anti-Gallican policy of the Guises, and proved himself so true a Frenchman, that in order to subdue him, he was exiled within three months of his appointment to the country seat of Vignet, near Etam. The worthy old Lecamus waited impatiently till the court left Amboise, being unable to find an opportunity to speak to either of the queens, and hoping to put himself in their way as the court advanced along the river bank on its return to Blois. He disguised himself as a pauper, at the risk of being taken for a spy, and by means of this travesty he mingled with the crowd of beggars which lined the roadway. After the departure of the Ponce de Conde and the execution of the leaders, the duke and cardinal thought they had sufficiently silenced the reformers to allow the queen mother a little more freedom. Lecamus knew that, instead of travelling in a litter, Catherine intended to go on horseback à la planchette, such was the name given to a sort of stirrup invented for or by the queen mother, who, having hurt her leg on some occasion, ordered a velvet-covered saddle with a plank on which she could place both feet by sitting sideways on the horse and passing one leg through a depression in the saddle. As the queen mother had very handsome legs, she was accused of inventing this method of riding in order to show them. The old Fourier fortunately found a moment when he could present himself to her sight, but the instant that the queen recognised him she gave signs of displeasure. Go away, my good man, and let no one see you speak to me said with anxiety get yourself elected deputy to the states general by the guild of your trade and act for me when the assembly convenes at orleans you shall know whom to trust in the matter of your son is he living asked the old man alas said the queen i hope so lacamu was obliged to return to paris with nothing better than those doubtful words and the secret of the approaching convocation of the states general thus confided to him by the queen mother End of section 11. Section 12 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Cosmo Ruggiero. Cardinal de Lorrain obtained within a few days of the events just related certain revelations as to the culpability of the court of Navarre. At Lyon and at Mouvain, in Dauphin, a body of reformers, under command of the most enterprising prince of the House of Bourbon, had endeavoured to incite the populace to rise. Such audacity, after the bloody executions at Amboise, astonished the Guises, who, no doubt to put an end to heresy by means known only to themselves, proposed a convocation of the States General at Orléans. Catherine de Medici, seeing a chance of support for her policy, in a national representation, joyfully agreed to it. The cardinal, bent on recovering his prey and degrading the house of Bourbon, convoked the states for the sole purpose of bringing the prince de Conde and the king of Navarre, Antoine de Bourbon, 
father of Henri the Fourth, to Orleans, intending to make use of Christophe to convict the prince of high treason if he succeeded in again getting him within the power of the crown. After two months had passed in the prison at Blois, Christophe was removed on a litter to a towboat which sailed up the Loire to Orleans, helped by a westerly wind. He arrived there in the evening and was taken at once to the celebrated tower of saint aignan The poor lad, who did not know what to think of his removal, had plenty of time to reflect on his conduct and on his future. He remained there two months, lying on his pallet, unable to move his legs. The bones of his joints were broken. When he asked for the help of a surgeon of the town, the jailer replied that the orders were so strict about him that he dared not allow anyone but himself even to bring him food. This severity, which placed him virtually in solitary confinement, amazed Christophe. To his mind, he ought either to be hanged or released, for he was, of course, entirely ignorant of the events at Amboise. In spite of certain secret advice sent to them by Catherine de Medici, the two chiefs of the House of Bourbon resolved to be present at the States General. So completely did the autograph letters they received from the king reassure them. And no sooner had the court established itself at Orleans than it learned, not without amazement, from Grosselot, Chancellor of Navarre, that the Bourbon princes had arrived. Francois II established himself in the house of the Chancellor of Navarre, who was also bailey, in other words, Chief Justice of the Law Courts at Orleans. This Grosselot, whose dual position was one of the singularities of this period, when reformers themselves owned abbeys, Grosselot, the Jacques Coeur of Orleans, one of the richest burghers of the day, did not bequeath his name to the house, for in after years it was called Le Bailéage, having been undoubtedly purchased either by the heirs of the crown or by the provinces as the proper place in which to hold the legal courts. This charming structure, built by the bourgeoisie of the 16th century, which completes so admirably the history of a period in which king, nobles, and burghers rivaled each other in the grace, elegance, and richness of their dwellings, witness Orangeville, the splendid manor house of Anjou, and the mansion called that of Hercules in Paris, exists to this day, though in a state to fill archaeologists and lovers of the Middle Ages with despair. It would be difficult, however, to go to Orléans and not take notice of the Hôtel de Ville, which stands on the Place de l'Estape. This Hôtel de Ville, or town hall, is the former Béliage, the mansion of Grosselot, the most illustrious house in Orléans, and the most neglected. The remains of this old building will still show to the eyes of an archaeologist how magnificent it was at a period when the houses of the burghers were commonly built of wood rather than stone, a period when noblemen alone had the right to build manors, a significant word. Having served as the dwelling of the king at a period when the court displayed much pomp and luxury, the Hotel Grosselot must have been the most splendid house in Orléans. It was here, on the Place de l'Estape, that the Guises and the king reviewed the burgher guard of which Monsieur de Cibier was made the commander during the sojourn of the king. At this period, the cathedral of Saint-Croix, afterward completed by Henri IV, who chose to give that proof of the sincerity of his conversion, was in process of erection, and its neighbourhood, heaped with stones and cumbered with piles of wood, was occupied by the Guises and their retainers, who were quartered in the bishop's palace, now destroyed. The town was under military discipline, and the measures taken by the Guises proved how little liberty they intended to leave to the states general, the members of which flocked into the town, raising the rents of the poorest lodgings. The court, the burgher militia, the nobility and the burghers themselves were all in a state of expectation, awaiting some coup d'etat, and they found themselves not mistaken when the princes of the blood arrived. As the Bourbon princes entered the king's chamber, the court saw with terror the insolent bearing of Cardinal de Lorraine. Determined to show his intentions openly, he remained covered while the king Navarre stood before him bareheaded. Catherine de Medici lowered her eyes, not to show the indignation that she felt. Then followed a solemn explanation between the young king and the two chiefs of the younger branch. It was short, for that the first words of the Prince de Conde, Francois II, interrupted him with threatening looks. Monsieur, my cousins, I suppose the affair of Amboise over. I find it is not so, and you are compelling us to regret the indulgence which we showed. It is not the king so much as the Monsieur de Guise who now address us, replied the Prince de Conde. Adieu, monsieur, cried the little king, crimson with anger. 
When he left the king's presence, the prince found his way barred in the great hall by two officers of the Scottish guard. As the captain of the French guard advanced, the prince drew a letter from his doublet and said to him, in presence of the whole court, Can you read this paper aloud to me, Monsieur de Maybrez? Willingly, said the French captain. My cousin, come in all security. I give you my royal word that you can do so. If you have need of a safe conduct, this letter will serve as one. Signed, said the shrewd and courageous hunchback. Signed, Francois, said May. No, no, exclaimed the prince. It is signed your good cousin and friend, Francois. Monsieur, he said to the Scotch guard, I follow you to the prison to which you are ordered on behalf of the king to conduct me. There is enough nobility in this hall to understand the matter. The profound silence which followed these words ought to have enlightened the Guises, but silence is that to which all princes listen least. Monseigneur, said the Cardinal de Tournon, who was following the prince, you know well that since the affair at Amboise, you have made certain attempts both at Lyon and at Morvin in Dauphin against the royal authority, of which the king had no knowledge when he wrote to you in those terms. Hoxters, cried the prince, laughing. You have made a public declaration against the mass and in favour of heresy. We are masters in Navarre, said the prince. You mean to say in Bern, but you owe homage to the crown, replied President de Thou. Ha! You hear, President, cried the prince sarcastically. Is the old parliament with you? So saying, he cast a look of contempt upon the cardinal and left the hall. He saw plainly enough that they meant to have his head. The next day, when Monsieur de Thou, de Viol, d'Espes, the procureur general Baudin, and the chief clerk of the court de Delay entered his presence, he kept them standing and expressed his regrets to see them charged with a duty which did not belong to them. Then he said to the clerk, Write down what I say, and dictated as follows. I, Louis de Bourbon, Prince de Conde, peer of the kingdom, Marquis de Conti, Comte de Suisson, Prince of the blood of France, do declare that I formally refuse to recognize any commission appointed to Twiny, because in my quality and in virtue of the privilege appertaining to all members of the royal house, I can only be accused, tried, and judged by the parliament, of peers, both chambers assembled the king being seated on his bed of justice. "'You ought to know that gentleman better than others,' he added, "'and this reply is all that you will get from me. For the rest, I trust in God and my right.' The magistrates continued to address him, notwithstanding his obstinate silence. The king of Navarre was left at liberty, but closely watched. His prison was larger than that of the prince, and this was the only real difference in the position of the two brothers the intention being that their heads should fall together. Christophe was therefore kept in the strictest solitary confinement by order of the cardinal and the lieutenant-general of the kingdom, for no other purpose than to give the judge proof of the culpability of the Prince de Conde. The letters seized at Lassagne, the prince's secretary, though intelligible to statesmen, were not sufficiently plain proof for judges. The cardinal intended to confront the prince and Christophe by accident, and it was not without intention that the young reformer was placed in one of the lower rooms in the tower of saint Aignan, with a window looking on the prison yard. Each time that Christophe was brought before the magistrates and subjected to a close examination, he sheltered himself behind a total and complete denial, which prolonged his trial until after the opening of the States General. Old Lecamou, who by that time had got himself elected deputy of the Tier Etat by the burghers of Paris, arrived at Orléans a few days after the arrest of the Prince de Conde. This news, which reached him at Etampes, redoubled his anxiety. He fully understood. He, who alone knew of Christophe's interview with the prince under the bridge near his own house, that his son's fate was closely bound up with that of the leader of the reformed party. He therefore determined to study the dark tangle of interests which were struggling together at court in order to discover some means of rescuing his son. It was useless to think of Queen Catherine, who refused to see her furrier. No one about the court 
whom he was able to address, could give him any satisfactory information about Christophe, and he fell at last into a state of such utter despair that he was on the verge of appealing to the cardinal himself when he learned that Monsieur de Thou, and this was the great stain upon that good man's life, had consented to be one of the judges of the Ponce de Conde. The old furrier went at once to see him, and learned at last that Christophe was still living, though a prisoner. Turion, the glover, to whom La Renaudie sent Christophe on his way to Blois, had offered a room in his house to the Sieur Le Camus for the whole time of his stay in Orléans during his sittings of the States General. The glover believed the furrier to be, like himself, secretly attached to the reformed religion, but he soon saw that a father who fears for the life of his child pays no heed to shades of religious opinion, but flings himself prone upon the bosom of God without caring what insignia men give to him. The poor old man, repulsed in all his efforts, wandered like one bewildered through the streets. Contrary to his expectations, his money avails him nothing. Monsieur de Thou had warned him that if he bribed any servant of the House of Guise, he would merely lose his money, for the Duke and Cardinal allowed nothing that related to Christophe to transpire. De Thou, whose fame is somewhat tarnished by the part he played at this crisis, endeavoured to give some hope to the poor father, but he trembled so much himself for the fate of his godson that his attempts at conciliation only alarmed the old man still more. Lecamus roamed the streets. In three months he had shrunk visibly. His only hope now lay in the warm friendship which for so many years had bound him to the Hippocrates of the sixteenth century. Ambroise Paré tried to say a word to Queen Mary on leaving the chamber of the king, who was then indisposed, but no sooner had he named Christophe than the daughter of the Stuarts, nervous at the prospect of her fate should any evil happen to the king, and believing that the reformers were attempting to poison him, cried out, If my uncles had only listened to me, that fanatic would have been hanged already. The evening on which this fatal answer was repeated to old Lecamu by his friend Pare on the Place de l'Estape, he returned home half dead to his own chamber, refusing to eat any supper. Turion, uneasy about him, went up to his room and found him in tears. The aged eyes showed the inflamed red lining of their lids, so that the glover fancied for a moment that he was weeping tears of blood. Comfort yourself, father, cried the reformer. The burghers of Orléans are furious to see their city treated as though it were taken by assault and guarded by the soldiers of Monsieur de Sibierre. If the life of the Prince de Conde is in any real danger, we will soon demolish the tower of saint agnan The whole town is on the side of the reformers, and it will rise in rebellion, and you may be sure of that. But even if they hang the guises, it will not give me back my son, said the wretched father. At that instant, Someone rapped cautiously on Turion's outer door, and the glover went downstairs to open it himself. The night was dark. In these troubling times, the masters of all households took minute precautions. Turion looked through the peepholes cut in the door and saw a stranger. His accent indicated an Italian. The man, who was dressed in black, asked to speak with Lecamou on matters of business, and Turion admitted him. When the furrier caught sight of his visitor, he shuddered violently but the stranger managed, unseen by Turion, to lay his fingers on his lips. Lecamus, understanding the gesture, said immediately, You have come, I suppose, to offer furs. Si, said the Italian, discreetly. This personage was no other than the famous Ruggiero, astrologer to the Queen Mother. Turion went below to his own apartment, feeling convinced that he was one too many in that of his guest. Lecamus talk without danger of being overheard, said the cautious Florentine. We ought to be in the open fields for that, replied Lecamus. But we are not allowed to leave the town. You know the severity with which the gates are guarded. No one can leave Orléans without a pass for Monsieur de Sibier, he added. Not even I, who am a member of the States General. Complaint is to be made at tomorrow's session at this restriction of liberty. What like a mole? Don't let your paws be seen in anything, no matter what, said the wary Italian. Tomorrow will, no doubt, prove a decisive day. 
judging by my observations, you may perhaps recover your son tomorrow, or the day after. May God hear you, you who are thought to traffic with the devil. Come to my place, said the astrologer, smiling. I live in the tower of Sieur Touché de Beauvais, the lieutenant of the Béliage, whose daughter the little Duc d'Orléans has taken such a fancy to. It is there that I observe the planets. I have drawn the girl's horoscope, and it says that she will become a great lady and be beloved by a king. The lieutenant, her father, is a clever man. He loves science, and the queen sent me to lodge with him. He has had the sense to be a rabid geesist while awaiting the reign of Charles the Ninth. The furrier and the astrologer reached the house of the Sieur de Beauvais without being met or even seen, but in case Lecamus's visit should be discovered, the Florentine intended to give a pretext of an astrological consultation on his son's fate. When they were safely at the top of the tower, where the astrologer did his work, Lecamus said to him, Is my son really living? Yes, he still lives, replied Ruggiero. And the question now is how to save him. Remember this, seller of skins. I would not give two farthings for yours if ever in all your life a single syllable should escape you of what I am about to say. That is a useless caution, my friend. I have been furrier to the court since the time of the late Louis the Twelfth. This is the fourth reign that I have seen. And you may soon see the fifth, remarked Ruggiero. What do you know about my son? He has been put to the question. Poor boy, said the old man, raising his eyes to heaven. His knees and ankles were a bit injured, but he has won a royal protection which will extend over his whole life, said the Florentine, hastily seeing the terror of the poor father. Your little Christophe has done a service to our great queen, Catherine. If we manage to pull him out of the claws of the Guises, you will see him some day councillor to the Parliament. Any man would gladly have his bones cracked three times over to stand so high in the good graces of this dear sovereign. The grand and noble genius who will triumph in the end of all obstacles. I have drawn the horoscope of the Duc de Guise. He will be killed within a year. Well, so Christophe saw the Prince de Conde. You read the future, or do know the past, said the furrier. My good man, I am not questioning you. I am telling you a fact. Now, if your son will tomorrow be placed in the prince's way as he passes, should recognize him, or if the prince should recognize your son, the head of Monsieur de Conte will fall. God knows what will become of his accomplice. However, don't be alarmed. Neither your son nor the prince will die. I have drawn their horoscope. They will live, but I do not know in what way they will get out of this affair. Without distrusting the certainty of my calculations, we must do something to bring about the results. Tomorrow the prince will receive from sure hands a prayer book in which we convey the information to him. God grant that your son be cautious, for him we cannot warn. A single glance of recognition cost the prince's life. Therefore, although the Queen Mother has every reason to trust in Christos faithfulness, they've put it to a cruel test, cried the furrier. Don't speak so. Do you think the Queen Mother is on a bed of roses? She is taking measures as if the Guises had already decided on the death of the prince. Right she is, a wise and prudent queen. Now listen to me. She counts on you. Help her in all things. You have some influence with the tiers etat, where you represent the body of the guilds of Paris. Although the Guisards may promise you to set your son at liberty, try to fool them and maintain the independence of the guilds. Demand the queen mother as regent, the king Navarre, will publicly accept the proposal at the session of the States General. But the king, the king will die, replied Ruggiero. I have read his horoscope, but the queen mother requires you to do for her 
at the States General is a very simple thing, but it is a far greater service which he asks of you. You helped Ambroise Paré in his studies. You are his friend. Ambroise now loves the Duc de Guise more than he loves me, and he is right, for he owes his place to him. Besides, he is faithful to the king, though he inclines to the reformed religion. He will never do anything against his duty. Curse his honest men, cried the Florentine. Ambroise boasted this evening that he could bring the little king safely through, for he is really ill. If the king recovers his health, the geese is tried, the princes die, the house of Bourbon becomes extinct. We shall return to Florence, your son will be hanged, and the Lorraines will easily get the better of the other sons of France. Great God, exclaimed Lecamus, don't cry out in that way. It is like a burgher who knows nothing of the court. But God wants to Ambroise, and find out from him what he intends to do to save the king's life. If there is anything decided on, come back to me at once and tell me the treatment in which he has such faith. But, said Lecamu, obey blindly, my dear friend, otherwise you will get your mind bewildered. It's right, thought the furrier, I had better not no more. And he went at once in search of the king's surgeon, who lived in a hostelry in the Place de Martois. Catherine de' Medici was at this moment in a political extremity very much like that in which poor Christophe had seen her at Bois. Though she had been in a way trained by the struggle, though she had exercised her lofty intellect by the lessons of that first defeat, her present situation, while nearly the same, had become more critical, more perilous than it was at Amboise. Events, like the woman herself, had magnified. Though she seemed to be in full accordance with the Guises, Catherine held in her hand the threads of a wisely planned conspiracy against her terrible associates, and was only awaiting a propitious moment to throw off the mask. The cardinal had just obtained the positive certainty that Catherine was deceiving him. Her subtle Italian spirit felt that the younger branch was the best hindrance she could offer to the ambition of the duke and the cardinal, and, in spite of the advice of the Duke Gondis, who urged her to let the Guises wreak their vengeance on the Bourbons, she defeated the scheme, concocted by them with Spain, to seize the province of Bern, by warning Jean d'Albray, Queen of Navarre, of that threatened danger. As this state secret was known only to them and to the Queen Mother, the Guises knew, of course, who had betrayed it, and resolved to send her back to Florence. But in order to make themselves perfectly sure of what they called her treason against, the state, the state being the house of Lorrain, the duke and cardinal confided to her their intention of getting rid of the king of Navarre. The precautions instantly taken by Antoine proved conclusively to the two brothers that the secrets known only to them and the queen mother had been divulged by the latter. The cardinal instantly taxed her with treachery in presence of Francois II, threatening her with an edict of banishment in case of future indiscretion which might, as they said, put the kingdom in danger. Catherine, who then felt herself in the utmost peril, acted in the spirit of a great king, giving proof of her high capacity. It must be added, however, that she was ably seconded by her friends. L'Hopital managed to send her a note, written in the following terms. Do not allow a prince of the blood to be put to death by a committee, or you will yourself be carried off in some way. Catherine sent Birago to Vignet to tell the Chancellor, L'Hopital, to come to Orléans at once, in spite of his being in disgrace. Birago returned the very night of which we are writing, and was now a few miles from Orléans with L'Hopital, who heartily avowed himself for the Queen Mother. Chivani, whose fidelity was very justly suspected by the Guises, had escaped from Orléans and reached Ecoa in ten hours by a forced march, which almost cost him his life. There he told the Connetable de Montmorency of the peril of his nephew, the Ponce de Conde, and the audacious hopes of the Guises. The Connetable, furious at the thought that the prince's life hung upon that of Francois II, started for Orléans at once with a hundred noblemen and fifteen hundred cavalry. In order to take the Monsieur de Guise by surprise, he avoided Paris and came direct from Ecouen to Corbeil, and Corbeil to Pithiviers, 
by the valley of the Esson. Soldier against soldier, we must leave no chances, he said on the occasion of this bold march. And de Montmorency, who had saved France at the time of the invasion of Provence by Charles V, and the Duc de Guise, who had stopped the second invasion by the Emperor at Metz, were in truth the two great warriors of France at this period. Catherine had awaited this precise moment to rouse the inextinguishable hatred of the Connetable, whose disgrace and banishment were the work of the Guises. The Marquis de Simise, however, who commanded at Guillain, being made aware of the large force approaching under command of the Connetable, jumped on his horse, hoping to reach Orléans in time to warn the Duke and Cardinal. Sure that the Connetable would come to the rescue of his nephew, and full of confidence in the Chancelier L'Hôpital's devotion to the royal cause, the Queen Mother revived the hopes and the boldness of the reformed party. The Colignies and the friends of the House of Bourbon, aware of their danger, now made common cause with the adherents of the Queen Mother. A coalition between these opposing interests, attacked by a common enemy, formed itself silently in the States General, where it soon became a question of appointing Catherine as regent in case the king should die. Catherine, whose faith in astrology was much greater than her faith in the church, now dared all against her oppressors, seeing that her son was ill and apparently dying at the expiration of the time assigned to his life by the famous sorceress, whom Nostradamus had brought to her at the Chateau of Chaumont. End of section 12. Chapter 13. Of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven Amboise Pare. Some days before the terrible end of the reign of Francois the Second, the king insisted on sailing down the Loire, wishing not to be in the town of Orleans on the day when the Ponce de Conde was executed. Having yielded the head of the prince to the Cardinal de Lorraine, who was equally in dread of a rebellion among the townspeople and of the prayers and supplications of the Princess de Conde. At the moment of embarkation, one of the cold winds which sweep along the Loire at the beginning of winter gave him so sharp an earache that he was obliged to return to his apartments. There he took to his bed, not leaving it until he died. In contradiction of the doctors, who, with the exception of Chapelain, were his enemies, Ambroise Paré insisted that an abscess was formed in the king's head and that unless an issue were given to it, the danger of death would increase daily. Notwithstanding the lateness of the hour and the curfew law, which was sternly enforced in Orléans at this time, practically in a state of siege, Paré's lamp shone from his window, and he was deep in study when Lecamu called to him from below. Recognising the voice of his old friend, Paré ordered that he should be admitted. "'You take no rest, Amboise, while saving the lives of others,' You are wasting your own, said the Fourier as he entered, looking at the surgeon who sat with open books and scattered instruments before the head of a dead man, lately buried and now disinterred, in which he had cut an opening. It is a matter of saving the king's life. Are you sure of doing it, Amboise? cried the old man, trembling. As sure as I am of my own existence, the king, my old friend, has a morbid ulcer pressing on his brain which will presently suffice. It, if no vent is given to it, and the danger is imminent. But by boring the skull, I expect to release the pus and clear the head. I have already performed this operation three times. It was invented by a Piedmontese, but I had the honour to perfect it. The first operation I performed was at the siege of Metz, on Monsieur de Pierre, whom I cured, who was afterwards all the more intelligent in consequence. He was an abscess caused by the blow of an arquebus. The second was on the head of a pauper, on whom I wanted to prove the value of the audacious operation Monsieur de Pienne had allowed me to perform. The third I did in Paris on a gentleman who is now entirely recovered. Trepanin, that is the name given to the operation, is very little known. Patients refuse it partly because of the imperfection of the instruments, but I have at last improved them. I am practicing now on this skull, that I may be sure of not failing tomorrow, when I operate on the head of the king. 
You ought indeed to be very sure you are right, for your own head would be in danger in case. I'd wager my life I can cure him, replied Amboise with the conviction of a man of genius. Ah, my old friend, where's the danger of boring into a skull with proper precautions? That is what soldiers do in battle every day of their lives without taking any precautions. My son, said the burgher boldly, do you know that to save the king is to ruin France? Do you know that this instrument of yours will place the crown of the Valois on the head of the Lorrain who calls himself the heir of Chalamar? Do you know that surgery and policy are at this moment sternly opposed to each other? Yes, the triumph of your genius will be the death of your religion. If the Guises gain the regency, the blood of the reformers will flow like water. Be a greater citizen than you are a surgeon. Oversleep yourself tomorrow morning and leave a free field to other doctors who, if they cannot cure the king, will cure France. I, exclaimed Paris, I leave a man to die when I can cure him. No, no, were I to hang as an abettor of Calvin, I shall go early to court. Do you not feel that the first and only reward I shall ask will be the life of your Christophe? Surely at such a moment Queen Mary can deny me nothing. Alas, my friend, returned Lacamon, the little king has refused the pardon of the prince de Conde to the princess. Do not kill your religion by saving the life of a man who ought to die. Do not you meddle with God's ordering of the future, cried Paré. Honest men can have but one motto, fais ce que doit, advéant que pourra. Do thy duty, come what will. That is what I did at the siege of Calais when I put my foot on the face of the Duc de Guise. I ran the risk of being strangled by his friends and his servants. But today I am surgeon to the king. Moreover, I am of the reformed religion, and yet the Guises are my friends. I shall save the king, cried the surgeon, with the sacred enthusiasm of a conviction bestowed by genius. And God will save France. A knock was heard on the street door, and presently one of Paré's servants gave a paper to Lecamu, who read aloud these terrifying words. A scaffold is being erected at the convent of the Recollet. The Prince de Conde will be beheaded there tomorrow. Amboise and Lecamu looked at each other with an expression of the deepest horror. I will go and see for myself, said the furet. No sooner was he in the open street than Ruggiero took his arm and asked by what means Amboise Paré proposed to save the king. Fearing some trickery, the old man, instead of answering, replied that he wished to go and see the scaffold. The astrologer accompanied him to the Place des Récollets, and there, truly enough, they found the carpenters putting up the horrible framework by torchlight. "'Hey, my friend,' said Lecamo to one of the men, "'what are you doing here at this time of night?' "'We are preparing for the hanging of our dicks, as the bloodletting at Amboise didn't cure them,' said a young Récollet, who was superintending the work. "'Monseigneur,' The cardinal is very right, said Ruggiero, prudently, but in my country we do better. What do you do? said the young priest. We burn them. Lecamo was forced to lean on the astrologer's arm, for his legs gave way beneath him. He thought it probable that on the morrow his son would hang from one of those gibbets. The poor old man was thrust between two sciences, astrology and surgery, both of which promised him the life of his son, for whom in all probability that scaffold was now erecting. In the trouble and distress of his mind, the Florentine was able to knead him like dough. Well, my worthy dealer in Minerva, what do you say now to the Lorraine jokes? whispered Ruggiero. Alas, you know I would give my skin if that of my son were safe and sound. That is talking like your trade. But explain to me the operation which Amboise means to perform upon the king, and in return I will promise you the life of your son. Faithfully, exclaimed the old furrier. Shall I swear it to you? said Ruggiero. Thereupon the poor old man repeated his conversation with Amboise Paré to the astrologer, who, the moment that the secret of the great surgeon was divulged to him, left the poor father abruptly in the street in utter despair. What the devil does he mean, that miscreant? cried Lecamo as he watched Ruggiero hurrying with rapid steps to the Place de l'Estape. Lecamo was ignorant of the terrible scene that was taking place around the royal bed, where the imminent danger of the king's death and the consequent loss of power to the Guises had caused the hasty erection of the scaffold for the Prince de Conde, whose sentence had been pronounced, as it were, by default, the execution of it being delayed by the king's illness. 
Absolutely no one but the persons on duty were in the halls, staircases, and courtyard of the royal residence, le Béliage. The crowd of the courtiers were flocking to the house of the king of Navarre, on whom the regency would devolve on the death of the king, according to the laws of the kingdom. The French nobility, alarmed by the audacity of the Guises, felt the need of rallying around the chief of the younger branch, when, ignorant of the queen mother's Italian policy, they saw her the apparent slave of the duke and cardinal. Antoine de Bourbon, faithful to his secret agreement with Catherine, was bound not to renounce the regency in her favour until the States-General had declared for it. The solitude in which the king's house was left had a powerful effect on the mind of the Duc de Guise when, on his return from an inspection made by way of precaution through the city, he found no one there but the friends who were attached exclusively to his own fortunes. The chamber on which was the king's bed adjoined the great hall of the Belliage. It was at that period panelled in oak. The ceiling, composed of long narrow boards, carefully joined and painted, was covered with blue arabesques on a gold ground, a part of which being torn down about fifty years ago, instantly purchased by a lover of antiquities. This room, hung with tapestry, the floor being covered with a carpet, was so dark and gloomy that the torches threw scarcely any light. The fast four-post bedstead with its silken curtains was like a tomb. Beside her husband, close to his pillow, sat Mary Stuart, and near her the Cardinal de Lorraine. Catherine was seated in a chair at a little distance. The famous Jean Chapelain, the physician on duty, who was afterwards chief physician to Charles the Ninth, was standing before the fireplace. The deepest silence reigned. The young king, pale and shrunken, lay as if buried in his sheets, his pinched little face scarcely showing on the pillow. The Duchess de Guise, sitting on a stool, attended Queen Mary, while on the other side, near Catherine, in the recess of a window, Madame de Fiesque stood watching the gestures and looks of the Queen Mother, for she knew the dangers of her position. In the hall, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour, Monsieur de Cipierre, governor of the Duc d'Orléans, and now appointed governor of the town, occupied one corner of the fireplace with the two Gondis. Cardinal de Tournon, who in this crisis espoused the interests of the Queen Mother on finding himself treated as an inferior by the Cardinal de Lorraine, of whom he was certainly the ecclesiastical equal, talked in a low voice to the Gondis. The marshals de Villeville and Saint-André and the keeper of the seals, who presided at the States General, were talking together in a whisper of the dangers to which the Guises were exposed. The lieutenant general of the kingdom crossed the room on his entrance casting a rapid glance about him, and bowed to the Duc d'Orléans, whom he saw there. Monseigneur, he said, this will teach you to know men. The Catholic nobility of the kingdom have gone to pay court to a heretic prince, believing that the States General will give the regency to the heirs of a traitor who long detained in prison your illustrious grandfather. Then, having said these words, which were destined to plough a furrow in the heart of the young prince, he passed into the bedroom, where the king was not so much asleep as plunged in a heavy torpor. The Duc de Guise was usually able to correct the sinister aspect of his scarred face by an affable and pleasing manner, but on this occasion, when he saw the instrument of his power breaking in his very hands, he was unable to force a smile. The cardinal, whose civil courage was equal to his brother's military daring, advanced a few steps to meet him. Robert thinks that little Pinard is sold to the Queen Mother, he whispered, leading the Duke into the hall. They are using him to work upon the members of the States General. Well, what does it signify if we are betrayed by a secretary when all else betrays us? cried the Lieutenant General. The town is for the Reformation, and we are on the eve of a revolt. Yes, the wasps are discontented, he continued, giving the Orleans people their nickname. And if Paris does not save the king, we shall have a terrible uprising. Before long, we should be forced to besiege Orléans, which is nothing but a bog of Huguenot. I have been watching that Italian woman, said the cardinal, as she sits there with absolute insensibility. She is watching and waiting, God forgive her, for the death of her son. And I ask myself whether we should not do a wise thing to arrest her at once, and also the king of Navarre. It is already more than we want upon our hands to have the Prince de Conde in prison, replied the Duke. The sound of a horseman riding in haste to the gate of the Bailliage echoed through the hall. 
the duke and cardinal went to the window and by the light of the torches which were in the portico the duke recognized on the rider's hat the famous Lorraine cross which the cardinal had lately ordered his partisans to wear he sent an officer of the guard who was stationed in the antechamber to give entrance to the newcomer and went himself followed by his brother to meet him on the landing what is it my dear simuse asked the duke with that charm of manner which he always displayed to military men as soon as he recognized the governor of guienne the connetable has reached pitivier he left Egoin with two thousand cavalry and one hundred nobles with their suites yes monseigneur replied simius in all two thousand six hundred men some say that Tor is behind them with a body of infantry if the connetable delays a while expecting his son you will have time to repulse him is that all you know are the reasons for this sudden call to arms made known montmorency talks as little as he writes go you and meet him brother while i prepare to welcome him with the head of his nephew said the cardinal giving orders that robertet be sent him at once vieux la ville cried the duke to the marquis who came immediately the connetable has the audacity to come here under arms if i go to meet him will you be responsible to hold the town as soon as you leave it the burghers will fly to arms and who can answer for the result of an affair between cavalry and citizens in these narrow streets replied the marquis monseigneur said robertet rushing hastily up the stairs the chancelier de l'hôpital is at the gate and asks to enter are we to let him in yes open the gate answered the cardinal connetable and chancelier together would be dangerous we must separate them we have been boldly tracked by the queen mother into choosing l'hôpital as chancellor robertet nodded to a captain of the guard who awaited an answer at the foot of the staircase then he turned round quickly to receive the orders of the cardinal monseigneur i take the liberty he said making one last effort to point out that this sentence should be approved by the king in council if you violate the law on a prince of the blood it will not be respected for either a cardinal or a duc de guise bignard has upset your mind robertet said the cardinal sternly do you not know that the king signed the order of execution the day he was about to leave orleans in order that the sentence might be carried out in his absence the lieutenant-general listened to this discussion without a word but he took his brother by the arm and led him into a corner of the hall undoubtedly he said the heirs of charlemagne have the right to recover the crown which was usurped from their house by hugh capet but can they do it the pear is not yet ripe our nephew is dying and the whole court has gone over to the king of navarre the king's heart failed him or the bernet would have been stabbed before now said the cardinal and we could easily have disposed of the valois children we are very ill placed here said the duke the rebellion of the town will be supported by the states general l'hôpital whom we protected while the queen mother opposed his appointment is today against us and yet it is all important that we should have the justiciary with us catherine has too many supporters at the present time we cannot send her back to italy besides there are still three valois princes she is no longer a mother she is all queen said the cardinal in my opinion this is the moment to make an end of her vigour and more and more vigour that's my prescription he cried so saying the cardinal returned to the king's chamber followed by the duke the priest went straight to the queen mother papers of la the secretary of the prince de conde have been communicated to you and you now know that the bourbons are endeavouring to dethrone your son i know all that said catherine well then will you give orders to arrest the king of navarre there is she said with dignity a lieutenant general of the kingdom at this instant francois the second groaned piteously complaining aloud of the terrible pains in his ear the physician left the fireplace where he was warming himself and went to the bedside to examine the king's head well monsieur said the duc de guise interrogatively i dare not take upon myself to apply a blister to draw the abscess maitre ambroise has promised to save the king's life by an operation and i might thwart it let us postpone the treatment till tomorrow morning said catherine coldly and order all the physicians to be present for we all know the calumnies to which the death of kings gives rise she went to her son and kissed his hand then she withdrew to her own apartments 
With what composure that audacious daughter of a shopkeeper alluded to the death of the dauphin poisoned by Montecuculi, one of her own Italian followers, said Mary Stuart. Mary, cried the little king, my grandfather never doubted her innocence. Can we prevent that woman from coming here tomorrow? said the queen to her uncles in a low voice. What will become of us if the king dies? returned the cardinal in a whisper. Catherine will shuffle us all into his grave. Thus the question was plainly put between Catherine de' Medici and the House of Lorraine during that fatal night. The arrival of the Connetable de Montmorency and the Chancelier de l'Hôpital were distinct indications of rebellion. The morning of the next day would therefore be decisive. End of section 13. Section 14 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Death of Francois II. On the morrow, the Queen Mother was the first to enter the King's chamber. She found no one there but Mary Stuart, pale and weary, who had passed the night in prayer beside the bed. The Duchess de Guise had kept her mistress company, and the maids of honour had taken turns in relieving one another. Neither the Duke nor the Cardinal had yet appeared. The priest, who was bolder than the soldier, had, it was afterwards said, put forth his utmost energy during the night to induce his brother to make himself king. But in face of the assembled states-general, and threatened by a battle with Montmorency, the Balafre declared the circumstances unfavourable. He refused, against his brother's utmost urgency, to arrest the King of Navarre, the Queen Mother, L'Hôpital, the Cardinal de Tournon, the Gondes, Ruggiero, and Birago, objecting that such violent measures would bring on a general rebellion. He postponed the Cardinal's scheme until the fate of Francois II should be determined. The deepest silence reigned in the King's chamber. Catherine, accompanied by Madame de Fiesque, went to the bedside and gazed at her son with a semblance of grief that was admirably simulated. She put her handkerchief to her eyes and walked to the window where Madame de Fiesque brought her a seat, thence she could see into the courtyard. It had been agreed between Catherine and the Cardinal de Tournon that if the Connetable should successfully enter the town, the Cardinal would come to the king's house with the two Gondis. If otherwise, he would come alone. At nine in the morning, the Duke and Cardinal, followed by their gentlemen, who remained in the hall, entered the king's bedroom, the captain on duty having informed them that Ambroise Paré had arrived, together with Chapelain and three other physicians, who hated Paré and were all in the Queen Mother's interests. A few moments later, and the great hall of the Balayage presented much the same aspect as that of the Salle des Gardes at Blois, on the day when Christophe was put to the torture, and the Duc de Guise was proclaimed Lieutenant Governor of the Kingdom, with the single exception that whereas love and joy overflowed the royal chamber and the Guises triumphed, death and mourning now reigned within that darkened room, and the Guises felt that power was slipping through their fingers. The maids of honour of the two queens were again in their separate camps on either side of the fireplace, in which glowed a monstrous fire. The hall was filled with courtiers. The news spread about, no one knew how, of some daring operation contemplated by Ambroise Paré to save the king's life, had brought back the lords and gentlemen who had deserted the house the day before. The outer staircase and courtyard were filled by an anxious crowd. The scaffold erected during the night for the Prince de Conde, opposite to the component of the Recollet, had amazed and startled the whole nobility. All present spoke in a low voice, and the talk was the same mixture as at Bois, of frivolous and serious, light and earnest matters. The habit of expecting troubles, sudden revolutions, calls to arms, rebellions and great events, which marked the long period during which the House of Valois was slowly being extinguished, in spite of Catherine de' Medici's great efforts to preserve it, took its rise at this time. A deep silence prevailed for a certain distance beyond the door of the king's chamber, which was guarded by two halberdiers, two pages, and by the captain of the Scotch guard. Antoine de Bourbon, king of Navarre, held a prisoner in his own house, learned by his present desertion of the hopes of the courtiers who had flocked to him the day before, and was horrified by the news of the preparations made during the night for the execution of his brother. Standing before the fireplace in the great hall of the Bailliage was one of the greatest and noblest figures of that day, 
the chancelier de l'hopital wearing his crimson robe lined and edged with ermine and his cap on his head according to the privilege of his office the courageous man seeing that his benefactors were traitorous and self-seeking held firmly to the cause of the kings represented by the queen mother at the risk of losing his head he had gone to rouen to consult with the connetable de montmorency no one ventured to draw him from the reverie in which he was plunged robertet the secretary of state two marshals of france villeville and saint andre and the keeper of the seals were collected in a group before the chancellor the courtiers present were not precisely jesting but their talk was malicious especially among those who were not for the guises presently voices were heard to rise in the king's chamber the two marshals robertet and the chancellor went nearer to the door for not only was the life of the king in question but as the whole court knew well the chancellor the queen mother and her adherents were in the utmost danger a deep silence fell on the whole assembly Ambroise pare had by this time examined the king's head he thought the moment propitious for his operation if it was not performed suffusion would take place and francois the second might die at any moment as soon as the duke and cardinal entered the chamber he explained to all present that in so urgent a case it was necessary to trepan the head and he now waited till the king's physician ordered him to perform the operation cut the head of my son as though it were a plank with that horrible insolent cried catherine de medici matre en bras i will not permit it the physicians were consulting together but catherine spoke in so loud a voice that her words reached as she intended they should beyond the door but madame if there is no other way to save him said mary stuart weeping en bras cried catherine remember that your head will answer for the king's life we are opposed to the treatment suggested by maitre Ambroise, said the three physicians the king can be saved by injecting through the ear a remedy which will draw the contents of the abscess through that passage the duc de guise who was watching catherine's face suddenly went up to her and drew her into the recess of the window madame he said you wish the death of your son you are in league with our enemies and have been since blois this morning the council of viol told the son of the Euphorier that the prince de conde's head was about to be cut off that young man who when the question was applied persisted in denying all relations with the prince made a sign of farewell to him as he passed before the window of his dungeon you saw your unhappy accomplice tortured with royal insensibility you are now endeavouring to prevent the recovery of your eldest son your conduct forces us to believe that the death of the dauphin which placed the crown on your husband's head was not a natural one and that monticatulli was your monsieur le chancelier cried catherine at a sign from whom madame de fiesca opened both sides of the bedroom door the company in the hall then saw the scene that was taking place in the royal chamber the livid little king his face half dead his eyes sightless his lips stammering the word mary as he held the hand of the weeping queen the duchess de guise motionless frightened by catherine's daring act the duke and cardinal also alarmed keeping close to the queen mother and resolving to have her arrested on the spot by melbrez lastly the tall Ambroise pare assisted by the king's physician holding his instrument in his hand but not daring to begin the operation for which composure and total silence were as necessary as the consent of the other surgeons monsieur le chancelier said catherine the messieurs de guise wish to authorize a strange operation upon the person of the king Ambroise pare is preparing to cut open his head i as the queen's mother and the member of the council of the regency i protest against what appears to me a crime of lese majeste the king's physicians advise on injection through the ear which seems to me as efficacious and less dangerous than the brutal operation proposed by pare when a company in the hall heard these words a smothered murmur rose from their midst the cardinal allowed the chancellor to enter the bedroom and then he closed the door i am lieutenant-general of the kingdom said the duc de guise and i would have you know monsieur le chancelier that Ambroise, the king's surgeon answers for his life ah if this be the turn that things are taking exclaimed Ambroise pare i know my rights and how i should proceed 
he stretched his arm over the bed. This bed and the king are mine. I claim to be sole master of this case and solely responsible. I know the duties of my office. I shall operate upon the king without the sanction of the physicians. Save him, said the cardinal, and you shall be the richest man in Paris. Go on, cried Mary Stuart, pressing the surgeon's hand. I cannot prevent it, said the chancellor, but I shall record the protest of the queen mother. Robertet, called the Duc de Guise. When Robertet entered, the lieutenant general pointed to the chancellor. I appoint you chancellor of France in the place of that traitor, he said. Monsieur de Maille, take Monsieur de l'Hôpital and put him in the prison of the Prince de Conde. As for you, madame, he added, turning to Catherine, your protest will not be received. You ought to be aware that any such protest must be supported by sufficient force. I act as the faithful subject and loyal servant of King Francois II, my master. Go on, Antoine, he added, looking at the surgeon. Monsieur de Guise, said l'Hôpital, if you employ violence, either upon the king or upon the Chancellor of France, remember that enough of the nobility of France are in that hall to rise and arrest you as a traitor. Oh, my lords, cried the great surgeon, if you continue these arguments, you will soon proclaim Charles the Ninth, for King Francois is about to die. Catherine de' Medici, absolutely impassive, gazed upon the window. Well then, we shall employ force to make ourselves masters of this room, said the cardinal, advancing to the door. But when he opened it, even he was terrified. The whole house was deserted. Courtiers, certain, now the death of the king, had gone in a body to the king of Navarre. Well, go on, perform your duty, cried Mary Stuart vehemently to Ambroise. I, and you, Duchess, she said to Madame de Guise, will protect you. Madame, said Ambroise, Mazille was carrying me away. The doctors, with the exception of my friend Chopin, prefer an injection, and it is my duty to submit to their wishes. If I had been a chief surgeon and chief physician, which I am not, the king's life would probably have been saved. Give that to me, gentlemen, he said, stretching out his hand for the syringe, which he proceeded to fill. Good God, cried Mary Stuart, but I order you to... Alas, madame, said Ambroise, I am under the direction of these gentlemen. The young queen placed herself between the surgeon, the doctors, and the other persons present. The chief physician held the king's head, and Ambroise made the injection into the ear. The duke and the cardinal watched the proceeding attentively. Robertet and Monsieur de Maille stood motionless. Madame de Fiesque, at a sign from Catherine, glided unperceived from the room. A moment later, l'Hôpital boldly opened the door of the king's chamber. "'I arrive in good time,' said the voice of a man whose hasty steps echoed through the great hall and who stood the next moment on the threshold of the open door. Ah, monsieur, so you meant to take off the head of my good nephew, the Prince de Conde. Instead of that, you have forced the lion from his lair. And here I am, added the connetable to Montmorency. Ambroise, you shall not plunge your knife into the head of my king, the first prince of the blood, Antoine de Bourbon, the Prince de Conde, Queen Mother, the connetable and the chancellor forbid the operation. To Catherine's great satisfaction, the king of Navarre and the Ponce de Conde now entered the room. What does this mean? said the Duc de Guise, laying his hand on his dagger. It means that in my capacity as connetable, I have dismissed the sentinels on all your posts. Tete Dieu, were not in an enemy's country, methinks. The king, our master, is in the midst of his loyal subjects and the States-General must be suffered to deliberate at liberty. I come, messieurs, from the States-General. I carried the protest of my nephew de Conde before that assembly, and three hundred of those gentlemen have released him. You wish to shed royal blood and to decimate the nobility of the kingdom, do you? Ha! In future, I defy you and all your schemes. Monsieur de Lorraine, if you order the king's head opened by this sort, which saved France from Charles V, I say it shall not be done. All the more, 
said Ambroise Pare, because it is now too late. The suffusion has begun. Your reign is over, messieurs, said Catherine to the Guises, seeing from Pare's face that there was no longer any hope. Oh, madame, you have killed your own son, cried Mary Stuart, as she bounded like a lioness from the bed to the window and seized the queen mother by the arm, gripping it violently. My dear, replied Catherine, giving her daughter-in-law a cold, keen glance in which she allowed her hatred, repressed for the past six months, to overflow. You, whose inordinate love we all this death, you will now go to reign in your Scotland, and you will start to-morrow. I am regent de facto. The three physicians, having made her a sign, Monsieur, she added, addressing the Guises, it is agreed between Monsieur de Bourbon, appointed lieutenant general of the kingdom by the States General, and me that the conduct of the affairs of the state is our business solely. Come, Monsieur le Chancelier. The king is dead, said the Duc de Guise, compelled to perform his duties as Grand Master. Long live King Charles the Ninth, cried all the noblemen who had come with the King of Navarre, the Prince de Conde, and the Connetable. The ceremonies which followed the death of a king of France were performed in almost total solitude. When the king at arms proclaimed aloud three times in the hall, The king is dead, there were very few persons present to reply, Vive le roi! The queen mother, to whom the Comtesse de Fiesque had brought the Duc d'Orléans, now Charles the Ninth, left the chamber, leading her son by the hand, and all the remaining courtiers followed her. No one was left in the house where Francois the Second had drawn his last breath, but the Duke and the Cardinal, the Duchesse de Guise, Mary Stuart, and Dayel, together with the sentries at the door, the pages of the Grand Master, those of the Cardinal and their private secretaries. Vive la France! cried several reformers in the street, sounding the first cry of the opposition. Robertet, who owed all he was to the Duke and Cardinal, terrified by their scheme and its present failure, went over secretly to the Queen Mother, whom the ambassadors of Spain, England, the Empire, and Poland hastened to meet on the staircase, brought thither by Cardinal de Tournon, who had gone to notify them as soon as he had made Queen Catherine a sign from the courtyard at the moment when she protested against the operation of Ambroise Paré. Well, said the Cardinal to the Duke, so the sons of Louis d'Autremer, the heirs of Charles de Lorraine, flinched and lacked courage. We should have been exiled to Lorraine, replied the Duke. I declare to you, Charles, that if the crown lay there before me, I would not stretch out my hand to pick it up. That's for my son to do. Will he have, as you have had, the army and church on his side? You will have something better. What? The people! Ah! exclaimed Mary Stuart, clasping the stiffened hand of her first husband, now dead. There is none but me to weep for this poor boy who loved me so. How can we patch up matters with the Queen Mother? said the Cardinal. Wait till she quarrels with the Huguenots, replied the Duchess. The conflicting interests of the House of Bourbon, of Catherine, of the Guises, and of the Reformed Party produced such confusion in the town of Orléans that three days after the king's death, his body, completely forgotten in a bailliage and put into a coffin by the menials of the house, was taken to Saint-Denis on a covered wagon, accompanied only by the Bishop of Saint-Denis and two gentlemen. When the pitiable procession reached the little town of Etampes, a servant of the Chancelier l'Hôpital fastened to the wagon this severe inscription, which history has preserved. Tanegay de Chastel, where art thou, and yet thou wert a Frenchman? A stern reproach, which fell with equal force on Catherine de Medici, Mary Stuart, and the Guises. What Frenchman does not know that Tanegay de Chastel spent thirty thousand crowns of the coinage of that day, one million of our francs, at the funeral of Charles the Seventh, the benefactor of his house? No sooner did the tolling of the bells announce to the town of Orléans that François the Second was dead, and the rumour spread that the Connetable de Montmorency had ordered the flinging open of the gates of the town, than Torion, the glover, rushed up into the gout of his house and went to a secret hiding place. "'Good heavens! Can he be dead?' he cried. 
Hearing the words, a man rose to his feet and answered, Why do you serve? The password of reforms belonged to Calvin. This man was Chaudieu, to whom Tourillon now related the events of the last eight days, during which time he had prudently left the minister alone in his hiding place, with a twelve-pound loaf of bread for his sole nourishment. Go instantly to the Ponce de Conde, brother. Ask him to give me a safe conduct, and find me a horse, cried the minister. I must start at once. Write me a line, or you will not receive it. Here, said Chaudieu, after writing a few words, ask for a pass from the King of Navarre, for I must go to Geneva without a moment's loss of time. End of section 14. Section 15 of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. Calvin. Two hours later all was ready, and the ardent minister was on his way to Switzerland, accompanied by a nobleman in the service of the King of Navarre, with whom Chaudieu pretended to be the secretary, carrying with him dispatches from the reformers in the Dauphin. His sudden departure was chiefly in the interests of Catherine de' Medici, who, in order to gain time to establish her power, had made a bold proposition to the reformers which was kept a profound secret. This strange proceeding explains the understanding so suddenly apparent between herself and the leaders of the reform. The wily woman gave, as a pledge of her good faith, an intimation of her desire to heal all differences between the two churches by calling an assembly, which should be neither a council nor a conclave nor a synod, but should be known by some new and distinctive name if Calvin consented to the project. When this secret was afterwards divulged, be it remarked in passing, it led to an alliance between the Duc de Guise and the Connetable de Montmorency against Catherine and the King of Navarre. A strange alliance, known in history as a triumvirate, the Marquis de Saint-André being the third personage in the purely Catholic coalition in which this singular proposition for a colloquy gave rise. The secret of Catherine's wily policy was rightly understood by the Guises. They felt certain that the Queen cared nothing for this mysterious assembly, and was only temporising with her new allies in order to secure a period of peace until the majority of Charles the Ninth. But none the less did they receive the Connetable, interfering a collusion of real interests between the Queen and the Bourbons, whereas in reality Catherine was playing them all one against another. The Queen had become, as the reader will perceive, extremely powerful in a very short time. The spirit of discussion and controversy which now sprang up was singularly favourable to her position. The Catholics and the Reformers were equally pleased to exhibit their brilliancy, one after another, in this tournament of words, for that is what it actually was, and no more. It is extraordinary that historians have mistaken one of the wiliest schemes of the great Queen for uncertainty and hesitation. Catherine never went more directly to her own ends than in just such schemes which appeared to thwart them. The King of Navarre, quite incapable of understanding her motives, fell into her plan in all sincerity, and dispatched Chaudieu to Calvin, as we have seen. The minister had risked his life to be secretly in Orléans and watch events, for here it was, while there in hourly peril of being discovered, and hung as a man under sentence of banishment. According to the then fashion of travelling, Chaudieu would not reach Geneva before the month of February, and the negotiations were not likely to be concluded before the end of March. Consequently, the assembly could certainly not take place before the month of May 1561. Catherine, meantime, intended to amuse the court and the various conflicting interests by the coronation of the king and the ceremonies of his first de de justice, at which L'Hôpital and de Tu recorded the letters patent by which Charles the Ninth confided the administration to his mother, in common with the present Lieutenant General of the Kingdom, Antoine de Navarre, the weakest prince of those days. Is it not a strange spectacle, this of the great kingdom of France waiting in suspense for the yes or no of a French burgher, hitherto an obscure man living for many years past in Geneva? The transalpine pope held in check by the pontiff of Geneva. The two Lorrain princes, lately all-powerful, 
now paralyzed by the momentary coalition of the Queen Mother and the first prince of the blood with Calvin. Is not this, I say, one of the most instructive lessons ever given to kings by history? A lesson which should teach them to study men, to seek out genius and employ it, as did Louis the Fourteenth, wherever God has placed it. Calvin, whose name was not Calvin, but Corvin, was the son of a cooper at Noyon in Picardy. The region of his birth explains in some degree the obstinacy combined with capricious eagerness which distinguished this arbiter of the destinies of France in the 16th century. Nothing is less known than the nature of this man, who gave birth to Geneva and to the spirit that emanated from that city. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who had very little historical knowledge, has completely ignored the influence of Calvin on his republic. At first, the embryo reformer who lived in one of the humblest houses in the upper town, near the church of Saint-Pierre, over a carpenter's shop, first resemblance between him and Robespierre, had no great authority in Geneva. In fact, for a long time, his power was malevolently checked by the Genovese. The town was the residence in those days of a citizen whose fame, like that of several others, remained unknown to the world at large, and for a time to Geneva itself. This man, Farrell, about the year 1537, detained Calvin in Geneva, pointing out to him that the place could be made the safe centre of a reformation more active and thorough than that of Luther. Farrell and Calvin regarded Lutheranism as an incomplete work, insufficient in itself, and without any real grip upon France. Geneva, midway between France and Italy, and speaking the French language, was admirably situated for ready communication with Germany, France, and Italy. Calvin thereupon adopted Geneva as the site of his moral fortunes. He made it thenceforth the citadel of his ideas. The Council of Geneva, at Fowles and Treaty, authorised Calvin in September 1538 to give lectures on theology. Calvin left the duties of the ministry to Farrell, his first disciple, and gave himself up patiently to the work of teaching his doctrine. His authority, which became so absolute in the last years of his life, was obtained with difficulty and very slowly. The great agitator met with such serious obstacles that he was banished for a time from Geneva on account of the severity of his reform. A party of honest citizens still clung to their old luxury and their old customs. But as usually happens, these good people, fearing ridicule, would not admit the real object of their efforts, and kept up their warfare against the new doctrines on points altogether foreign to the real question. Calvin insisted that leavened bread should be used for the communion, and that all feasts should be abolished except Sundays. These innovations were disapproved of at Bern and at Lausanne. A notice was served on the Genovese to conform to the ritual of Switzerland. Calvin and Farrell resisted. Their political opponents used this disobedience to drive them from Geneva, whence they were in fact banished for several years. Later, Calvin returned triumphantly the demand of his flock. Such persecutions always become, in the end, the consecration of a moral power, and in this case Calvin's return was the beginning of his era as prophet. He then organized his religious terror, and the executions began. On his reappearance in the city, he was admitted into the ranks of the Genovese burghers, but even then, after fourteen years' residence, he was not made a member of the council. At the time of which we write, when Catherine sent her envoy to him, this king of ideas had no other title than that of pastor of the Church of Geneva. Moreover, Calvin never in his life received a salary of more than 150 francs in money yearly. 1,500 weight of wheat, and two barrels of wine. His brother, a tailor, kept a shop close to the Place Saint-Pierre in a street now occupied by one of the large printing establishments of Geneva. Such personal disinterestedness, which was lacking in Voltaire, Newton, and Bacon, and eminent in the lives of Rabelais, Spinoza, Loyola, Kant, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, is indeed a magnificent frame for those ardent and sublime figures. The career of Robespierre can alone picture to the minds of the present day that of Calvin, who, founding his power on the same bases, was as despotic and as cruel as the lawyer of Arras. It is a notable fact that Picardy, Arras, and Noyon furnished both these instruments of reformation. 
Persons who wish to study the motives of the executions ordered by Calvin will find all relations considered. Another, 1793, in Geneva. Calvin cut off the head of Jacques Croix for having written impious letters, libertine verses, and for working to overthrow ecclesiastical ordinances. Reflect upon that sentence and ask yourselves if the worst tyrants in their saturnalias ever gave more horribly burlesque reasons for their cruelties valentin gentilly condemned to death for involuntary heresy escaped execution only by making a submission far more ignominious than was ever imposed by the catholic church seven years before the conference which was now to take place in calvin's house on the proposals of the queen mother Michel Servet, a Frenchman, travelling through Switzerland, was arrested at Geneva, tried, condemned, and burned alive on Calvin's accusation for having attacked the mystery of the Trinity, in a book which was neither written nor published in Geneva. Remember the eloquent remonstrance of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose book, Overthrowing the Catholic Religion, written in France and published in Holland, was burned by the hangman, while the author, a foreigner, was merely banished from the kingdom, where he had endeavoured to destroy the fundamental proofs of religion and of authority. Compare the conduct of our parliament with that of the Genovese tyrant. Again, Bolsay was brought to trial for having other ideas than those of Calvin on predestination. Consider these things, and ask yourself if Fouquier Tinville did worse. The savage religious intolerance of Calvin was, morally speaking, more implacable than the savage political intolerance of Robespierre. On a larger stage than that of Geneva, Calvin would have shed more blood than did the terrible apostle of political equality as opposed to Catholic equality. Three centuries earlier, a monk of Picardy drove the whole West upon the East. Peter the Hermit, Calvin and Robespierre, each at an interval of three hundred years, and all three from the same region, were politically speaking the Archimedean screws of their age, at each epoch a thought which found its fulcrum in the self-interest of mankind. Calvin was undoubtedly the maker of that melancholy town, called Geneva, where only ten years ago a man said, pointing to a port cochere in the upper town, the first ever built there, by that door luxury has invaded Geneva. Calvin gave birth, by the sternness of his doctrines and his executions, to that form of hypocritical sentiment called cant. According to those who practice it, good morals consist in renouncing the arts and the charms of life, in eating richly but without luxury, in silently amassing money without enjoying it, otherwise than as Calvin enjoyed power by thought. Calvin imposed on all the citizens of his adopted town the same gloomy pall which he spread over his own life. He created in the consistory a Calvinistic inquisition, absolutely similar to the revolutionary tribunal of Robespierre. The consistory denounced the persons to be condemned to the council, and Calvin ruled the council through the consistory, just as Robespierre ruled the convention through the club of the Jacobin. In this way, an eminent magistrate of Geneva was condemned to two months' imprisonment, the loss of all his offices, and the right of ever attaining others because he had led disorderly life and was intimate with Calvin's enemies. Calvin thus became a legislator. He created the austere, sober, commonplace, and hideously sad, but irreproachable manners and customs which characterized Geneva to the present day. Customs preceding those of England called Puritanism, which were due to the Cameronians, disciples of Cameron, Frenchman deriving his doctrine from Calvin, whom Sir Walter Scott depicts so admirably. The poverty of a man, a sovereign master, who negotiated power to power with kings, demanding armies and subsidies and plunging both hands into their savings, laid aside for the unfortunate, proves that thought used solely as a means of domination, gives birth to political misers. Men who enjoy by their brains only, and like the Jesuits, want power for power's sake. Pitt, Luther, Calvin, Robespierre, all those harpagons of power, died without a penny. The inventory taken in Calvin's house after his death 
which comprised all his property, even his books, amounted in value, as history records, to 250 francs. That of Luther came to about the same sum. His widow, the famous Catherine de Bora, was forced to petition for a pension of 500 francs, which is granted to her by an elector of Germany. Potemkin, Richelieu, Mazarin, those men of thought and action, all three of whom made or laid the foundation of empires, each left over 300 millions behind them. They had hearts, they loved women and the arts. They built, they conquered, whereas with the exception of the wife of Luther, the Helen of that Iliad. All the others had no tenderness, no beating of the heart for any woman with which to reproach themselves. This brief digression was necessary in order to explain Calvin's position in Geneva. During the first days of the month of February in the year 1561, on a soft warm evening such as we may sometimes find of that season on Lake Le Mans, two horsemen arrived at the Pré l'Evêque, thus called because it was the former country place of the Bishop of Geneva, driven from Switzerland about thirty years earlier. These horsemen, who no doubt knew the laws of Geneva about the closing of the gates, then a necessity and now very ridiculous, rode in the direction of the Port de Rive, but they stopped their horses suddenly on catching sight of a man about fifty years of age, leaning on the arm of a servant woman and walking slowly toward the town. This man, who was rather stout, walked with difficulty, putting one foot after the other, with pain apparently, for he wore round shoes of black velvet, laced in front. It is he, says Chaudieu to the other horseman, who immediately dismounted, threw the reins to his companion, and went forward, opening wide his arms to the man on foot. The man, who was Jean Calvin, drew back to avoid the embrace, casting a stern look at his disciple. At fifty years of age, Calvin looked as though he was sixty. Stout and stocky in figure, he seemed shorter still, because the horrible sufferings of stone in the bladder obliged him to bend almost double as he walked. These pains were complicated by attacks of gout of the worst kind. Everyone trembled before that face, almost as broad as it was long, on which, in spite of its roundness, there was as little human kindness as that on Henry the Eighth, whom Calvin greatly resembled. Sufferings which gave him no respite were manifest in the deep-cut lines starting from each side of the nose and following the curve of the moustache till they were lost in the thick grey beard. This face, though red and inflamed like that of a heavy drinker, showed spots where the skin was yellow. In spite of the velvet cap which covered the huge square head, a vast forehead of noble shape could be seen and admired. Beneath it shone two dark eyes, which must have flashed forth flame in moments of anger. Whether by reason of his obesity, or because of his thick, short neck, or in consequence of his vigils and his constant labours, Calvin's head was sunk between his broad shoulders, which obliged him to wear a fluted ruff of very small dimensions, on which his face seemed to lie like the head of John the Baptist on a charger. Between his moustache and his beard could be seen like a rose his small and fresh and eloquent little mouth, shaped in perfection. The face was divided by a square nose, remarkable for the inflexibility of its entire length, the tip of which was significantly flat, seeming more in harmony with the prodigious power expressed by the form of that imperial head. Though it might have been difficult to discover on his features any trace of the weekly headaches which tormented Calvin in the intervals of the slow fever that consumed him, suffering ceaselessly resisted by study and by will gave to that mask superficially so florid a certain something that was terrible. Perhaps this impression was explainable by the colour of a sort of greasy lay on the skin, due to the sedentary habits of the toiler, showing evidence of the perpetual struggle which went on between that valetudinarian temperament and one of the strongest wills ever known in the history of the human mind. The mouth, though charming, had an expression of cruelty. Chastity, necessitated by vast designs, exacted by so many sickly conditions, was written upon that face. Regrets were there, notwithstanding the serenity of that all-powerful brow, 
together with pain in the glance of those eyes, the calmness of which was terrifying. Calvin's costume brought into full relief this powerful head. He wore the well-known cassock of black cloth, fastened round his waist by a black cloth belt with a brass buckle, which became thenceforth the distinctive dress of all Calvinist ministers, and was so uninteresting to the eye that it forced the spectator's attention upon the wearer's face. I suffer too much, Theodore, to embrace you, said Calvin, to the elegant cavalier. Theodore de Bez, when forty-two years of age, and lately admitted at Calvin's request as a Genovese burgher, formed a violent contrast to the terrible pastor whom he had chosen as his sovereign guide and ruler. Calvin, like all burghers raised to moral sovereignty, and all inventors of social systems, was eaten up with jealousy. He abhorred his disciples. He wanted no equals. He could not bear the slightest contradiction. Yet there was between him and this graceful cavalier so marked a difference. Theodore de Bez was gifted with so charming a personality, enhanced by a politeness trained by court life, and Calvin felt him to be so unlike his other surly janissaries, that the stern reformer departed in de Bez's case from his usual habits. He never loved him, but this harsh legislator totally ignored all friendship. But not fearing him in the light of a successor, he liked to play with Theodore as Hoshilu played with his cat. He found him supple and agile. Seeing how admirably de Bez succeeded in all his missions, he took a fancy to the polished instrument of which he knew himself the mainspring and the manipulator. So true is it that the sternest of men can't do without some semblance of affection. Theodore was Calvin's spoilt child. The harsh reformer never scolded him. He forgave him his dissipations, his amours, his fine clothes, and his elegance of language. Perhaps Calvin was not unwilling to show that the Reformation had a few men of the world to compare with the men of the court. Theodore de Bez was anxious to introduce a taste for the arts, for literature, and for poesy into Geneva, and Calvin listened to his plans without knitting his thick grey eyebrows. Thus the contrast of character and person between these two celebrated men was as complete and marked as the difference in their minds. Calvin acknowledged Chaudieu's very humble salutation by a slight inclination of the head. Chaudieu slipped the bridles of both horses through his arms and followed the two great men of the Reformation, walking to the left, behind de Bez, who was on Calvin's right. The servant woman hastened on in advance to prevent the closing of the Porte de Rive by informing the captain of the guard that Calvin had been seized with sudden acute pains. Theodore de Bez was a native of the canton of Vézelay, which was the first to enter the Confederation, the curious history of which transaction has been written by one of the Thierrys. The burgess spirit of resistance, endemic at Vézelay, no doubt, played its part in the person of this man in the great revolt of the reformers. But de Bez was undoubtedly one of the most singular personalities of the heresy. You suffer still, said Theodore to Calvin. Catholic would say, like a lost soul, replied the reformer, with the bitterness he gave to his slightest remarks. Ah, I shall not be here long, my son. What will become of you without me? We shall fight by the light of your books, said Chaudieu. Calvin smiled, his red face changed to a pleased expression, and he looked favourably at Chaudieu. Well, have you brought me news? Have they massacred many of our people? he said, smiling and letting a sarcastic joy shine in his brown eyes. No, said Chaudieu, all is peaceful. So much the worse, cried Calvin, so much the worse. All pacification is an evil, if indeed it is not the trap. Our strength lies in persecution. Where should we be if the church accepted reform? But, said Theodore, that is precisely what the Queen Mother appears to wish. She is capable of it, remarked Calvin. I study that woman. What, at this distance? Is there any distance for the mind? replied Calvin sternly, for he thought the interruption irreverent. 
Catherine seeks power, and women with that in their eye have neither honour nor faith. But what is she doing now? I bring you a proposal from her to call a species of council, replied Theodore de Beers. Near Paris? asked Calvin hastily. Yes. Ha! So much the better, exclaimed the reformer. We are trying to understand each other, then draw up some public agreement which shall unite the two churches. Ah! If you would only have the courage to separate the French church from the court of Rome and create a patriarch for France, as she did in the Greek church, cried Calvin, his eyes glistening at the idea thus presented to his mind of a possible throne. But my son, can the niece of a pope be sincere? She is only trying to gain time. She has sent away the Queen of Scots, said Chaudieu. One less, remarked Calvin as they passed through the Porte de Rive. Elizabeth of England will restrain that one for us. Two neighbouring queens will soon be at war with each other. One is handsome, the other ugly, a first cause for irritation. Besides, there's a question of illegitimacy. He rubbed his hands, and the character of his joy was so evidently ferocious that de Beers shuddered. He saw the sea of blood his master was contemplating. The Guises have irritated the house of Bourbon, said Theodore, after a pause. They came to upon rupture at Orléans. Ah, said Calvin, you would not believe me, my son, when I told you the last time you started from the rack that we should end by striking up war to the death between the two branches of the house of France. I have at least one court, one king and royal family on, on my side. My doctrine is producing its effect upon the masses. The burghers, too, understand me. They regard as idolaters all who go to mass, who paint the walls of their churches and put pictures and statues with them. Ha! Ah, it is far more easy for people to demolish churches and palaces than to argue the question of justification by faith or the real presence. Lucifer was an argufier, but I, I am an army. He was a reasoner. I am a system. In short, my sons, he was merely a skirmisher, but I am Tarquin. Yes, my faithful shall destroy pitchers and pull down churches. They shall make millstones of statues to grind the flower of the peoples. There are guilds and corporations in the States General, and you will have nothing there but individuals. Corporations resist. They see clear where the masses are blind. We must join to our doctrine political interests, which will consolidate it and keep together the material of my armies. I have satisfied the logic of cautious souls and the minds of thinkers by this bad and naked worship which carries religion into the world of ideas. I have made the peoples understand the advantages of suppressing ceremony. It is for you, Theodore, to enlist their interests. Hold to that, go not beyond it. All is said in the way of doctrine. Let no one add one iota. Why does Cameron, that little Gascon bastard, who presume to write of it? Calvin de Bez and Chaudier were mounting the steep steps of the upper town in the midst of a crowd. But the crowd paid not the slightest attention to the men who were unchaining the mobs of other cities and preparing them to ravage France. After this terrible tirade, the three marched on in silence till they entered the little Place Saint-Pierre and turned toward the pastor's house. On the second story of that house, never noted, and which of these days no one has ever told in Geneva, where, it may be remarked, Calvin has no stature, his lodging consisted of three chambers, with common pine floors and wainscots, at the end of which were the kitchen and the bedroom of his woman servant. The entrance, as usually happened in most of the burger households in Geneva, was through the kitchen, which opened into a little room with two windows, serving as parlour, salon, and dining room. Calvin's study, where his thought had wrestled with suffering for the last fourteen years, came next, with the bedroom beyond it. Four oaken chairs, covered with tapestry and placed around a square table, were the sole furniture of the parlour. A stove of white porcelain, standing in one corner of the room, cast out a gentle heat. Panels and a wainscot of pine wood left in its natural state, without decoration, covered the wall. Thus the nakedness of the place was in keeping with the sober and simple life of the reformer. Well, said de Bez as they entered, profiting by a few moments when Chaudier left them to put up the horse at a neighbouring inn. 
What am I to do? Will you agree to the colloquy? Of course, the break out. It is you, my son. You will fight for us there. Be peremptory, be arbitrary. No one, neither the queen nor the guises, nor I, wants a pacification. It would not suit us at all. I have confidence in Duplessis Monet. Let him play the leading part. Are we alone? he added with a glance of distrust into the kitchen, where two shirts and a few collars were stretched on a line to dry. Go and shut all the doors. Well, he continued when Theodore had returned, we must drive the King of Navarre to join the Guises and the Connetable by advising them to break with Queen Catherine de' Medici. Let us all get the benefit of that poor creature's weakness. If he turns against the Italians, she will, when she sees herself deprived of that support, necessarily unite with the Prince de Conde and Coligny. Perhaps this manoeuvre will so compromise her that she will be forced to remain on our side. Theodore de Bez caught the hem of Calvin's cassock and kissed it. Oh, my master, he exclaimed, how great you are. Unfortunately, my dear Theodore, I am dying. If I die without seeing you again, yet sinking his voice and speaking in the ear of his minister of foreign affairs, remember to strike a great blow by the hand of some one of our martyrs. Another mina to be killed? Something better than a mere lawyer. A king? Still better. A man who wants to be a king. Duke de Guise, exclaimed Theodore with an involuntary gesture. Well, cried Calvin, who thought he saw disappointment or resistance in the gesture, and did not see at the same moment the entrance of Chaudieu. Have we not the right to strike as we are struck? Yes, to strike in silence and in darkness. May we not return the wound for wound and death for death? Would the Catholics hesitate to lay traps for us and massacre us? Assuredly not. Let us burn their churches. Forward, my children, and if you have devoted youths. I have, said Chilier. Use them as engines of war. Our cause justifies all means. The Balafoyed horrible soldier is like me more than a man. He is a dynasty, just as I am a system. He is able to annihilate us. Therefore I say, death to the Guise. I would rather have a peaceful victory, won by time, reason said the bears. Time! exclaimed Calvin, dashing his chair to the ground. Reason! You mad! Can reason achieve conquests? You know nothing of men. You deal with them. Idiot! The thing that injures my doubt in you. Triple fool is the reason that is in it. By the lightning of soul, by the sword of vengeance, thou pumpkin head, do you not see the vigour given to me by reform, by the massacre at Amboise? Ideas never grow till they are watered with blood. The slaying of the Duc de Guise will lead to horrible persecution, and I pray for it with all my might. Our reverses are preferable to success. The Reformation has an object to gain in being attacked. Do you hear me? Don't. It cannot hurt us to be defeated, whereas Catholicism is at an end if we should win but a single battle. Ha! What are my lieutenants? Rags. Wet rags instead of men. White-haired cravens. Baptist. Apes. Oh, God, grant me ten years more of life. If I die too soon, the cause of true religion is lost in the hands of such boobies. You are as great a fool as Antoine de Navarre. Out of my sight, leave me. I want a better negotiator than you. You're an ass, a popinjay, a poet. Go and make your elegies and your acoustics, you trifler. Hence. The pains of his body were absolutely overcome by the fire of his anger. Even the gout subsided under this horrible excitement of his mind. Calvin's face flushed purple, like the sky before a storm. His vast brow shone, his eyes flamed, he was no longer himself. He gave way utterly to the species of epileptic motion, full of passion, which was common with him. But in the very midst of it, he was struck by the attitude of the two witnesses. Then, as he caught the words of Chaudieu saying to de Bez of the burning bush, he sat down, burned, and covered his face with his two hands, the knotted veins of which were throbbing in spite of their coarse texture. Some minutes later, still shaken by the storm raised within him by the continence of his life, he said in a voice of emotion, My sins, which are many, cost me less trouble to subdue than my impatience. Savage beast, should I never vanquish you, he cried beating his breast. My dear master, said de Bez in a tender voice, taking Calvin's hand and kissing it. Jupiter thunders, but he knows how to smile. Calvin looked at his disciple with a softened eye and said, 
Understand me, my friends. I understand that the pastors of peoples bear great burdens, replied Theodore. You are a world upon your shoulders. I have three martyrs, said Chaudieu, whom the master's outburst had rendered thoughtful, on whom we can rely. Stuart to give Minard is at liberty. You are mistaken, said Calvin gently, smiling after the manner of a great man who brings fair weather into their faces as though they were ashamed of their previous storm. I know human nature. Man may kill one president, but not two. Is it absolutely necessary? asked de Bez. Again, exclaimed Calvin, his nostrils swelling. Come, leave me. You will drive me to fury. Take my decision to the queen. You should your go away and hold your flock together in Paris. God guide you. Dagger, let my friends to the door. Do you not permit me to embrace you? said Theodore, much moved. Who knows what may happen to us on the morrow? We may be seized in spite of our safe conduct. And yet you want to spare them, cried Calvin, embracing the bears. Then he took Chaudier's hand and said, Above all, no Huguenots, no reformers, but Calvinists. Use no term but Calvinism. Alas, this is not ambition, for I am dying, but it is necessary to destroy the whole of Luther, even to the name of Lutheran and Lutheranism. Ah, man divine, cried Chaudier, you well deserve such honours. Maintain the uniformity of the doctrine. Let no one henceforth change or remark it. We are now lost if new sex issue from our bosom. We will here anticipate the events on which this study is based and close the history of Theodore de Bez, who went to Paris with Chaudieu. It is to be remarked that Paul Toy, who fired at the Duc de Guise fifteen months later, confessed under torture that he had been urged to the crime by Theodore de Bez, though he retracted the devoured during subsequent tortures, so that Bossuet, after weighing all historical considerations, felt obliged to acquit Bez of investigating the crime. Since Bossuet's time, however, an apparently futile dissertation, apropos of a celebrated song, has led a compiler of the 18th century to prove that the verses on the death of the Duc de Guise, sung by the Huguenots, from one end of France to the other, was a work of Théodore de Bez. And it is also proved that the famous song on the burial of Marlborough was plagiarism on it. One of the most remarkable instances of the transmission of songs is that of Marlborough written in the first instance by Huguenot on the death of the Duc de Guise in 1563, which was preserved in the French army and appears to have been sung with variations, suppressions and additions at the death of all generals of importance. When the intestine wars were over, the song followed the soldiers into civil life. It was never forgotten, though the habit of singing it may have lessened, and in 1781, sixty years after the death of Marlborough, the wet nurse of the Dauphin was heard to sing it as she suckled her nursling. When a why the name of the Duke of Marlborough was substituted for that of the Duc de Guise has never been ascertained. See Chanson Populaire par Charles Nizar, Paris Dantou, 1867. End of section 15